The Eight Strokes of the Clock by Maurice Leblanc. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kate Barrett. The Eight Strokes of the Clock by Maurice Leblanc. Author's Note. These adventures were told to me in the old days by Arsène Lupin, as though they had happened to a friend of his named Prince Renin. As for me, considering the way in which they were conducted, the actions, the behavior, and the very character of the hero, I found it very difficult not to identify the two friends as one and the same person. Arsène Lupin is gifted with a powerful imagination and is quite capable of attributing to himself adventures which are not his at all and of disowning those which are really his. The reader will judge for himself. M.L. Chapter 1. On the Top of the Tower Hortense Daniel pushed her window ajar and whispered, Are you there, Rosigny? I am here, replied a voice from the shrubbery at the front of the house. Leaning forward, she saw a rather fat man looking up at her out of a gross red face, with its cheeks and chin set in unpleasantly fair whiskers. Well? he asked. Well, I had a great argument with my uncle and aunt last night. They absolutely refused to sign the document of which my lawyer sent them the draft, or to restore the dowry squandered by my husband. But your uncle is responsible by the terms of the marriage settlement. No matter, he refuses. Well, what do you propose to do? <laughs> Are you still determined to run away with me? She asked with a laugh. More so than ever. Your intentions are strictly honorable, remember. Just as you please. You know that I am madly in love with you. Unfortunately, I am not madly in love with you. Then what made you choose me? Chance. I was bored. I was growing tired of my humdrum existence. So I'm ready to run risks. Here's my luggage. Catch. She let down from the window a couple of large leather kit bags. Rosigny caught them in his arms. The die is cast she whispered. Go and wait for me with your car at the If Crossroads. I shall come on horseback. Hang it, I can't run off with your horse. He will go home by himself. Capital. Oh, by the way, what is it? Who is this Prince Renin who's been here the last three days and whom nobody seems to know? I don't know much about him. My uncle met him at a friend's shoot and asked him here to stay. You seem to have made a great impression on him. You went for a long ride with him yesterday. He's a man I don't care for. In two hours I shall have left the house in your company. The scandal will cool him off. Well, we've talked long enough. We have no time to lose. For a few minutes she stood watching the fat man bending under the weight of her traps as he moved away in the shelter of an empty avenue. Then she closed the window. Outside in the park the huntsman's horns were sounding the reveille. The hounds burst into frantic baying. It was the opening day of the hunt that morning at the Chateau de la Marais, where every year, in the first week in September, the Comte d'Aigleroche, a mighty hunter before the Lord, and his countess were accustomed to invite a few personal friends and the neighboring landowners. Hortense slowly finished dressing, put on a riding habit, which revealed the lines of her supple figure, and a wide-brimmed felt hat, which encircled her lovely face and auburn hair and sat down to her writing-desk, at which she wrote to her uncle, M. d'Aigleroche, a farewell letter to be delivered to him that evening. It was a difficult letter to word, and after beginning it several times, she ended by giving up the idea. I will write to him later, she said to herself, when his anger has cooled down. And she went downstairs to the dining-room. Enormous logs were blazing in the hearth of the lofty room. The walls were hung with trophies of rifles and shotguns. The guests were flocking in from every side, shaking hands with the Comte d'Aigleroche, one of those typical country squires, heavily and powerfully built, who lives only for hunting and shooting. He was standing before the fire with a large glass of old brandy in his hand, drinking the health of each new arrival. Hortense kissed him absently. "'What, uncle, you who are usually so sober!' Pooh, he said, a man may surely indulge himself a little once a year. Aunt will give you a scolding. Your aunt has one of her sick headaches and is not coming down. Besides, he added gruffly, it is not her business, and still less is it yours, my dear child. 
Prince Renin came up to Hortense. He was a young man, very smartly dressed, with a narrow and rather pale face, whose eyes held by turns the gentlest and the harshest, the most friendly and the most satirical expression. He bowed to her, kissed her hand, and said, May I remind you of your kind promise, dear madame? My promise? Yes, we agreed that we should repeat our delightful excursion of yesterday and try to go over that old boarded-up place, the look of which made us so curious. It seems to be known as the Domaine d'Alingre. She answered a little curtly, I'm extremely sorry, monsieur, but it would be rather far, and I'm feeling a little done up. I shall go for a canter in the park and come indoors again. There was a pause. Then Serge Renin said, smiling, with his eyes fixed on hers, and in a voice which she alone could hear, I am sure that you'll keep your promise, and that you'll let me come with you. It would be better. For whom? For you, you mean? For you, too, I assure you. She colored slightly, but did not reply, shook hands with a few people around her, and left the room. A groom was holding the horse at the foot of the steps. She mounted and set off towards the woods beyond the park. It was a cool, still morning. Through the leaves, which barely quivered, the sky showed crystalline blue. Hortense rode at a walk down winding avenues, which in half an hour brought her to a countryside of ravines and bluffs, intersected by the high road. She stopped. There was not a sound. Rosigny must have stopped his engine and concealed the car in the thickets around the Ich crossroads. She was five hundred yards at most from that circular space. After hesitating for a few seconds, she dismounted, tied her horse carelessly so that he could release himself by the least effort, and returned to the house, shrouded her face in the long brown veil that hung over her shoulders, and walked on. As she expected, she saw Rosigny directly she reached the first turn in the road. He ran up to her and threw her into the coppice. Quick, quick! Oh, I was so afraid that you would be late, or even change your mind. And here you are. It seems too good to be true. She smiled. You appear to be quite happy to do an idiotic thing. I should think I am happy, and so will you be. I swear you will. Your life will be one long fairy tale. You shall have every luxury and all the money you can wish for. I want neither money nor luxuries. What, then? Happiness. You can safely leave your happiness to me. She replied jestingly, I rather doubt the quality of the happiness which you would give me. Wait, you'll see. You'll see. They had reached the motor. Rosigny, still stammering expressions of delight, started the engine. Hortense stepped in and wrapped herself in a wide cloak. The car followed the narrow, grassy path which led back to the crossroads, and Rosigny was accelerating the speed when he was suddenly forced to pull up. A shot had rung out from the neighboring wood on the right. The car was swerving from side to side. A front tire burst, shouted Rosigny, leaping to the ground. Not a bit of it, cried Hortense. Somebody fired. Impossible, my dear, to be so absurd. At that moment, two slight shocks were felt, and two more reports were heard, one after the other, some way off and still in the wood. Rosigny snarled, The back tires burst now, both of them. But who in the devil's name can the ruffian be? Just let me get hold of him, that's all. He clambered up the roadside slope. There was no one there. Moreover, the leaves of the coppice blocked the view. Damn it! Damn it! he swore. You were right. Somebody was firing at the car. Oh, this is a bit thick. We shall be held up for hours. Three tires to mend. But what are you doing, dear girl? Hortense herself had alighted from the car. She ran to him, greatly excited. I'm going. But why? I want to know. Someone fired. I want to know who it was. Don't let us separate, please. Do you think I'm going to wait here for you for hours? What about your running away? All our plans? We'll discuss that tomorrow. Go back to the house, take back my things with you, and good-bye for the present. She hurried, left him, had the good luck to find her horse, and set off at a gallop in a direction leading away from the Marais. 
there was not the least doubt in her mind that the three shots had been fired by Prince Renin. It was he, she muttered angrily. It was he. No one else would be capable of such behavior. Besides, he had warned her, in his smiling, masterful way, that he would expect her. She was weeping with rage and humiliation. At that moment, had she found herself face to face with Prince Renin, she could have struck him with her riding whip. Before her was the rugged and picturesque stretch of country which lies between the Orne and the Sarthe, above Alençon, and which is known as Little Switzerland. Steep hills compelled her frequently to moderate her pace, the more so as she had to cover some six miles before reaching her destination. But though the speed at which she rode became less headlong, though her physical effort gradually slackened, she nevertheless persisted in her indignation against Prince Renin. She bore him a grudge not only for the unspeakable action of which he had been guilty, but also for his behavior to her during the last three days, his persistent attentions, his assurance, his air of excessive politeness. She was nearly there, in the bottom of a valley, an old park wall, full of cracks and covered with moss and weeds, revealed the bald turret of a chateau and a few windows with closed shutters. This was the Domaine de Alingre. She followed the wall and turned a corner. In the middle of the crescent-shaped space before which lay the entrance gates, Serge Renin stood waiting beside his horse. She sprang to the ground, and as he stepped forward, hat in hand, thanking her for coming, she cried, "'One word, monsieur, to begin with. Something quite inexplicable happened just now. Three shots were fired at a motor-car in which I was sitting. Did you fire those shots?' "'Yes.' She seemed dumbfounded. Then you confess it. You have asked a question, madame, and I have answered it. But how dared you? What gave you the right? I was not exercising a right, madame. I was performing a duty. Indeed. And what duty, pray? The duty of protecting you against a man who is trying to profit by your troubles. I forbid you to speak like that. I am responsible for my own actions, and I decided upon them in perfect liberty. Madame, I overheard your conversation with Monsieur Rosigny this morning, and it did not appear to me that you were accompanying him with a light heart. I admit the ruthlessness and bad taste of my interference, and I apologize for it humbly. But I risked being taken for a ruffian in order to give you a few hours for reflection. I have reflected fully, Monsieur. When I have once made up my mind to a thing, I do not change it. Yes, madame, you do sometimes. If not, why are you here instead of there? Hortense was confused for a moment. All her anger had subsided. She looked at Renin with the surprise which one experiences when confronted with certain persons who are unlike their fellows, more capable of performing unusual actions, more generous and disinterested. She realized perfectly that he was acting without any ulterior motive or calculation, that he was, as he had said, merely fulfilling his duty as a gentleman to a woman who has taken the wrong turning. Speaking very gently, he said, I know very little about you, madame, but enough to make me wish to be of use to you. You are twenty-six years old and have lost both your parents. Seven years ago, you became the wife of the Comte d'Aigleroche's nephew by marriage, who proved to be of unsound mind, half insane indeed, and had to be confined. This made it impossible for you to obtain a divorce, and compelled you, since your dowry had been squandered, to live with your uncle and at his expense. It's a depressing environment. The Count and Countess do not agree. Years ago, the Count was deserted by his first wife, who ran away with the Countess's first husband. The abandoned husband and wife decided out of spite to unite their fortunes, but found nothing but disappointment and ill-will in this second marriage. And you suffer the consequences. They lead a monotonous, narrow, lonely life for eleven months or more out of the year. One day you met Monsieur Rosigny, who fell in love with you and suggested an elopement. You did not care for him, but you were bored. Your youth was being wasted. You longed for the unexpected, for adventure. In a word, you accepted, with the very definite intention of keeping your admirer at arm's length, but also with the rather ingenuous hope that the scandal would force your uncle's hand, 
and make him account for his trusteeship and assure you of an independent existence. That is how you stand. At present you have to choose between placing yourself in Monsieur Rosigny's hands or trusting yourself to me. She raised her eyes to his. What did he mean? What was the purport of this offer which he made so seriously, like a friend who asks nothing but to prove his devotion? After a moment's silence he took the two horses by the bridle and tied them up. Then he examined the heavy gates, each of which was strengthened by two planks nailed crosswise. An electoral poster, dated twenty years earlier, showed that no one had entered the domain since that time. Lenin tore up one of the iron posts which supported a railing that ran round the crescent and used it as a lever. The rotten planks gave way. One of them uncovered the lock which he attacked with a big knife, containing a number of blades and implements. A minute later the gate opened on a waste of bracken which led up to a long, dilapidated building with a turret at each corner and a sort of belvedere built on a taller tower in the middle. The prince turned to Hortense. You are in no hurry, he said. You will form your decision this evening, and if Monsieur Rosigny succeeds in persuading you for the second time, I give you my word of honor that I shall not cross your path. Until then, grant me the privilege of your company. We made up our minds yesterday to inspect the chateau. Let us do so. Will you? It is as good a way as any of passing the time, and I have a notion that it will not be uninteresting. He had a way of talking which compelled obedience. He seemed to be commanding and entreating at the same time. Hortense did not even seek to shake off the enervation into which her will was slowly sinking. She followed him to a half-demolished flight of steps, at the top of which was a door, likewise strengthened by planks nailed into the form of a cross. Rénin went to work in the same way as before. They entered a spacious hall paved with white and black flagstones, furnished with old sideboards and choir stalls, and adorned with a carved escutcheon which displayed the remains of armorial bearings, representing an eagle standing on a block of stone, all half hidden behind a veil of cobwebs which hung down over a pair of folding doors. The door of the drawing-room, evidently, said Renin. He found this more difficult to open, and it was only by repeatedly charging it with his shoulder that he was able to move one of the doors. Altense had not spoken a word. She watched not without surprise this series of forcible entries which were accomplished with a really masterly skill. He guessed her thoughts and, turning round, said in a serious voice, It's child's play to me. I was a locksmith once. She seized his arm and whispered, Listen. To what? he asked. She increased the pressure of her hand to demand silence. The next moment he murmured, It's really very strange. Listen, listen, Hortense repeated in bewilderment. Can it be possible? They heard, not far from where they were standing, a sharp sound, the sound of a light tap recurring at regular intervals, and they had only to listen attentively to recognize the ticking of a clock. Yes, it was this and nothing else that broke the profound silence of the dark room. It was indeed the deliberate ticking, rhythmical as the beat of a metronome, produced by a heavy brass pendulum. That was it, and nothing could be more impressive than the measured pulsation of this trivial mechanism, which by some miracle, some inexplicable phenomenon, had continued to live in the heart of the dead chateau. And yet, stammered Hortense, without daring to raise her voice, no one has entered the house? No one. And it is quite impossible for that clock to have kept going for twenty years without being wound up. Quite impossible. Then... Serge Rignin opened the three windows and threw back the shutters. He and Hortense were in a drawing-room, as he had thought, and the room showed not the least sign of disorder. The chairs were in their places. Not a piece of furniture was missing. The people who had lived there and who had made it the most individual room in their house had gone away, leaving everything just as it was, 
the books which they used to read, the knick-knacks on the tables and consoles. Renin examined the old grandfather's clock, contained in its tall carved case which showed the disc of the pendulum through an oval pane of glass. He opened the door of the clock. The weights hanging from the cords were at their lowest point. At that moment there was a click. The clock struck eight with a serious note which Hortense was never to forget. How oh, extraordinary, she said. Extraordinary indeed, said he, for the works are exceedingly simple and would hardly keep going for a week. And do you see nothing out of the common? No, nothing. Or, at least... He stooped and from the back of the case drew a metal tube which was concealed by the weights, holding it up to the light. A telescope, he said thoughtfully. Why did they hide it? And they left it drawn out to its full length. That's odd. What does it mean? The clock, as is sometimes usual, began to strike a second time, sounding eight strokes. Rinin closed the case and continued his inspection without putting his telescope down. A wide arch led from the drawing-room to a smaller apartment, a sort of smoking-room. This also was furnished, but contained a glass case for guns, of which the rack was empty. Hanging on a panel nearby was a calendar with the date of the 5th of September. Oh! cried Hortense in astonishment. The same date as today! They tore off the leaves until the 5th of September. And this is the anniversary. What an astonishing coincidence. Astonishing, he echoed. It's the anniversary of their departure, twenty years ago today. You must admit, she said, that all this is incomprehensible. Yes, of course, but all the same. Perhaps not. Have you any idea? He waited for a few seconds before replying. What puzzles me is this telescope hidden, dropped in that corner at the last moment. I wonder what it was used for. From the ground floor windows you see nothing but the trees in the garden. And the same, I expect, from all the windows. We are in a valley without the least open horizon. To use the telescope one would have to go up to the top of the house. Shall we go up? She did not hesitate. The mystery surrounding the whole adventure excited her curiosity so keenly that she could think of nothing but accompanying Rinin and assisting him in his investigations. They went upstairs accordingly, and on the second floor came to a landing where they found the spiral staircase leading to the Belvedere. At the top of this was a platform in the open air, but surrounded by a parapet over six feet high. There must have been battlements which have been filled in since observed Prince Renin. Look here, there were loopholes at one time. They may have been blocked. In any case, she said, the telescope was of no use up here either, and we may as well go down again. I don't agree, he said. Logic tells us that there must have been some gap through which the country could be seen, and this was the spot where the telescope was used. He hoisted himself by his wrists to the top of the parapet, and then saw that this point of vantage commanded the whole of the valley, including the park, with its tall trees marking the horizon, and beyond, a depression in a wood surmounting a hill at a distance of some seven or eight hundred yards, stood another tower, squat and in ruins, covered with ivy from top to bottom. Renin resumed his inspection. He seemed to consider that the key to the problem lay in the use to which the telescope was put, and that the problem would be solved if only they could discover this use. He studied the loopholes one after the other. One of them, or rather the place which it had occupied, attracted his attention above the rest. In the middle of the layer of plaster which had served to block it, there was a hollow filled with earth in which plants had grown. He pulled out the plants and removed the earth, thus clearing the mouth of a hole some five inches in diameter, which completely penetrated the wall. On bending forward, Renin perceived that this deep and narrow opening inevitably carried the eye, above the dense tops of the trees and through the depression in the hill, to the ivy-clad tower. At the bottom of this channel, in a sort of groove which ran through it like a gutter, the telescope fitted so exactly 
that it was quite impossible to shift it, however little, either to the right or to the left. Renin, after wiping the outside of the lenses, while taking care not to disturb the lie of the instrument by a hair's breadth, put his eye to the small end. He remained for thirty or forty seconds, gazing attentively and silently. Then he drew himself up and said in a husky voice, It's terrible. It's really terrible. What is it? she asked anxiously. Look. She bent down, but the image was not clear to her, and the telescope had to be focused to suit her sight. The next moment she shuddered and said, It's two scarecrows, isn't it? Both stuck up on the top. But why? Look again, he said. Look more carefully under the hats, the faces. Oh! she cried, turning faint with horror. How awful! The field of the telescope, like the circular picture shown by a magic lantern, presented this spectacle, the platform of a broken tower, the walls of which were higher in the more distant part, and formed, as it were, a backdrop over which surged waves of ivy. In front, amid a cluster of bushes, were two human beings, a man and a woman, leaning back against a heap of fallen stones. But the words man and woman could hardly be applied to these two forms, these two sinister puppets, which, it is true, wore clothes and hats, or rather shreds of clothes and remnants of hats, but had lost their eyes, their cheeks, their chins, every particle of flesh, until they were actually and positively nothing more than two skeletons. Two skeletons, stammered Hortense. Two skeletons with, with clothes on. Who carried them up there? Nobody. But still. That man and that woman must have died at the top of the tower years and years ago, and their flesh rotted under their clothes, and the ravens ate them. But it's hideous, hideous, cried Hortense, pale as death, her face drawn with horror. Half an hour later, Hortense, Daniel, and Renin left the Chateau de Alingre. Before their departure, they had gone as far as the ivy-grown tower, the remains of an old donjon keep, more than half demolished. The inside was empty. There seemed to have been a way of climbing to the top, at a comparatively recent period, by means of wooden stairs and ladders, which now lay broken and scattered over the ground. The tower backed against the wall, which marked the end of the park. A curious fact which surprised Hortense was that Prince Renin had neglected to pursue a more minute inquiry, as though the matter had lost all interest for him. He did not even speak of it any longer, and in the inn at which they stopped and took a light meal in the nearest village, it was she who asked the landlord about the abandoned chateau. But she learned nothing from him, for the man was new to the district and could give her no particulars. He did not even know the name of the owner. They turned their horses' heads towards La Marais. Again and again Hortense recalled the squalid sight which had met their eyes. But Renin, who was in a lively mood and full of attentions to his companion, seemed utterly indifferent to those questions. But after all, she exclaimed impatiently, we can't leave the matter there. It calls for a solution. As you say, he replied, a solution is called for. Monsieur Rosigny has to know where he stands, and you have to decide what to do about him. She shrugged her shoulders. He's of no importance for the moment. The thing today is what? Is to know what those two dead bodies are. Still, Rosigny. Rosigny can wait, but I can't. You have shown me a mystery which is now the only thing that matters. What do you intend to do? To do? Yes, there are two bodies. You'll inform the police, I suppose. <laughs> Gracious goodness, he exclaimed, laughing. What for? Well, there's a riddle that has to be cleared up at all costs. A terrible tragedy. We don't need anyone to do that. What? Do you mean to say that you understand it? Almost as plainly as though I had read it in a book, told in full detail, with explanatory illustrations. 
It's all so simple. She looked at him askance, wondering if he was making fun of her, but he seemed quite serious. Well, she asked, quivering with curiosity. The light was beginning to wane. They had trotted at a good pace, and the hunt was returning as they neared La Marais. Well, he said, we shall get the rest of our information from people living round about, from your uncle, for instance, and you will see how logically all the facts fit in. When you hold the first link of a chain, you are bound, whether you like it or not, to reach the last. It's the greatest fun in the world. Once in the house, they separated. On going to her room, Altens found her luggage and a furious letter from Rosigny, in which he bade her good-bye and announced his departure. Then Renin knocked at her door. "'Your uncle is in the library,' he said. "'Will you go down with me? I've sent word that I am coming.' She went with him. He added, "'One word more. This morning, when I thwarted your plans and begged you to trust me, I naturally undertook an obligation towards you, which I mean to fulfill without delay. I want to give you a positive proof of this.' She laughed. <laughs> the only obligation which you took upon yourself was to satisfy my curiosity. It shall be satisfied, he assured her, gravely, and more fully than you can possibly imagine. Monsieur Desgleroches was alone. He was smoking his pipe and drinking sherry. He offered a glass to Renin, who refused. Well, Hortense, he said in a rather thick voice, you know that it's pretty dull here, except in these September days. You must make the most of them. Have you had a pleasant ride with Renin? That's just what I wanted to talk about, my dear sir, interrupted the prince. You must excuse me, but I have to go to the station in ten minutes to meet a friend of my wife's. Oh, ten minutes will be ample. Just the time to smoke a cigarette? No longer. He took a cigarette from the case which Mr. Desgleroches handed to him, lit it, and said, I must tell you that our ride happened to take us to an old domain which you are sure to know, the Domaine de Alingue. Certainly I know it, but it has been closed, boarded up for twenty-five years or so. You weren't able to get in, I suppose. Yes, we were. Really? Was it interesting? <laughs> Extremely. We discovered the strangest things. What things? asked the Count, looking at his watch. Renin described what they had seen. On a tower some way from the house there were two dead bodies, two skeletons, rather, a man and a woman still wearing the clothes which they had on when they were murdered. Come, come now, murdered? Yes, and that is what we have come to trouble you about. The tragedy must date back to some twenty years ago. There was nothing known of it at the time. Certainly not, declared the Count. I never heard of any such crime or disappearance. Oh, really? said Renin, looking a little disappointed. I hope to obtain a few particulars. Well, I'm sorry. In that case, I apologize. He consulted Hortense with a glance and moved towards the door. But on second thought, Could you not at least, my dear sir, bring me into touch with some persons in the neighborhood, some members of your family who might know more about it? Of my family? And why? Because the Domaine d'Alingre used to belong, and no doubt still belongs, to the Degleroches. The arms are an eagle on a heap of stones, on a rock. This at once suggested the connection. This time the Count appeared surprised. He pushed back his decanter and his glass of sherry and said, What's this you're telling me? I had no idea that we had any such neighbors. Renin shook his head and smiled. I should be more inclined to believe, sir, that you were not very eager to admit any relationship between yourself and the unknown owner of the property. Then he's not a respectable man? The man, to put it plainly, is a murderer. What do you mean? The Count had risen from his chair. Hortense, greatly excited, said, Are you really sure that there has been a murder, and that the murder was done by someone belonging to the house? Quite sure. But why are you so certain? Because I know who the two victims were and what caused them to be killed. Prince Renin was making none but positive statements, and his method suggested the belief that he supported by the strongest proof. Monsieur Desgleroches strode up and down the room with his hands behind his back. He ended by saying, I always had an instinctive feeling that something had happened, 
but I never tried to find out. Now, as a matter of fact, twenty years ago, a relation of mine, a distant cousin, used to live at the Domaine de Alain. I hoped, because of the name I bear, that this story, which, as I say, I never knew but suspected, would remain hidden forever. So this cousin killed somebody? Yes, he was obliged to. Renin shook his head. I am sorry to have to amend that phrase, my dear sir. The truth, on the contrary, is that your cousin took his victims' lives in cold blood and in a cowardly manner. I never heard of a crime more deliberately and craftily planned. What is it that you know? The moment had come for Renin to explain himself, a solemn and anguish-stricken moment, the full gravity of which Hortense understood though she had not yet divined any part of the tragedy which the prince unfolded step by step. "'It's a very simple story,' he said. "'There is every reason to believe that Monsieur d'Aigleroche was married, and that there was another couple living in the neighbourhood with whom the owner of the Domaine de Alingre were on friendly terms. What happened one day, which of these four persons first disturbed the relations between the two households, I am unable to say, but a likely version, which at once occurs to the mind, is that your cousin's wife, Madame d'Aigleroche, was in the habit of meeting the other husband in the ivy-covered tower, which had a door opening outside the estate. On discovering the intrigue, your cousin d'Aigleroche resolved to be revenged, but in such a manner that there should be no scandal, and that no one even should ever know that the guilty pair had been killed. Now he had ascertained, as I did just now, that there was a part of the house, the Belvedere, from which you can see, over the trees and the undulations of the park, the tower standing eight hundred yards away, and that this was the only place that overlooked the top of the tower. He therefore pierced a hole in the parapet, through one of the former loopholes, and from there, by using a telescope which fitted exactly in the groove which he had hollowed out, he watched the meetings of the two lovers. And it was from there also that, after carefully taking all his measurements and calculating all his distances, on a Sunday, the 5th of September, when the house was empty, he killed them with two shots. The truth was becoming apparent. The light of day was breaking. The Count muttered, Yes, that's what must have happened. I expected my cousin d'Aigleroche. The murderer, Renin continued, stopped up the loophole neatly with a clod of earth, no one would ever know that two dead bodies were decaying on the top of that tower which was never visited, and of which he took the precaution to demolish the wooden stairs. Nothing, therefore, remained for him to do but to explain the disappearance of his wife and his friend. This presented no difficulty. He accused them of having eloped together. Hortense gave a start. Suddenly, as though the last sentence were a complete and to her an absolutely unexpected revelation, she understood what Renin was trying to convey. "'What do you mean?' she asked. "'I mean that Monsieur d'Aigleroche accused his wife and his friend of eloping together.' "'No, no,' she cried. "'I can't allow that. You are speaking of a cousin of my uncle's. Why mix up the two stories?' "'Why mix up this story with another which took place at that time?' said the prince. "'But I am not mixing them up, my dear madame.' There is only one story, and I am telling it as it happened. Hortense turned to her uncle. He sat silent with his arms folded, and his head remained in the shadow cast by the lampshade. Why had he not protested? Lenin repeated in a firm tone, There is only one story. On the evening of that very day, the 5th of September, at 8 o'clock, Monsieur d'Aigleroche, doubtless alleging as his reason that he was going in pursuit of the runaway couple, left his house after boarding up the entrance. He went away, leaving all the rooms as they were, and removing only the firearms from their glass case. At the last minute he had a presentiment, which has been justified today, that the discovery of the telescope which had played so great a part in the preparation of his crime might serve as a clue to an inquiry, and he threw it into the clock case, where, as luck would have it, it interrupted the swing of the pendulum. This unreflecting action, one of those which every criminal inevitably commits, was to betray him twenty years later. Just now the blows which I struck to force the door of the drawing-room released the pendulum. The clock was set going, 
struck eight o'clock, and I possessed the clue of thread which was to lead me through the labyrinth. Proofs, stammered Hortense. Proofs! Proofs, replied Renin in a loud voice. Why, there are any number of proofs, and you know them as well as I do. Who could have killed at that distance of eight hundred yards except an expert shot, an ardent sportsman? You agree, Monsieur Deglaroche, do you not? Proofs? Why, was nothing removed from the house, nothing except the guns, those guns which an ardent sportsman cannot afford to leave behind. You agree, Monsieur Deglaroche, those guns which we find here, hanging in trophies on the walls. Proofs? What about that date, the 5th of September, which was the date of the crime, and which has left such a horrible memory in the criminal's mind, that every year at this time, at this time alone, he surrounds himself with distractions, and that every year, on this same 5th of September, he forgets his habits of temperance. Well, today is the 5th of September. Proofs? Why, if there weren't any others, would that not be enough for you? And Renin, flinging out his arm, pointed to the Comte d'Aiglaroche, who, terrified by this evocation of the past, had sunk huddled into a chair and was hiding his head in his hands. Hortense did not attempt to argue with him. She had never liked her uncle, or rather her husband's uncle. She now accepted the accusation laid against him. Sixty seconds passed. Then M. Deglaroche walked up to them and said, Whether the story be true or not, you can't call a husband a criminal for avenging his honor and killing his faithless wife. No, replied Renin, but I have told only the first version of the story. There is another which is infinitely more serious and more probable, one to which a more thorough investigation would be sure to lead. What do you mean? I mean this. It may not be a matter of a husband taking the law into his own hands, as I charitably supposed. It may be a matter of a ruined man who covets his friend's money and his friend's wife, and who, with this object in view, to secure his freedom, to get rid of his friend and of his own wife, draws them into a trap, suggests to them that they should visit that lonely tower, and kills them by shooting them from a distance safely under cover. No, no the Count protested. No, all that is untrue. I don't say it isn't. I am basing my accusation on proofs, but also on intuitions and arguments which up to now have been extremely accurate. All the same, I admit that the second version may be incorrect. But if so, why feel any remorse? One does not feel remorse for punishing guilty people. One does for taking life. It is a crushing burden to bear. Was it to give himself greater strength to bear this burden that M. Deglaroche afterwards married his victim's widow? For that, sir, is the crux of the question. What was the motive of that marriage? Was M. Deglaroche penniless? Was the woman he was taking as his second wife rich? Or were they both in love with each other, and did M. Deglaroche plan with her to kill his first wife and the husband of his second wife? These are problems to which I do not know the answer. They have no interest for the moment. But the police, with all the means at their disposal, would have no great difficulty in elucidating them. M. Deglaroche staggered and had to steady himself against the back of a chair. Livid in the face, he spluttered, Are you going to inform the police? No, no, said Renin. To begin with, there is the statute of limitations. Then there are twenty years of remorse and dread a memory which will pursue the criminal to his dying hour, accompanied, no doubt, by domestic discord, hatred, a daily hell, and, in the end, the necessity of returning to the tower and removing the traces of the two murders, the frightful punishment of climbing that tower, of touching those skeletons, of undressing them and burying them. That will be enough. We will not ask for more. We will not give it to the public to batten on and create a scandal which would recoil upon M. Deglaroche's niece. No, let us leave this disgraceful business alone. The Count resumed his seat at the table, with his hands clutching his forehead, and asked, Then why... Why do I interfere? said Renin. What you mean is that I must have had some object in speaking. That is so... There must be indeed a penalty, however slight, and our interview must lead to some practical result. 
but have no fear. Monsieur de Glaroche will be let off lightly. The contest was ended. The Count felt that he had only a small formality to fulfill, a sacrifice to accept, and recovering some of his self-assurance, he said, in an almost sarcastic tone, "'What's your price?' Renin burst out laughing. <laughs> <laughs> "'Splendid! You see the position! Only you make a mistake in drawing me into the business. I'm working for the glory of the thing.' "'In that case, you will be called upon at most to make restitution.' "'Restitution?' Renin leaned over the table and said, "'In one of those drawers is a deed awaiting your signature. It is a draft agreement between you and your niece, Hortense Danielle, relating to her private fortune, which fortune was squandered and for which you are responsible. Sign the deed.' Monsieur Deglaroche gave a start. "'Do you know the amount?' "'I don't wish to know it. And if I refuse?' I shall ask to see the Comtesse de Glavache. Without further hesitation, the Count opened a drawer, produced a document on stamped paper, and quickly signed it. Here you are, he said, and I hope, you hope, as I do, that you and I may never have any future dealings. I'm convinced of it. I shall leave this evening, your niece, no doubt, tomorrow. Good-bye. In the drawing-room, which was still empty, while the guests at the house were dressing for dinner, Renin handed the deed to Hortense. She seemed dazed by all that she had heard, and the thing that bewildered her even more than the relentless light shed upon her uncle's past was the miraculous insight and amazing lucidity displayed by this man, the man who for some hours had controlled events and conjured up before her eyes the actual scenes of a tragedy which no one had beheld. "'Are you satisfied with me?' he asked. She gave him both her hands. You have saved me from Rosigny. You have given me back my freedom and my independence. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Oh, that's not what I'm asking you to say, he answered. My first and main object was to amuse you. Your life seemed so humdrum and lacking in the unexpected. Has it been so today? How can you ask such a question? I have had the strangest and most stirring experiences. That is life, he said, when one knows how to use one's eyes. Adventure exists everywhere, in the meanest hovel, under the mask of the wisest of men. Everywhere, if you are only willing, you will find an excuse for excitement, for doing good, for saving a victim, for ending an injustice. Impressed by his power and authority, she murmured, Who are you exactly? An adventurer, nothing more, a lover of adventures. Life is not worth living except in moments of adventure, the adventures of others or personal adventures. Today's has upset you because it affected the innermost depths of your being, but those of others are no less stimulating. Would you like to make the experiment? How? Become the companion of my adventures. If anyone calls on me for help, help him with me. If chance or instinct puts me on the track of a crime or the trace of a sorrow, let us both set out together. Do you consent? Yes, she said, but she hesitated, as though trying to guess the Nin's secret intentions. But, he said, expressing her thoughts for her with a smile, you are a trifle skeptical. What you are saying to yourself is, how far does that lover of adventures want to make me go? It is quite obvious that I attract him, and sooner or later he would not be sorry to receive payment for his services. You are quite right. You must have a formal contract. Very formal, said Hortense, preferring to give a jesting tone to the conversation. Let me hear your proposals. He reflected for a moment and continued. Well, we'll say this. The clock at Alingue gave eight strokes this afternoon, the day of the first adventure. Will you accept its decree and agree to carry out seven more of these delightful enterprises with me, during a period, for instance— of three months? And shall we say that, at the eighth, you will be pledged to grant me... What? He deferred his answer. Observe that you will always be at liberty to leave me on the road if I do not succeed in interesting you. But if you accompany me to the end, 
if you allow me to begin and complete the eighth enterprise with you, in three months, on the 5th of December, at the very moment when the eighth stroke of that clock sounds, and it will sound, you may be sure of that, for the old brass pendulum will not stop swinging again, you will be pledged to grant me. What? she repeated, a little unnerved by waiting. He was silent. He looked at the beautiful lips which he had meant to claim as his reward. He felt perfectly certain that Hortense had understood, and he thought it unnecessary to speak more plainly. The mere delight of seeing you will be enough to satisfy me. It is not for me, but for you, to impose conditions. Name them. What do you demand? She was grateful for his respect, and said, laughingly, <laughs> What do I demand? Yes. Can I demand anything I like, however difficult and impossible? Everything is easy, and everything is possible, to the man who is bent on winning you. Then she said, I demand that you shall restore to me a small, antique clasp, made of a cornelian set in a silver mount. It came to me from my mother, and everyone knew that it used to bring her happiness, and me too. Since the day when it vanished from my jewel case, I have had nothing but unhappiness. Restore it to me, my good genius. When was the clasp stolen? She answered gaily, Seven years ago, or eight, or nine. I don't know exactly. I don't know where. I don't know how. I know nothing about it. I will find it, Lenin declared, and you shall be happy. End of chapter one. Chapter Two of the Eight Strokes of the Clock. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Eight Strokes of the Clock by Maurice Leblanc. Chapter Two The Water Bottle. Four days after she had settled down in Paris, Hortense Daniel agreed to meet Prince Renin in the Bois. It was a glorious morning, and they sat down on the terrace of the Restaurant Imperial, a little to one side. Hortense, feeling glad to be alive, was in a playful mood, full of attractive grace. Renin, lest he should startle her, refrained from alluding to the compact into which they had entered at his suggestion. She told him how she had left La Marese and said that she had not heard of Razigny. "'I have,' said Renin. "'I've heard of him.' "'Oh?' "'Yes, he sent me a challenge. We fought a duel this morning.' Razigny got a scratch in the shoulder. That finished the duel. Let's talk of something else. There was no further mention of Razigny. Renin at once expounded to Hortense the plan of two enterprises which he had in view, and which he offered, with no great enthusiasm, to let her share. The first adventure, he declared, is that which we do not foresee. It comes unexpectedly, unannounced, and no one, save the initiated, realizes that an opportunity to act and to expend one's energies is close at hand. It has to be seized at once. A moment's hesitation may mean that we are too late. We are warned by a special sense, like that of a sleuth-hound which distinguishes the right scent from all the others that cross it. The terrace was beginning to fill up around them. At the next table sat a young man reading a newspaper. They were able to see his insignificant profile and his long, dark moustache. From behind them, through an open window of the restaurant, came the distinct strains of a band. In one of the rooms a few couples were dancing. As Renin was paying for the refreshments, the young man with the long moustache stifled a cry, and in a choking voice called one of the waiters. "'What do I owe you? No change? Oh, good Lord, hurry up! Renin, without a moment's hesitation, had picked up the paper. After casting a swift glance down the page, he read, under his breath, Maître Dourdain, the counsel for the defense in the trial of Jacques Aubrieux, has been received at the Élysée. We are informed that the President of the Republic has refused to reprieve the condemned man, and that the execution will take place tomorrow morning. After crossing the terrace, the young man found himself faced at the entrance to the garden by a lady and gentleman who blocked his way, and the latter said, 
Excuse me, sir, but I noticed your agitation. It's about Jacques Aubrieux, isn't it? Yes, yes, Jacques Aubrieux, the young man stammered. Jacques, the friend of my childhood, I'm hurrying to see his wife. She must be beside herself with grief. Can I offer you my assistance? I am Prince Renin. This lady and I would be happy to call on Madame Aubrieux and to place our services at her disposal. The young man, upset by the news which he had read, seemed not to understand. He introduced himself awkwardly. My name is Dutreuil, Gaston Dutreuil. Renin beckoned to his chauffeur, who was waiting at some little distance, and pushed Gaston Dutreuil into the car, asking, What address? Where does Madame Aubrieux live? Twenty-three Biz Avenue du Roule. After helping Hortense in, Renin repeated the address to the chauffeur, and, as soon as they drove off, tried to question Gaston Dutreuil. I know very little of the case, he said. Tell it to me as briefly as you can. Jacques Aubrieux killed one of his near relations, didn't he? He is innocent, sir, replied the young man, who seemed incapable of giving the least explanation. Innocent, I swear it. I've been Jacques's friend for twenty years. He is innocent, and it would be monstrous. There was nothing to be got out of him. Besides, it was only a short drive. They entered Neuilly through the Porte des Sablons, and two minutes later stopped before a long, narrow passage between high walls which led them to a small, one-storied house. Gaston Dutre rang. Madame is in the drawing-room with her mother, said the maid who opened the door. I'll go into the ladies, he said, taking Renin and Hortense with him. It was a fair-sized, prettily furnished room, which in ordinary times must have been used also as a study. Two women sat weeping, one of whom, elderly and grey-haired, came up to Gaston Dutreuil. He explained the reason for Renin's presence, and she at once cried amid her sobs, My daughter's husband is innocent, sir. Jacques? A better man never lived. He was so good-hearted. Murder his cousin. But he worshipped his cousin. I swear that he's not guilty, sir. And you're going to commit the infamy of putting him to death? Oh, sir, it will kill my daughter. Renin realized that all these people had been living for months under the obsession of that innocence, and in the certainty that an innocent man could never be executed. The news of the execution, which was now inevitable, was driving them mad. He went up to a poor creature bent in two, whose face, a quite young face, framed in pretty flaxen hair, was convulsed with desperate grief. Hortense, who had already taken a seat beside her, gently drew her head against her shoulder. Renin said to her, Madame, I do not know what I can do for you, but I give you my word of honor that if any one in this world can be of use to you, it is myself. I therefore implore you to answer my questions as though the clear and definite wording of your replies were able to alter the aspect of things, and as though you wished to make me share your opinion of Jacques Aubrieux for he is innocent, is he not? Oh, sir, indeed he is, she exclaimed, and the woman's whole soul was in the words. You are certain of it, but you were unable to communicate your certainty to the court. Well, you must now compel me to share it. I am not asking you to go into details and to live again through the hideous torment which you have suffered, but merely to answer certain questions. Will you do this? I, I will. Renin's influence over her was complete. With a few sentences, Renin had succeeded in subduing her and inspiring her with the will to obey, and once more Hortense realized all the man's power, authority, and persuasion. "'What was your husband?' he asked, after begging the mother and Gaston Dutreuil to preserve absolute silence. "'An insurance broker. Lucky in business? Until last year, yes.' So there have been financial difficulties during the past few months. Yes. And the murder was committed when? Last March, on a Sunday. Who was the victim? A distant cousin, Monsieur Guillaume, who lived at Suresnes. What was the sum stolen? Sixty thousand franc notes, which this cousin had received the day before, in payment of a long outstanding debt. 
Did your husband know that? Yes, his cousin told him of it on the Sunday, in the course of a conversation on the telephone, and Jock insisted that his cousin ought not to keep so large a sum in the house, and that he ought to pay it into a bank next day. Was this in the morning? At one o'clock in the afternoon, Jacques was to have gone to M. Guillaume on his motorcycle, but he felt tired and told him that he would not go out, so he remained here all day. Alone? Yes, the two servants were out. I went to the Cinéma des Ternes with my mother and our friend Dutreuil. In the evening we learned that M. Guillaume had been murdered. Next morning Jacques was arrested. On what evidence? The poor creature hesitated to reply. The evidence of guilt had evidently been overwhelming. Then, obeying a sign from Renine, she answered without a pause. The murderer went to Sorraine on a motorcycle. The tracks discovered were those of my husband's machine. They found a handkerchief with my husband's initials, and the revolver which was used belonged to him. Lastly, one of our neighbors maintains that she saw my husband go out on his bicycle at three o'clock, and another that he saw him come in at half-past four. The murder was committed at four o'clock. And what does Jacques Aubrieux say in his defense? He declares that he slept all the afternoon, during that time, someone came who managed to unlock the cycle shed and take the motorcycle to go to Suresnes. As for the handkerchief and the revolver, they were in the tool bag. There would be nothing surprising in the murderers using them. It seems a plausible explanation. Yes, but the prosecution raised two objections. In the first place, nobody, absolutely nobody, knew that my husband was going to stay at home all day because, on the contrary, it was his habit to go out on his motorcycle every Sunday afternoon. And the second objection? She flushed and murmured. The murderer went to the pantry at Monsieur Guillaume's and drank half a bottle of wine straight out of the bottle, which shows my husband's fingerprints. It seemed as though her strength was exhausted, and as though at the same time the unconscious hope which Renin's intervention had awakened in her had suddenly vanished before the accumulation of adverse facts. Again she collapsed, withdrawn into a sort of silent meditation from which Hortense's affectionate attentions were unable to distract her. The mother stammered, "'He's not guilty, is he, sir? And they can't punish an innocent man. They haven't the right to kill my daughter. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Dear, what have we done to be tortured like this? My poor little Madeleine. She will kill herself, said Dutreuil in a scared voice. She will never be able to endure the idea that they are guillotining Jacques. She will kill herself presently, this very night. Renin was striding up and down the room. You can do nothing for her, can you? asked Hortense. It's half past eleven now, he replied in an anxious tone, and it's to happen tomorrow morning. Do you think he's guilty? I don't know. I don't know. The poor woman's conviction is too impressive to be neglected. When two people have lived together for years, they can hardly be mistaken about each other to that degree. And yet... He stretched himself out on a sofa and lit a cigarette. He smoked three in succession, without a word from anyone to interrupt his train of thought. From time to time he looked at his watch. Every minute was of such importance. At last he went back to Madeleine Aubrieux, took her hands, and said, very gently, "'You must not kill yourself. There is hope left until the last minute has come, and I promise you that, for my part, I will not be disheartened until that last minute.' but I need your calmness and your confidence. I will be calm, she said with a pitiable air, and confident, and confident. Well, wait for me. I shall be back in two hours from now. Will you come with us, Monsieur Dutreuil? As they were stepping into his car, he asked the young man, Do you know any small, unfrequented restaurant not too far inside Paris? There's the Brasserie Lutetia, on the ground floor of the house in which I live, on the Place des Ternes. Capital, that will be very handy. They scarcely spoke on the way. Renin, however, said to Gaston Dutreuil, So far as I remember, the numbers of the notes are known, aren't they? 
Yes, Monsieur Guillaume had entered the sixty numbers in his pocket-book. Renin muttered a moment later, That's where the whole problem lies. Where are the notes? If we could lay our hands on them, we should know everything. At the Brasserie du Tisha, there was a telephone in the private room where he asked to have lunch served. When the waiter had left him alone with Hortense and Dutreuil, he took down the receiver with a resolute air. Hello, Prefecture of Police, please. Hello? Hello? Is that the Prefecture of Police? Please put me on to the criminal investigation department. I have a very important communication to make. You can say it's Prince Renin. Holding the receiver in his hand, he turned to Gaston Dutreuil. I can ask someone to come here, I suppose. We shall be quite undisturbed. Quite. He listened again. The secretary to the head of the criminal investigation department. Oh, excellent. Mr. Secretary, I have on several occasions been in communication with Monsieur Dudouis, and have given him information which has been of great use to him. He is sure to remember Prince Renin. I may be able today to show him where the sixty thousand franc notes are hidden which Aubrieux the murderer stole from his cousin. If he's interested in the proposal, beg him to send an inspector to the Brasserie du Tisha, Place des Ternes. I shall be there with a lady and Monsieur Dutreuil, Aubrieux's friend. Good day, Mr. Secretary. When Renin hung up the instrument, he saw the amazed faces of Hortense and of Gaston Dutreuil confronting him. Hortense whispered, Then you know you've discovered? <laughs> Nothing, he said, laughing. Well, well, I'm acting as though I knew. It's not a bad method. Let's have some lunch, shall we? The clock marked a quarter to one. The man from the prefecture will be here, he said, in twenty minutes at latest. And if no one comes, Hortense objected. That would surprise me. Of course, if I had sent a message to Monsieur Dudouis saying, Aubrieux is innocent, I should have failed to make any impression. It's not the least use on the eve of an execution to attempt to convince the gentry of the police or of the law that a man condemned to death is innocent. No, from henceforth Jacques Aubrieux belongs to the executioner. But the prospect of securing the sixty banknotes is a windfall worth taking a little trouble over. Just think, that was the weak point in the indictment, those sixty notes which they were unable to trace. But as you know nothing of their whereabouts... My dear girl, I hope you don't mind my calling you so. My dear girl, when a man can't explain this or that physical phenomenon, he adopts some sort of theory which explains the various manifestations of the phenomenon, and says that everything happened as though the theory were correct. That's what I am doing. That amounts to saying that you are going upon a supposition. Renin did not reply. Not until some time later, when lunch was over, did he say, Obviously I am going upon a supposition. If I had several days before me, I should take the trouble of first verifying my theory, which is based upon intuition quite as much as upon a few scattered facts. But I have only two hours, and I am embarking on the unknown path, as though I were certain that it would lead me to the truth. And suppose you are wrong. I have no choice. Besides, it is too late. There's a knock. Oh, one word more. Whatever I may say... Don't contradict me, nor you, Monsieur Dutreuil. He opened the door. A thin man with a red imperial entered. Prince Renin? Yes, sir. You, of course, are from Monsieur Dudouis. Yes. And the newcomer gave his name, Chief Inspector Morisseau. I'm obliged to you for coming so promptly, Mr. Chief Inspector, said Prince Renin, and I hope that Monsieur Dudouis will not regret having placed you at my disposal. At your entire disposal, in addition to two inspectors whom I have left in the square outside, and who have been in the case with me from the first. I shall not detain you for any length of time, said Renin, and I will not even ask you to sit down. We have only a few minutes in which to settle everything. You know what it's all about. The sixty thousand franc notes stolen from Monsieur Guillaume, I have the numbers here. Renin ran his eyes down the slip of paper which the chief inspector handed him and said, That's right, the two lists agree. Inspector Morisseau seemed greatly excited. The chief attaches the greatest importance to your discovery, so you will be able to show me. Renin was silent for a moment and then declared, 
Mr. Chief Inspector, a personal investigation, and a most exhaustive investigation it was, as I will explain to you presently, has revealed the fact that, on his return from Suresnes, the murderer, after replacing the motorcycle in the shed in the Avenue du Roule, ran to the town and entered this house. This house? Yes. But what did he come here for? To hide the proceeds of his theft, the sixty banknotes. How do you mean? Where? In a flat of which he had the key, on the fifth floor. Gaston Dutreuil exclaimed in amazement, But there's only one flat on the fifth floor, and that's the one I live in. Exactly. And as you were at the cinema with Madame Aubrieux and her mother, advantage was taken of your absence. Impossible! No one has the key except myself. One can get in without a key. But I have seen no marks of any kind. Marisot intervened. Come, let us understand one another. You say the banknotes were hidden in Monsieur Dutreuil's flat? Yes. Then, as Jacques Aubrier was arrested the next morning, the notes ought to be there still. That's my opinion. Gaston Dutreuil could not help laughing. <laughs> but, but that's absurd. I should have found them. Did you look for them? No, but I should have come across them at any moment. The place isn't big enough to swing a cat in. Would you care to see it? However small it may be, it's large enough to hold sixty bits of paper. Of course, everything is possible, said Dutreuil. Still, I must repeat that nobody, to my knowledge, has been to my rooms, that there is only one key, that I am my own housekeeper, and that I can't quite understand. Hortense, too, could not understand. With her eyes fixed on Prince Renin's, she was trying to read his innermost thoughts. What game was he playing? Was it her duty to support his statements? She ended by saying, Mr. Chief Inspector, since Prince Renin maintains that the notes have been put away upstairs, wouldn't the simplest thing be to go and look? Monsieur Dutreuil will take us up, won't you? This minute, said the young man. As you say, that will be simplest. They all four climbed the five stories of the house, and after Dutreuil had opened the door, entered a tiny set of chambers consisting of a sitting-room, bedroom, kitchen, and bathroom, all arranged with fastidious neatness. It was easy to see that every chair in the sitting-room occupied a definite place. The pipes had a rack to themselves, so had the matches. Three walking-sticks, arranged according to their length, hung from three nails. On a little table before the window, a hat-box, filled with tissue paper, awaited the felt hat which Dutreuil carefully placed in it. He laid his gloves beside it on the lid. He did all this with sedate and mechanical movements, like a man who loves to see things in the places which he has chosen for them. Indeed, no sooner did Renin shift something than Dutreuil made a slight gesture of protest, took out his hat again, stuck it on his head, opened the window and rested his elbows on the sill, with his back turned to the room, as though he were unable to bear the sight of such vandalism. "'You're positive, are you not?' the inspector asked Renin. "'Yes, yes, I'm positive that the sixty notes were brought here after the murder. Let's look for them.' This was easy and soon done. In half an hour not a corner remained unexplored, not a knick-knack unlifted. "'Nothing.' said Inspector Marisot. Shall we continue? No, replied Renin. The notes are no longer here. What do you mean? I mean that they have been removed. By whom? Can't you make a more definite accusation? Renin did not reply, but Gaston Dutreuil wheeled round. He was choking and spluttered, Mr. Inspector, would you like me to make the accusation more definite, as conveyed by this gentleman's remarks? It all means that there's a dishonest man here, that the notes hidden by the murderer were discovered and stolen by that dishonest man, and deposited in another and safer place. That is your idea, sir, is it not? And you accuse me of committing this theft, don't you? He came forward, drumming his chest with his fists. Me! Me! I found the notes, did I, and kept them for myself? You dare to suggest that! Renin still made no reply. Dutreuil flew into a rage, and, taking Inspector Morisot aside, exclaimed, 
Mr. Inspector, I strongly protest against all this farce and against the part which you are unconsciously playing in it. Before your arrival, Prince Renin told this lady and myself that he knew nothing, that he was venturing into this affair at random, and that he was following the first road that offered, trusting to luck. Do you deny it, sir? Renin did not open his lips. Answer me, will you? Explain yourself, for really you are putting forward the most improbable facts without any proof whatever. It's easy enough to say that I stole the notes. And how are you to know that they were here at all? Who brought them here? Why should the murderer choose this flat to hide them in? It's all so stupid, so illogical and absurd. Give us your proof, sir. One single proof. Inspector Morisseau seemed perplexed. He questioned Renin with a glance. Renin said, Since you want specific details, we will get them from Madame Aubrieu herself. She's on the telephone. Let's go downstairs. We shall know all about it in a minute. Dutre shrugged his shoulders. As you please. But what a waste of time. He seemed greatly irritated. His long wait at the window under a blazing sun had thrown him into a sweat. He went to his bedroom and returned with a bottle of water, of which he took a few sips, afterwards placing the bottle on the window sill. Come along, he said. Prince Renin chuckled. Ha, ha, ha. You seem to be in a hurry to leave the place. I'm in a hurry to show you up, retorted Dutreuil, slamming the door. They went downstairs to the private room containing the telephone. The room was empty. Renin asked Gaston Dutreuil for the Aubrieux's number, took down the instrument, and was put through. The maid who came to the telephone answered that Madame Aubrieux had fainted after giving way to an excess of despair and that she was now asleep. Fetch her mother, please. Prince Renin speaking. It's urgent. He handed the second receiver to Morisseau. For that matter, the voices were so distinct that Dutreuil and Hortense were able to hear every word exchanged. Is that you, madame? Yes. Prince Renin, I believe. Prince Renin. Oh, sir, what news have you for me? Is there any hope? asked the old lady in a tone of entreaty. The inquiry is proceeding very satisfactorily, said Renin, and you may hope for the best. For the moment, I want you to give me some very important particulars. On the day of the murder, did Gaston Dutre come to your house? Yes, he came to fetch my daughter and myself after lunch. Did he know at the time that Monsieur Guillaume had sixty thousand francs at his place? Yes, I told him. And that Jacques Aubrier was not feeling very well, and was proposing not to take his usual cycle ride, but to stay at home and sleep. Yes. You are sure? Absolutely certain. And you all three went to the cinema together? Yes. And you are all sitting together? Oh, no, there was no room. He took a seat farther away. A seat where you could see him? No. But he came to you during the interval? No, we did not see him until we were going out. There is no doubt of that. None at all. Very well, madame. I will tell you the result of my efforts in an hour's time. But above all, don't wake up madame Aubrieux. And suppose she wakes of her own accord? Reassure her and give her confidence. Everything is going well, very well indeed. He hung up the receiver and turned to Dutreuil, laughing. Ha <laughs> ha, my boy. Things are beginning to look clearer. What do you say? It was difficult to tell what these words meant or what conclusions Renin had drawn from his conversation. The silence was painful and oppressive. Mr. Chief Inspector, you have some of your men outside, haven't you? Two detective sergeants. It's important they should be there. Please also ask the manager not to disturb us on any account. And when Morisseau returned, Renin closed the door took his stand in front of Dutreuil, and speaking in a good-humoured but emphatic tone, said, It amounts to this, young man, that the lady saw nothing of you between three and five o'clock on that Sunday. That's rather a curious detail. A perfectly natural detail, Dutreuil retorted, and one, moreover, which proves nothing at all. It proves, young man, that you had a good two hours at your disposal. Obviously, two hours which I spent at the cinema. Or somewhere else. Dutreuil looked at him. Somewhere else? 
Yes. As you were free, you had plenty of time to go wherever you liked. To Surin, for instance. Oh, said the young man, jesting in his turn. Surin is a long way off. It's quite close. Hadn't you your friend Jacques Aubrieux's motorcycle? A fresh pause followed these words. Dutreuil had knitted his brows as though he were trying to understand. At last he was heard to whisper, So that is what he was trying to lead up to. The brute! Renin brought down his hand on Dutreuil's shoulder. No more talk. Facts! Gaston Dutreuil, you are the only person who on that day knew two essential things. First, that cousin Guillaume had sixty thousand francs in his house. Secondly, that Jacques Aubrieux was not going out. You at once saw your chance. The motorcycle was available. You slipped out during the performance. You went to Suren. You killed cousin Guillaume. You took the sixty banknotes and left them at your rooms. And at five o'clock you went back to fetch the ladies. Dutreuil had listened with an expression at once mocking and flurried, casting an occasional glance at Inspector Morisseau as though to enlist him as a witness. The man's mad, it seemed to say. It's no use being angry with him. When Renin had finished, he began to laugh. <laughs> Very funny! A capital joke! So it was I whom the neighbor saw going and returning on the motorcycle. It was you disguised in Jacques Aubrieux's clothes. And it was my fingerprints that were found on the bottle in Monsieur Guillaume's pantry. The bottle had been opened by Jacques Aubrieux at lunch in his own house, and it was you who took it with you to serve as evidence. <laughs> funnier and funnier, cried Dutreuil, who had the air of being frankly amused. Then I contrived the whole affair so that Jacques Aubrieux might be accused of the crime. It was the safest means of not being accused yourself. Yes, but Jacques is a friend whom I have known from childhood. You're in love with his wife. The young man gave a sudden, infuriated start. You dare! Why, you dare make such an infamous suggestion! I have proof of it. That's a lie! I have always respected Madeleine Aubrieux and revered her. Apparently... But you are in love with her. You desire her. Don't contradict me. I have abundant proof of it. That's a lie, I tell you. You have only known me a few hours. Come, come. I've been quietly watching you for days, waiting for the moment to pounce upon you. He took the young man by the shoulders and shook him. Come, Dutreuil, confess. I hold all the proofs in my hand. I have witnesses whom we shall meet presently at the Criminal Investigation Department. Confess, can't you? In spite of everything, you're tortured by remorse. Remember your dismay at the restaurant when you had seen the newspaper. What, Jacques Aubrieux condemned to die? That's more than you bargained for. Penal servitude would have suited your book. But the scaffold? Jacques Aubrieux executed tomorrow, an innocent man. Confess, won't you? Confess to save your own skin. Own up. Bending over the other, he was trying with all his might to extort a confession from him. But Dutreuil drew himself up and, coldly, with a sort of scorn in his voice, said, Sir, you are a madman. Not a word that you have said has any sense in it. All your accusations are false. What about the banknotes? Did you find them at my place, as you said you would? Renin, exasperated, clenched his fist in his face. Oh, you swine! I'll dish you yet, I swear I will. He drew the inspector aside. Well, what do you say to it? An errant rogue, isn't he? The inspector nodded his head. It may be, but all the same, so far there's no real evidence. Wait, Monsieur Morisseau, said Renin. Wait until we've had our interview with Monsieur Dudouy. For we shall see Monsieur Dudouy at the prefecture, shall we not? Yes, he'll be there at three o'clock. Well, you'll be convinced, Mr. Inspector. I tell you here and now that you will be convinced. Venin was chuckling like a man who feels certain of the course of events. Hortense, who was standing near him and was able to speak to him without being heard by the others, asked in a low voice, You've got him, haven't you? He nodded his head in assent. Got him? I should think I have. 
All the same, I'm no farther forward than I was at the beginning. But this is awful. And your proofs? Not the shadow of a proof. I was hoping to trip him up. But he's kept his feet, the rascal. Still, you're certain it's he. It can't be anyone else. I had an intuition at the very outset, and I've not taken my eyes off him since. I have seen his anxiety increasing as my investigation seemed to center on him and concern him more closely. Now I know. And he's in love with Madame Aubrieux. In logic, he's bound to be. But so far we have only hypothetical suppositions, or rather certainties which are personal to myself. We shall never intercept the guillotine with those. Oh, if we could only find the banknotes. Given the banknotes, M. Dudouis would act. Without them, he will laugh in my face. What, then? murmured Hortense in anguished accents. He did not reply. He walked up and down the room, assuming an air of gaiety and rubbing his hands. All was going so well. It was really a treat to take out a case which, so to speak, worked itself out automatically. Suppose we went on to the prefecture, Monsieur Marisseau. The chief must be there by now, and, having gone so far, we may as well finish. Will Monsieur Dutreuil come with us? Why not? said Dutreuil arrogantly. But just as Renin was opening the door, there was a noise in the passage, and the manager ran up, waving his arms. Is Monsieur Dutreuil still here? Monsieur Dutreuil, your flat is on fire. A man outside told us. He saw it from the square. The young man's eyes lit up. For perhaps half a second, his mouth was twisted by a smile which Renin noticed. Oh, you ruffian, he cried. You've given yourself away, my beauty. It was you who set fire to the place upstairs, and now the notes are burning. He blocked his exit. Let me pass, shouted Dutreuil. There's a fire and no one can get in because no one else has a key. Here it is. Let me pass, damn it. Renin snatched the key from his hand and holding him by the collar of his coat. Don't you move, my fine fellow. The game's up, you precious blackguard. Monsieur Morisseau, will you give orders to the sergeant not to let him out of his sight and to blow out his brains if he tries to get away? Sergeant, we rely on you. Put a bullet into him if necessary. He hurried up the stairs, followed by Hortense and the chief inspector, who was protesting rather peevishly. But I say, look here, it wasn't he who set the place on fire. How do you make out that he set it on fire, seeing that he never left us? Why, he set it on fire beforehand, to be sure. How? I ask you, how? How do I know? But a fire doesn't break out like that for no reason at all, at the very moment when a man wants to burn compromising papers. They heard a commotion upstairs. It was the waiters of the restaurant trying to burst the door open. An acrid smell filled the well of the staircase. Renin reached the top floor. By your leave, friends. I have the key. He inserted it in the lock and opened the door. He was met by a gust of smoke so dense that one might well have supposed the whole floor to be ablaze. Renin at once saw that the fire had gone out of its own accord for lack of fuel and that there were no more flames. Monsieur Morisseau, you won't let anyone come in with us, will you? An intruder might spoil everything. Bolt the door. That will be best. He stepped into the front room, where the fire had obviously had its chief center. The furniture, the walls, and the ceiling, though blackened by the smoke, had not been touched. As a matter of fact, the fire was confined to a blaze of papers, which was still burning in the middle of the room, in front of the window. Renin struck his forehead. Oh, what a fool I am! What an unspeakable ass! Why? asked the inspector. The hat box, of course. The cardboard hat box, which was standing on the table. That's where he hid the notes. They were there all through our search. Impossible. Why, well, yes, we always overlook that particular hiding place, the one just under our eyes, within reach of our hands. How could one imagine that a thief would leave sixty thousand francs in an open cardboard box, in which he places his hat when he comes in, with an absent-minded air? That's just the one place we don't look in. Well played, Monsieur Dutreuil. The inspector, who remained incredulous, repeated, No, no, impossible. We were with him, and he could not have started the fire himself. Everything was prepared beforehand, on the supposition that there might be an alarm. 
the hat box, the tissue paper, the bank notes. They must all have been steeped in some inflammable liquid. He must have thrown a match, a chemical preparation or what not, into it as we were leaving. But we should have seen him hang it all. And then is it credible that a man who has committed a murder for the sake of sixty thousand francs should do away with the money in this way? If the hiding place was such a good one, and it was because we never discovered it, why this useless destruction? He got frightened, Monsieur Morisseau. Remember that his head is at stake, and he knows it. Anything rather than the guillotine. And they, the banknotes, were the only proof which we had against him. How could he have left them where they were? Morisseau was flabbergasted. What? The only proof? Why, obviously. But your witnesses, your evidence, all that you were going to tell the chief. Mere bluff. Well, upon my word, growled the bewildered inspector. You're a cool customer. Would you have taken action without my bluff? No. Then what more do you want? The nin stooped to stir the ashes, but there was nothing left, not even those remnants of stiff paper which still retain their shape. Nothing, he said. It's queer all the same. How the deuce did he manage to set the thing alight? He stood up, looking attentively about him. Hortense had a feeling that he was making his supreme effort, and that after this last struggle in the dark, he would either have devised his plan of victory or admit that he was beaten. Faltering with anxiety, she asked, It's all up, isn't it? No, no, he said thoughtfully. It's not all up. It was a few seconds ago, but now there is a gleam of light, and one that gives me hope. God grant that it may be justified. We must go slowly, he said. It is only an attempt, but a fine, a very fine attempt, and it may succeed. He was silent for a moment, then with an amused smile and a click of the tongue, he said, An infernally clever fellow, that Dutre. His trick of burning the notes. What a fertile imagination, and what coolness. A pretty dance the beggar has led me. He's a master. He fetched a broom from the kitchen and swept a part of the ashes into the next room, returning with a hat-box of the same size and appearance as the one which had been burnt. After crumpling the tissue paper with which it was filled, he placed the hat-box on the little table and set fire to it with a match. It burst into flames, which he extinguished when they had consumed half the cardboard and nearly all the paper. Then he took from an inner pocket of his waistcoat a bundle of banknotes and selected six, which he burnt almost completely, arranging the remains and hiding the rest of the notes at the bottom of the box among the ashes and the blackened bits of paper. Monsieur Morisseau, he said when he had done, I am asking for your assistance for the last time. Go and fetch Dutreuil. Tell him just this. You are unmasked. The notes did not catch fire. Come with me and bring him up here. Despite his hesitation and his fear of exceeding his instructions from the head of the detective service, the chief inspector was powerless to throw off the ascendancy which Renin had acquired over him. He left the room. Renin turned to Hortense. Do you understand my plan of battle? Yes, she said, but it's a dangerous experiment. Do you think that Dutreuil will fall into the trap? Everything depends on the state of his nerves and the degree of demoralization to which he is reduced. A surprise attack may very well do for him. Nevertheless, suppose he recognizes by some sign that the box has been changed. Oh, of course he has a few chances in his favor. The fellow is much more cunning than I thought, and quite capable of wriggling out of the trap. On the other hand, however, how uneasy he must be, how the blood must be buzzing in his ears and obscuring his sight. No, I don't think that he will avoid the trap. He will give in. He will give in. They exchanged no more words. Renin did not move. Hortense was stirred to the very depths of her being. The life of an innocent man hung trembling in the balance. An error of judgment, a little bad luck, and twelve hours later Jacques Aubrieux would be put to death. And together with a horrible anguish, she experienced, in spite of all, a feeling of eager curiosity. What was Prince Renin going to do? What would be the outcome of the experiment on which he was venturing? What resistance would Gaston Dutreuil offer? She lived through one of those minutes of superhuman tension 
in which life becomes intensified until it reaches its utmost value. They heard footsteps on the stairs, the footsteps of men in a hurry. The sound drew nearer. They were reaching the top floor. Hortense looked at her companion, yet stood up and was listening, his features already transfigured by action. The footsteps were now echoing in the passage. Then, suddenly, he ran to the door and cried, Quick, let's make an end of it. Two or three detectives and a couple of waiters entered. He caught hold of Dutreuil in the midst of the detectives and pulled him by the arm, gaily exclaiming, Well done, old man. That trick of yours with the table and the water bottle was really splendid. A masterpiece on my word. Only it didn't come off. What, what do you mean? What's the matter? mumbled Gaston Dutreuil, staggering. What'd I say? The fire burnt only half the tissue paper in the hat box. And though some of the banknotes were destroyed, like the tissue paper, the others are there at the bottom. You understand? The long-sought notes, the great proof of the murder, they're there where you hid them. As chance would have it, they've escaped burning. Here, look, there are the numbers. You can check them. Oh, you're done for. Done for, my beauty. The young man drew himself up stiffly. His eyelids quivered. He did not accept Renin's invitation to look. He examined neither the hat-box nor the bank-notes. From the first moment, without taking the time to reflect and before his instinct could warn him, he believed what he was told and collapsed heavily into a chair, weeping. The surprise attack, to use Renin's expression, had succeeded. On seeing all his plans baffled and the enemy master of his secrets, the wretched man had neither the strength nor the perspicacity necessary to defend himself. He threw up the sponge. Renin gave him no time to breathe. Capital! You're saving your head. And that's all, my good youth. Write down your confession and get it off your chest. Here's a fountain pen. The luck has been against you, I admit. It was devilishly well thought out, your trick of the last moment. You had the banknotes which were in your way and which you wanted to destroy. Nothing simpler. You take a big, round-bellied water bottle and stand it on the window sill. It acts as a burning glass, concentrating the rays of the sun on the cardboard and tissue paper, all nicely prepared. Ten minutes later, it bursts into flames. A splendid idea. And like all great discoveries, it came quite by chance, what? It reminds one of Newton's apple. One day, the sun, passing through the water in that bottle, must have set fire to a scrap of cotton or the head of a match. And as you had the sun at your disposal just now, you said to yourself, Now's the time, and stood the bottle in the right position. My congratulations, Gaston. Look, here's a sheet of paper. Write down, It was I who murdered Monsieur Guillaume. Right, I tell you. Leaning over the young man, with all his implacable force of will, he compelled him to write, guiding his hand and dictating the sentences. Dutreuil, exhausted, at the end of his strength, wrote as he was told. "'Here's a confession, Mr. Chief Inspector,' said Rinin. "'You will be good enough to take it to Monsieur Dudouis. The gentlemen, turning to the waiters from the restaurant, will, I am sure, consent to serve as witnesses.' And seeing that Dutreuil, overwhelmed by what had happened, did not move, he gave him a shake. "'Hi, you. Look alive. Now that you've been fool enough to confess, make an end of the job, my gentle idiot.' The other watched him, standing in front of him. "'Obviously,' Renin continued, "'you're only a simpleton. The hat-box was fairly burnt to ashes. So were the notes. That hat-box, my dear fellow, is a different one, and those notes belong to me.' I even burnt six of them to make you swallow the stunt, and you couldn't make out what had happened. What an owl you must be, to furnish me with evidence at the last moment when I hadn't a single proof of my own. And such evidence! A written confession! Written before witnesses! Look here, my man, if they do cut off your head, as I sincerely hope they will, upon my word, you'll have jolly well deserved it. Good-bye, Dutre. Downstairs in the street, Renin asked Hortense Daniel to take the car, go to Madeleine Aubrieu, and tell her what had happened. And you? asked Hortense. I have a lot to do. Urgent appointments. And you deny yourself the pleasure of bringing the good news? It's one of the pleasures that pall upon one. The only pleasure that never flags is that of the fight itself. 
Afterwards, things ceased to be interesting. She took his hand and for a moment held it in both her own. She would have liked to express all her admiration to that strange man, who seemed to do good as a sort of game, and who did it with something like genius, but she was unable to speak. All these rapid incidents had upset her. Emotion constricted her throat and brought the tears to her eyes. Renin bowed his head, saying, Thank you. I have my reward. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of The Eight Strokes of the Clock This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Eight Strokes of the Clock by Maurice Leblanc Chapter 3 The Case of Jean-Louis Monsieur, continued the young girl, addressing Serge Renin, it was while I was spending the Easter holidays at Nice with my father that I made the acquaintance of Jean-Louis d'Imblaval. Renin interrupted her. Excuse me, mademoiselle, but just now you spoke of this young man as Jean-Louis Vaurois. That's his name also, she said. Has he two names, then? I don't know. I don't know anything about it, she said with some embarrassment, and that is why, by Hortense's advice, I came to ask for your help. This conversation was taking place in Renin's flat on the boulevard Haussmann, to which Hortense had brought her friend Geneviève Aimard, a slender, pretty little creature, with a face overshadowed by an expression of the greatest melancholy. Renin will be successful. Take my word for it, Geneviève. You will, Renin, won't you? Please tell me the rest of the story, mademoiselle, he said. Geneviève continued. I was already engaged at the time to a man whom I loathe and detest, my father was trying to force me to marry him, and is still trying to do so. Jean-Louis and I felt the keenest sympathy for each other, a sympathy that soon developed into a profound and passionate affection, which, I can assure you, was equally sincere on both sides. On my return to Paris, Jean-Louis, who lives in the country with his mother and his aunt, took rooms in our part of the town, and as I am allowed to go out by myself, we used to see each other daily. I need not tell you that we were engaged to be married, I told my father so, and this is what he said. I don't particularly like the fellow, but whether it's he or another, what I want is that you should get married, so let him come and ask for your hand. If not, you must do as I say. In the middle of June, Jean-Louis went home to arrange matters with his mother and aunt. I received some passionate letters, and then just these few words. There are too many obstacles in the way of our happiness. I give up. I am mad with despair. I love you more than ever. Goodbye, and forgive me. Since then I have received nothing, no reply to my letters and telegrams. Perhaps he has fallen in love with somebody else, asked Renin, or there may be some old connection which he is unable to shake off. Geneviève shook her head. Monsieur, believe me, if our engagement had been broken off for an ordinary reason, I should not have allowed Hortense to trouble you. But it is something quite different, I am absolutely convinced. There's a mystery in Jean-Louis's life, or rather an endless number of mysteries which hamper and pursue him. I never saw such distress in a human face, and from the first moment of our meeting I was conscious in him of a grief and melancholy which have always persisted, even at times when he was giving himself to our love with the greatest confidence. But your impression must have been confirmed by minor details, by things which happened to strike you as peculiar. I don't quite know what to say. These two names, for instance. Yes, there was certainly that. By what name did he introduce himself to you? Jean-Louis d'Imblaval. But Jean-Louis Vaudrois? That's what my father calls him. Why? Because that was how he was introduced to my father, at Nice, by a gentleman who knew him. Besides, he carries visiting cards which describe him under either name. Have you never questioned him on this point? Yes, I have, twice. The first time he said that his aunt's name was Vaurois and his mother's d'Imblaval. And the second time? He told me the contrary. He spoke of his mother as Vaurois and of his aunt as d'Imblaval. I pointed this out. He colored up, and I thought it better not to question him any further. Does he live far from Paris? right down in Brittany, at the Manoir des Savins. 
five miles from Caresh. Renin rose and asked the girl seriously, Are you quite certain that he loves you, mademoiselle? I am certain of it, and I know, too, that he represents all my life and all my happiness. He alone can save me. If he can't, then I shall be married in a week's time to a man whom I hate. I have promised my father, and the bans have been published. We shall leave for Carache, Madame Daniel and I, this evening, said Renin. That evening he and Hortense took the train for Brittany. They reached Carache at ten o'clock in the morning, and after lunch, at half-past twelve o'clock, they stepped into a car borrowed from a leading resident of the district. Ha, 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 you're looking a little pale, my dear, said Renin with a laugh, as they alighted by the gate of the garden at El Sevin. I'm very fond of Geneviève, she said. She's the only friend I have, and I'm feeling frightened. He called her attention to the fact that the central gate was flanked by two wickets bearing the names of Madame d'Embleval and Madame Vaurois, respectively. Each of these wickets opened on a narrow path which ran among the shrubberies of Box and Ocuba to the left and right of the main avenue. The avenue itself led to an old manor house, long, low, and picturesque, but provided with two clumsily built, ugly wings, each in a different style of architecture, and each forming the destination of one of the side paths. Madame d'Embleval evidently lived on the left, and Madame Vaurois on the right. Hortense and Renin listened. Shrill, hasty voices were disputing inside the house. The sound came through one of the windows of the ground floor, which was level with the garden, and covered throughout its length with red creepers and white roses. "'We can't go any farther,' said Hortense. "'It would be indiscreet.' "'All the more reason,' whispered Renin. "'Look here. If we walk straight ahead, we shan't be seen by the people who are quarrelling.' The sounds of conflict were by no means abating, and when they reached the window next to the front door, through the roses and creepers they could both see and hear two old ladies shrieking at the tops of their voices and shaking their fists at each other. The women were standing in the foreground, in a large dining-room where the table was not yet cleared, and at the farther side of the table sat a young man, doubtless Jean-Louis himself, smoking his pipe and reading a newspaper, without appearing to trouble about the two old harridans. One of these, a thin, tall woman, was wearing a purple silk dress, and her hair was dressed in a mass of curls much too yellow for the ravaged face around which they tumbled. The other, who was still thinner but quite short, was bustling round the room in a cotton dressing-gown and displayed a red, painted face blazing with anger. "'A baggage, that's what you are!' she yelped. "'The wickedest woman in the world, and a thief into the bargain!' "'I, a thief?' screamed the other. What about that business with the ducks at ten francs apiece? Don't you call that thieving? Hold your tongue, you low creature. Who stole the fifty-franc note from my dressing-table? Lord, that I should have to live with such a wretch! The other started with fury at the outrage, and addressing the young man, cried, Jean, are you going to sit there and let me be insulted by your hussy of a dame Laval? And the tall one retorted furiously, Hussy! Do you hear that, Louis? Look at her, your Vaurois. She's got the airs of a superannuated barmaid. Make her stop, can't you? Suddenly Jean-Louis banged his fist upon the table, making the plates and dishes jump, and shouted, Be quiet, both of you, you old lunatics! They turned upon him at once and loaded him with abuse. Coward! Hypocrite! Liar! A pretty sort of son you are! the son of a slut, and not much better yourself. The insults rained down upon him. He stopped his ears with his fingers, and writhed as he sat at table like a man who has lost all patience and has need to restrain himself lest he should fall upon his enemy. Renin whispered, Now's the time to go in. In among all those infuriated people, protested Hortense. Exactly. We shall see them better with their masks off and with a determined step he walked to the door, opened it, and entered the room, followed by Hortense. His advent gave rise to a feeling of stupefaction. The two women stopped yelling, but were still scarlet in the face and trembling with rage. Jean-Louis, who was very pale, stood up. Profiting by the general confusion, Renin said briskly, "'Allow me to introduce myself. I am Prince Renin. This is Madame Danielle.' We are friends of Mademoiselle Geneviève Aymard, 
and we have come in her name. I have a letter from her addressed to you, monsieur. Jean-Louis, already disconcerted by the newcomer's arrival, lost countenance entirely on hearing the name of Genevieve. Without quite knowing what he was saying, and with the intention of responding to Renin's courteous behavior, he tried in his turn to introduce the two ladies, and let fall the astounding words, My mother, Madame d'Imbleval, my mother, Madame Vaurois. For some time no one spoke. Renin bowed. Hortense did not know with whom she should shake hands, with Madame d'Imbleval, the mother, or with Madame Vaurois, the mother. But what happened was that Madame d'Imbleval and Madame Vaurois, both at the same time, attempted to snatch the letter which Renin was holding out to Jean-Louis, while both at the same time mumbled, Mademoiselle and Ma, she has had the coolness, she has had the audacity. Then Jean-Louis, recovering his self-possession, laid hold of his mother d'Imbleval and pushed her out of the room by a door on the left, and next of his mother Vaurois and pushed her out of the room by a door on the right. Then, returning to his two visitors, he opened the envelope and read in an undertone, I am to be married in a week, Jean-Louis. Come to my rescue, I beseech you. My friend Hortense and Prince Renin will help you to overcome the obstacles that baffle you. Trust them. I love you, Chenevier. He was a rather dull-looking young man, whose very swarthy, lean, and bony face certainly bore the expression of melancholy and distress described by Genevieve. Indeed, the marks of suffering were visible in all his harassed features, as well as in his sad and anxious eyes. He repeated Genevieve's name over and over again, while looking about him with a distracted air. He seemed to be seeking a course of conduct. He seemed on the point of offering an explanation, but could find nothing to say. The sudden intervention had taken him at a disadvantage, like an unforeseen attack which he did not know how to meet. Renin felt that the adversary would capitulate at the first summons. The man had been fighting so desperately during the last few months, and had suffered so severely in the retirement and obstinate silence in which he had taken refuge, that he was not thinking of defending himself. Moreover, how could he do so, now that they had forced their way into the privacy of his odious existence? Take my word for it, monsieur, declared Renin, that it is in your best interests to confide in us. We are Geneviève Emma's friends. Do not hesitate to speak. I can hardly hesitate, he said, after what you have just heard. This is the life I lead, monsieur. I will tell you the whole secret so that you may tell it to Geneviève. She will then understand why I have not gone back to her, and why I have not the right to do so. He pushed a chair forward for Hortense. The two men sat down, and without any need of further persuasion, rather as though he himself felt a certain relief in unburdening himself, he said, You must not be surprised, monsieur, if I tell my story with a certain flippancy, for as a matter of fact it is a frankly comical story, and cannot fail to make you laugh. Fate often amuses itself by playing these imbecile tricks, these monstrous farces which seem as though they must have been invented by the brain of a madman or a drunkard. Judge for yourself. Twenty-seven years ago, the Manoir del Savin, which at that time consisted only of the main building, was occupied by an old doctor, who, to increase his modest means, used to receive one or two paying guests. In this way, Madame d'Imbleval spent the summer here one year, and Madame Vaurois the following summer. Now these two ladies did not know each other. One of them was married to a Breton of a merchant vessel, and the other to a commercial traveller from the Vendée. It so happened that they lost their husbands at the same time, at a period when each of them was expecting a baby, and as they both lived in the country, at places some distance from any town, they wrote to the old doctor that they intended to come to his house for their confinement. He agreed. They arrived almost on the same day in the autumn. Two small bedrooms were prepared for them, behind the room in which we are sitting. The doctor had engaged a nurse who slept in this very room. Everything was perfectly satisfactory. The ladies were putting the finishing touches to their baby clothes and were getting on together splendidly. They were determined that their children should be boys and had chosen the names of Jean and Louis respectively. 
one evening the doctor was called out to a case and drove off in his gig with the manservant saying that he would not be back till next day in her master's absence a little girl who served as maid of all work ran out to keep company with her sweetheart these accidents destiny turned to account with diabolical malignity at about midnight madame d'imblaval was seized with the first pains the nurse mademoiselle boussignol had had some training as a midwife and did not lose her head but an hour later madame vaurois turn came and the tragedy or i might rather say the tragic comedy was enacted amid the screams and moans of the two patients and the bewildered agitation of the nurse running from one to the other bewailing her fate opening the window to call out for the doctor or falling on her knees to implore the aid of providence madame vaurois was the first to bring a son into the world mademoiselle boussignol hurriedly carried him in here washed and tended him and laid him in the cradle prepared for him but madame de Blaval was screaming with pain and the nurse had to attend to her while the newborn child was yelling like a stuck pig and the terrified mother unable to stir from her bed fainted add to this all the wretchedness of darkness and disorder the only lamp without any oil for the servant had neglected to fill it the candles burning out the moaning of the wind the screeching of the owls and you will understand that mademoiselle boussignol was scared out of her wits however at five o'clock in the morning after many tragic incidents she came in here with the dame laval baby likewise a boy washed and tended him laid him in his cradle and went off to help madame vaurois who had come to herself and was crying out while madame d'imblaval had fainted in her turn and when mademoiselle boussignol having settled the two mothers but half crazed with fatigue her brain in a whirl returned to the newborn children she realized with horror that she had wrapped them in similar binders thrust their feet into similar woolen socks and laid them both side by side in the same cradle so that it was impossible to tell louis d'imblaval from jean vaurois to make matters worse when she lifted one of them out of the cradle she found that his hands were cold as ice and that he had ceased to breathe he was dead what was his name and what the survivors three hours later the doctor found the two women in a condition of frenzied delirium while the nurse was dragging herself from one bed to the other entreating the two mothers to forgive her she held me out first to one then to the other to receive their caresses for i was the surviving child and they first kissed me and then pushed me away for after all who was i the son of the widowed madame d'imblaval and the late merchant captain or the son of the widowed madame vaurois and the late commercial traveller there was not a clue by which they could tell the doctor begged each of the two mothers to sacrifice their rights at least from the legal point of view so that i might be called either louis d'imblaval or jean vaurois they refused absolutely why jean vaurois if he's a d'imblaval protested the one why louis d'imblaval if he's a vaurois retorted the other and i was registered under the name of jean louis the son of an unknown father and mother prince Renin had listened in silence but hortense as the story approached its conclusion had given way to a hilarity which she could no longer restrain and suddenly in spite of all of her efforts she burst into a fit of the wildest laughter <laughs> oh, forgive me she said her eyes filled with tears oh, do forgive me it's too much for my nerves don't apologize madame said the young man gently in a voice free from resentment i warned you that my story was laughable i better than any one know how absurd how nonsensical it is yes the whole thing is perfectly grotesque but believe me when i tell you that it was no fun in reality it seems a humorous situation and it remains humorous by the force of circumstances but it is also horrible you can see that for yourself can't you the two mothers neither of whom was certain of being a mother but neither of whom was certain that she was not one both clung to jean louis he might be a stranger on the other hand he might be their own flesh and blood they loved him to excess and fought for him furiously 
and above all they both came to hate each other with a deadly hatred, differing completely in character and education, and obliged to live together because neither was willing to forego the advantage of her possible maternity, they lived the life of irreconcilable enemies who can never lay their weapons aside. I grew up in the midst of this hatred, and had it instilled into me by both of them, when my childish heart, hungering for affection, inclined me to one of them, the other would seek to inspire me with loathing and contempt for her. In this manor house, which they bought on the old doctor's death, and to which they added the two wings, I was the involuntary torturer and their daily victim. Tormented as a child and as a young man, leading the most hideous of lives, I doubt if anyone on earth ever suffered more than I did. "'You ought to have left them!' exclaimed Hortense, who had stopped laughing. "'One can't leave one's mother, and one of those two women was my mother, and a woman can't abandon her son, and each of them was entitled to believe that I was her son. We were all three chained together like convicts, with chains of sorrow, compassion, doubt, and also of hope that the truth might one day become apparent. And here we still are, all three, insulting one another and blaming one another for our wasted lives. Oh, what a hell! There was no escaping it. I tried often enough, but in vain. The broken bonds became tied again. Only this summer, under the stimulus of my love for Geneviève, I tried to free myself and did my utmost to persuade the two women whom I call mother. And then... And then... I was up against their complaints, their immediate hatred of the wife, of the stranger whom I was proposing to force upon them. I gave way. What sort of a life would Geneviève have had here, between Madame d'Imbleval and Madame Vaurois? I had no right to victimize her. Jean-Louis, who had been gradually becoming excited, uttered these last words in a firm voice, as though he would have wished his conduct to be ascribed to conscientious motives and a sense of duty. In reality, as Renin and Hortense clearly saw, his was an unusually weak nature, incapable of reacting against a ridiculous position from which he had suffered ever since he was a child, and which he had come to look upon as final and irremediable. He endured it as a man bears a cross which he has no right to cast aside, and at the same time he was ashamed of it. He had never spoken of it to Geneviève from dread of ridicule, and afterwards, on returning to his prison, he had remained there out of habit and weakness. He sat down to a writing table and quickly wrote a letter which he handed to Renin. Would you be kind enough to give this note to Mademoiselle Aymar and beg her once more to forgive me? Renin did not move, and when the other pressed the letter upon him, he took it and tore it up. What does this mean? asked the young man. It means that I will not charge myself with any message. Why? Because you are coming with us. I? Yes, you will see Mademoiselle Aymar tomorrow and ask for her hand in marriage. Jean-Louis looked at Renin with a rather disdainful air, as though he were thinking, here is a man who has not understood a word of what I have been explaining to him. But Hortense went up to Renin. Why do you say that? Because it will be as I say. But you must have your reasons. One only, but it will be enough, provided this gentleman is so kind as to help me in my inquiries. Inquiries? With what object? asked the young man. With the object of proving that your story is not quite accurate. Jean-Louis took umbrage at this. I must ask you to believe, monsieur, that I have not said a word which is not the exact truth. I express myself badly, said Lenin, with great kindliness. Certainly you have not said a word that does not agree with what you believe to be the exact truth. But the truth is not, cannot be, what you believe it to be. The young man folded his arms. In any case, monsieur, it seems likely that I should know the truth better than you do. Why better? What happened on that tragic night can obviously be known to you only at second hand. You have no proofs. Neither have Madame d'Imbleval and Madame Vaurois. No proofs of what? exclaimed Jean-Louis, losing patience. No proofs of the confusion that took place. What? 
Why, it's an absolute certainty. The two children were laid in the same cradle, with no marks to distinguish one from the other, and the nurse was unable to tell. At least that's her version of it, interrupted Renin. What's that? Her version? But you're accusing the woman. I'm accusing her of nothing. Yes, you are. You're accusing her of lying. And why should she lie? She had no interest in doing so. And her tears and despair are so much evidence of her good faith. For after all, the two mothers were there. They saw the woman weeping. They questioned her. And then I repeat, what interest had she? Jean-Louis was greatly excited. Close beside him, Madame d'Imblaval and Madame Vaurois, who had no doubt been listening behind the doors, and who had stealthily entered the room, stood stammering in amazement. No, no, it's impossible. We've questioned her over and over again. Why should she tell a lie? Speak, monsieur, speak, Jean-Louis enjoined. Explain yourself. Give your reasons for trying to cast doubt upon an absolute truth. "'Because that truth is inadmissible,' declared Renin, raising his voice and growing excited in turn to the point of punctuating his remarks by thumping the table. "'No, things don't happen like that. No, fate does not display those refinements of cruelty, and chance is not added to chance with such reckless extravagance. It was already an unprecedented chance that—' on the very night on which the doctor, his manservant, and his maid were out of the house, the two ladies should be seized with labor pains at the same hour, and should bring two sons into the world at the same time. Don't let us add a still more exceptional event. Enough of the uncanny. Enough of lamps that go out and candles that refuse to burn. No, and again no. It is not admissible that a midwife should become confused in the essential details of her trade. However bewildered she may be by the unforeseen nature of the circumstances, a remnant of instinct is still on the alert, so that there is a place prepared for each child, and each is kept distinct from the other. The first child is here, the second is there. Even if they are lying side by side, one is on the left and the other on the right. Even if they are wrapped in the same kind of binders, some little detail differs, a trifle which is recorded by the memory, and which is inevitably recalled to the mind without any need of reflection. Confusion? I refuse to believe in it. Impossible to tell one from the other? It isn't true. In the world of fiction, yes. One can imagine all sorts of fantastic accidents, and heap contradiction on contradiction. But in the world of reality, at the very heart of reality, there is always a fixed point a solid nucleus about which the facts group themselves in accordance with a logical order. I therefore declare most positively that Nurse Boussignol could not have mixed up the two children. All this he said decisively, as though he had been present during the night in question, and so great was his power of persuasion that from the very first he shook the certainty of those who for more than a quarter of a century had never doubted. The two women and their son pressed round him and questioned him with breathless anxiety. Then you think that she may know? That she may be able to tell us? He corrected himself. I don't say yes and I don't say no. All I say is that there was something in her behavior during those hours that does not tally with her statements and with reality. All the vast and intolerable mystery that is weighed down upon you three arises not from a momentary lack of attention, but from something of which we do not know, but of which she does. That is what I maintain, and that is what happened. Jean-Louis said in a husky voice, She is a lie. She lives at Cahesh. We can send for her. Hortense at once proposed, would you like me to go for her? I will take the motor and bring her back with me. Where does she live? In the middle of the town, at a little draper's shop. The chauffeur will show you. Mademoiselle Boussignol, everybody knows her. And whatever you do, added Renin, don't warn her in any way. If she's uneasy, so much the better. But don't let her know what we want with her. Twenty minutes passed in absolute silence. Renin paced the room in which the fine old furniture, the handsome tapestries, the well-bound books and pretty knick-knacks, 
denoted a love of art and a seeking after style in Jean-Louis. This room was really his. In the adjoining apartments on either side, through the open doors, Renin was able to note the bad taste of the two mothers. He went up to Jean-Louis and, in a low voice, asked, Are they well off? Yes. And you? They settled the manor house upon me, with all the land around it, which makes me quite independent. Have they any relations? Sisters, both of them. With whom they could go to live? Yes, and they have sometimes thought of doing so, but there can't be any question of that. Once more, I assure you. Meantime, the car had returned. The two women jumped up hurriedly, ready to speak. Leave it to me, said Renin, and don't be surprised by anything that I say. It's not a matter of asking her questions, but of frightening her, of flurrying her. The sudden attack, he added between his teeth. The car drove round the lawn and drew up outside the windows. Alten sprang out and helped an old woman to alight, dressed in a fluted linen cap, a black velvet bodice, and a heavy gathered skirt. The old woman entered in a great state of alarm. She had a pointed face like a weasel's with a prominent mouth full of protruding teeth. "'What's the matter, Madame de Leval? she asked, timidly stepping into the room from which the doctor had once driven her. "'Good day to you, Madame Vaurois. The ladies did not reply. Renin came forward and said sternly, "'Mademoiselle Bousignol, I have been sent by the Paris police to throw light upon a tragedy which took place here twenty-seven years ago.' I have just secured evidence that you have distorted the truth, and that as a result of your false declarations, the birth certificate of one of the children born in the course of that night is inaccurate. Now, false declarations in matters of birth certificates are misdemeanors punishable by law. I shall therefore be obliged to take you to Paris to be interrogated, unless you are prepared here and now to confess everything that might repair the consequences of your offence. The old maid was shaking in every limb. Her teeth were chattering. She was evidently incapable of opposing the least resistance to Renin. "'Are you ready to confess everything?' he asked. <sighs> "'Yes,' she panted. "'Without delay, I have to catch a train. The business must be settled immediately. If you show the least hesitation, I take you with me. Have you made up your mind to speak?' Y "'Yes.' He pointed to Jean-Louis. Whose son is this gentleman? Madame de Laval's? No. Madame Vaurois, therefore? No. A stupefied silence welcomed the two replies. Explain yourself, Renin commanded, looking at his watch. Then Madame Boussignol fell on her knees and said, in so low and dull a voice that they had to bend over her in order to catch the sense of what she was mumbling. Someone came in the evening, a gentleman with a newborn baby wrapped in blankets, which he wanted the doctor to look after. As the doctor wasn't there, he waited all night, and it was he who did it all. Did what? asked Renin. What did he do? What happened? Well, what? happened was that it was not one child but the two of them that died madame de Laval's and madame vaurois too both in convulsions then the gentleman seeing this said this shows me where my duty lies i must seize this opportunity of making sure that my own boy shall be happy and well cared for put him in the place of one of the dead children he offered me a big sum of money saying that this one payment would save him the expense of providing for his child every month, and I accepted. Only I did not know in whose place to put him, and whether to say that the boy was Louis d'Amblaval or Jean Vaubois. The gentleman thought a moment and said, Neither. Then he explained to me what I was to do and what I was to say after he had gone. And while I was dressing his boy in vest and binders, the same as one of the dead children, he wrapped the other in the blankets he had brought with him and went out into the night. Mademoiselle Boussignol bent her head and wept. After a moment, Renin said, "'Your deposition agrees with the result of my investigations.' "'Can I go?' "'Yes.' "'And is it over, as far as I'm concerned? 
They won't be talking about this all over the district. No. Oh, just one more question. Do you know the man's name? No, he didn't tell me his name. Have you ever seen him since? Never. Have you anything more to say? No. Are you prepared to sign the written text of your confession? Yes. Very well. I shall send for you in a week or two. Till then, not a word to anybody. He saw her to the door and closed it after her. When he returned, Jean-Louis was between the two old ladies, and all three were holding hands. The bond of hatred and wretchedness which had bound them had suddenly snapped, and this rupture, without requiring them to reflect upon the matter, filled them with a gentle tranquillity of which they were hardly conscious, but which made them serious and thoughtful. Let's rush things, said Renin to Hortense. This is the decisive moment of the battle. We must get Jean-Louis on board. Hortense seemed preoccupied. She whispered, Why did you let the woman go? Were you satisfied with her statement? I don't need to be satisfied. She told us what happened. What more do you want? Nothing. I don't know. We'll talk about it later, my dear. For the moment, I repeat, we must get Jean-Louis on board, and immediately, otherwise. He turned to the young man. You agree with me, don't you, that things being as they are, it is best for you and Madame Vaurois and Madame d'Imblaval to separate for a time. That will enable you all to see matters more clearly, and to decide in perfect freedom what is to be done. Come with us, monsieur. The most pressing thing is to save Geneviève Aimard, your fiancée. Jean-Louis stood perplexed and undecided. Lenin turned to the two women. That is your opinion, too, I am sure, ladies. They nodded. You see, monsieur, he said to Jean-Louis, we are all agreed. In great crises there is nothing like separation. A few days' respite. Quickly now, monsieur. And without giving him time to hesitate, he drove him towards his bedroom to pack up. Half an hour later, Jean-Louis left the manor house with his new friends. And he won't go back until he's married, said Renin to Hortense, as they were waiting at Carèche station, to which the car had taken them while Jean-Louis was attending to his luggage. Everything's for the best. Are you satisfied? Yes, Geneviève will be glad, she replied absently. When they had taken their seats in the train, Lenin and she repaired to the dining car. Lenin, who had asked Hortense several questions, to which she had replied only in monosyllables, protested, What's the matter with you, my child? You look worried. I? Not at all. Yes, yes, I know you. Now, no secrets, no mysteries. She smiled. Well, since you insist on knowing if I am satisfied, I am bound to admit that, of course, I am, as regards my friend Geneviève, but that in another respect, from the point of view of the adventure, I have an uncomfortable sort of feeling. To speak frankly, I haven't staggered you this time. Not very much. I seem to you to have played a secondary part, for after all, what have I done? We arrived, we listened to Jean-Louis' tale of woe. I had a midwife fetched, and that was all. Exactly. I want to know if that was all, and I'm not quite sure. To tell you the truth, our other adventures left behind them an impression which was, how shall I put it, more definite, clearer. And this one strikes you as obscure? Obscure, yes, and incomplete. But in what way? I don't know. Perhaps it has something to do with that woman's confession. Yes, very likely that is it. It was all so unexpected and so short. <laughs> well, of course I cut it short, as you can readily imagine, said Renin, laughing. We didn't want too many explanations. What do you mean? Why, if she had given her explanations with too much detail, we should have ended by doubting what she was telling us. By doubting it? Well, hang it all. The story is a trifle far-fetched. That fellow arriving at night with a live baby in his pocket and going away with a dead one. The thing hardly holds water. But you see, my dear, I hadn't much time to coax the unfortunate woman in her part. Hortense stared at him in amazement. What on earth do you mean? 
Well, you know how dull-witted these country women are. And she and I had no time to spare. So we worked out a little scene in a hurry. And she really didn't act it so badly. It was all in the right key. Terror. Tremolo. Tears. Is it possible? murmured Hortense. Is it possible you had seen her beforehand? I had to, of course. But when? This morning when we arrived. While you were titivating yourself at the hotel at Caresh, I was running round to see what information I could pick up. As you may imagine, everybody in the district knows the Dame de val story. I was at once directed to the former midwife, Mademoiselle Boussignol. With Mademoiselle Boussignol it did not take long. Three minutes to settle a new version of what had happened, and ten thousand francs to induce her to repeat that, more or less credible, version to the people at the manor house. A quite incredible version. Not so bad as all that, my child, seeing that you believed it, and the others too. And that was the essential thing. What I had to do was to demolish at one blow a truth which had been twenty-seven years in existence, and which was all the more firmly established because it was founded on actual facts. That was why I went for it with all my might, and attacked it by sheer force of eloquence. Impossible to identify the children? I deny it. Inevitable confusion? It's not true. You're all three, I say, the victims of something which I don't know, but which it is your duty to clear up. That's easily done, says Jean-Louis whose conviction is at once shaken, let's send for Mademoiselle Boussignol. Right, let's send for her. Whereupon Mademoiselle Boussignol arrives, and mumbles out the little speech which I have taught her. Sensation, general stupefaction, of which I take advantage to carry off our young man. Hortense shook her head. But they'll get over it, all three of them, on thinking. Never, never. They will have their doubts, perhaps, but they will never consent to feel certain. They will never agree to think. Use your imagination. Here are three people whom I have rescued from the hell in which they have been floundering for a quarter of a century. Do you think they are going back to it? Here are three people who, from weakness or a false sense of duty, had not the courage to escape. Do you think that they won't cling like grim death to the liberty which I am giving them? Nonsense! Why, they would have swallowed a hoax twice as difficult to digest as that which Mademoiselle Boussignol dished up for them. After all, my version was no more absurd than the truth. On the contrary, and they swallowed it whole. Look at this. Before we left, I heard Madame de Blaval and Madame Vaurois speak of an immediate removal. They were already becoming quite affectionate at the thought of seeing the last of each other. But what about Jean-Louis? Jean-Louis? Why, he was fed up with his two mothers. By jingo, one can't do with two mothers in a lifetime. What a situation! And when one has the luck to be able to choose between having two mothers or none at all, why, bless me, one doesn't hesitate. And besides, Jean-Louis is in love with Geneviève. <laughs> he laughed. And he loves her well enough, I hope and trust, not to inflict two mothers-in-law upon her. Come, you may be easy in your mind. Your friend's happiness is assured, and that is all you ask for. All that matters is the object which we achieve, and not the more or less peculiar nature of the methods which we employ. And if some adventures are wound up and some mysteries elucidated by looking for and finding cigarette ends, or incendiary water bottles and blazing hat boxes as on our last expedition, Others call for psychology and for purely psychological solutions. I have spoken, and I charge you to be silent. Silent? Yes, there's a man and woman sitting behind us who seem to be saying something uncommonly interesting. But they're talking in whispers. Just so. When people talk in whispers, it's always about something shady. He lit a cigarette and sat back in his chair. Hortense listened, but in vain. As for him, he was emitting little slow puffs of smoke. Fifteen minutes later, the train stopped and the man and woman got out. Pity, said Renin, that I don't know their names or where they're going, but I know where to find them. My dear, we have a new adventure before us. 
Octans protested. Oh, no, please, not yet. Give me a little rest. And oughtn't we to think of Genevieve? He seemed greatly surprised. Why, all that's over and done with. Do you mean to say that you want to waste any more time over that old story? Well, I, for my part, confess that I've lost all interest in the man with the two mamas. And this was said in such a comical tone, and with such diverting sincerity, that Hortense was once more seized with a fit of giggling. Laughter alone was able to relax her exasperated nerves, and to distract her from so many contradictory emotions. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of The Eight Strokes of the Clock. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Eight Strokes of the Clock by Maurice Leblanc. Chapter 4 The Telltale Film. Do look at the man who's playing the butler, said Serge Renin. What is there peculiar about him? asked Hortense. They were sitting in the balcony at a picture palace to which Hortense had asked to be taken so that she might see on the screen the daughter of a lady, now dead, who used to give her piano lessons. Rose André, a lovely girl with lissom movements and a smiling face, was that evening figuring in a new film, The Happy Princess, which she lit up with her high spirits and her warm, glowing beauty. Renin made no direct reply, but during a pause in the performance continued, I sometimes console myself for an indifferent film by watching the subordinate characters. It seems to me that those poor devils, who are made to rehearse certain scenes ten or twenty times over, must often be thinking of other things than their parts at the time of the final exposure, and it's great fun noting those little moments of distraction which reveal something of their temperament, of their instinct self, as, for instance, in the case of that butler. Look! The screen now showed a luxuriously served table. The happy princess sat at the head, surrounded by all her suitors. Half a dozen footmen moved about the room under the orders of the butler, a big fellow with a dull, coarse face, a common appearance, and a pair of enormous eyebrows which met across his forehead in a single line. "'He looks a brute,' said Hortense. "'But what do you see in him that's peculiar?' Just note how he gazes at the princess, and tell me if he doesn't stare at her oftener than he ought to. I really haven't noticed anything so far, said Hortense. Why, of course he does, Serge Renin declared. It is quite obvious that in actual life he entertains for Rose André personal feelings which are quite out of place in a nameless servant. It is possible that in real life no one has any idea of such a thing. But on the screen, when he is not watching himself, or when he thinks that the actors at rehearsal cannot see him, his secret escapes him. Look. The man was standing still. It was the end of dinner. The princess was drinking a glass of champagne, and he was gloating over her, with his glittering eyes half hidden behind their heavy lids. Twice again they surprised in his face those strange expressions to which Renin ascribed an emotional meaning which Hortense refused to see. It's just his way of looking at people, she said. The first part of the film ended. There were two parts, divided by an entracte. The notice on the program stated that a year had elapsed and that the happy princess was living in a pretty Norman cottage, all hung with creepers, together with her husband, a poor musician. The princess was still happy, as was evident on the screen, still as attractive as ever, and still besieged by the greatest variety of suitors. Nobles and commoners, peasants and financiers, men of all kinds, fell swooning at her feet, and prominent among them was a sort of boorish solitary, a shaggy, half-wild woodcutter, whom she met whenever she went out for a walk. Armed with his axe, a formidable crafty being, he prowled around the cottage, and the spectators felt with a sense of dismay that a peril was hanging over the happy princess's head. "'Look at that,' whispered Renin. "'Do you realize who the man of the woods is?' "'No.' "'Simply the butler. The same actor is doubling the two parts.' In fact, notwithstanding the new figure which he cut, 
The butler's movements and postures were apparent under the heavy gait and rounded shoulders of the woodcutter, even as under the unkempt beard and long thick hair the once clean-shaven face was visible with the cruel expression and the bushy line of the eyebrows. The princess in the background was seen to emerge from the thatched cottage. The man hid himself behind a clump of trees. From time to time the screen displayed, on an enormously enlarged scale, his fiercely rolling eyes or his murderous hands with their huge thumbs. "'The man frightens me,' said Hortense. "'He is really terrifying.' "'Because he's acting on his own account,' said Renin. "'You must understand that, in the space of three or four months that appears to separate the dates at which the two films were made, his passion has made progress.' and to him it is not the princess who is coming, but Rose André. The man crouched low. The victim approached, gaily and unsuspectingly. She passed, heard a sound, stopped and looked about her with a smiling air, which became attentive, then uneasy, and then more and more anxious. The woodcutter had pushed aside the branches and was coming through the copse. They were now standing face to face. He opened his arms as though to seize her. She tried to scream, to call out for help, but the arms closed around her before she could offer the slightest resistance. Then he threw her over his shoulder and began to run. "'Are you satisfied?' whispered Renin. "'Do you think that this fourth-rate actor would have had all that strength and energy if it had been any other woman than Rose André? Meanwhile, the woodcutter was crossing the skirt of a forest and plunging through great trees and masses of rocks. After setting the princess down, he cleared the entrance to a cave, which the daylight entered by a slanting crevice. A succession of views displayed the husband's despair, the search and the discovery of some small branches which had been broken by the princess and which showed the path that had been taken. Then came the final scene, with the terrible struggle between the man and the woman, when the woman, vanquished and exhausted, is flung to the ground, the sudden arrival of the husband, and the shot that puts an end to the brute's life. Well, said Renin, when they had left the picture palace, and he spoke with a certain gravity, I maintain that the daughter of your old piano teacher has been in danger ever since the day when that last scene was filmed. I maintain that this scene represents not so much an assault by the man of the woods on the happy princess as a violent and frantic attack by an actor on the woman he desires. Certainly it all happened within the bounds prescribed by the part, and nobody saw anything in it, nobody except perhaps Rose André herself. But I, for my part, have detected flashes of passion which leave not a doubt in my mind. I have seen glances that betrayed the wish and even the intention to commit murder. I have seen clenched hands ready to strangle, in short, a score of details which proved to me that, at that time, the man's instinct was urging him to kill the woman who could never be his. And it all amounts to what? We must protect Rose André if she is still in danger, and if it is not too late. And to do this? We must get hold of further information. From whom? From the World Cinema Company, which made the film. I will go to them tomorrow morning. Will you wait for me in your flat about lunchtime? At heart, Hortense was still skeptical. All these manifestations of passion, of which she denied neither the ardor nor the ferocity, seemed to her to be the rational behavior of a good actor. She had seen nothing of the terrible tragedy which Renin contended that he had divined and she wondered whether he was not erring through an excess of imagination. Well, she asked next day, not without a touch of irony, how far have you got? Have you made a good bag? Anything mysterious? Anything thrilling? Pretty good. Oh, really? And your so-called lover? Is one Dalbrecq, originally a scene painter, who played the butler in the first part of the film, and the man of the woods in the second, and was so much appreciated that they engaged him for a new film. Consequently, he has been acting lately. He was acting near Paris, but on the morning of Friday the 18th of September he broke into the garage of the World Cinema Company and made off with a magnificent car and 40,000 francs in money. Information was lodged with the police, and on the Sunday the car was found a little way outside Dreux. 
and up to now the inquiry has revealed two things which will appear in the papers tomorrow. First, Stalbrecht is alleged to have committed a murder which created a great stir last year, the murder of Bourguet, the jeweler. Secondly, on the day after his two robberies, Dalbrec was driving through Le Havre in a motor-car with two men who helped him to carry off, in broad daylight and in a crowded street, a lady whose identity has not yet been discovered. Rose André? asked Hortense uneasily. I have just been to Rose André's. The World Cinema Company gave me her address. Rose André spent this summer travelling and then stayed for a fortnight in the Seine Inferieure, where she has a small place of her own the actual cottage in the happy princess on receiving an invitation from america to do a film there she came back to paris registered her luggage at the gare saint lazare and left on friday the eighteenth of september intending to sleep at le havre and take saturday's boat friday the eighteenth muttered hortense the same day on which that man and it was on the Saturday that a woman was carried off by him at Le Havre. I looked in at the Compagnie Transatlantique, and a brief investigation showed that Rose André had booked a cabin, but that the cabin remained unoccupied. The passenger did not turn up. This is frightful. She has been carried off. You were right. I fear so. What have you decided to do? Adolphe, my chauffeur is outside with the car. Let us go to Lavre. Up to the present, Rose André's disappearance does not seem to have become known. Before it does, and before the police identify the woman carried off by Dalbrecht with the woman who did not turn up to claim her cabin, we will get on Rose André's track. There was not much said on the journey. At four o'clock, Hortense and Renin reached Rouen, but here Renin changed his road. Adolphe, take the left bank of the Seine. He unfolded a motoring map on his knees, and, tracing the route with his finger, showed Hortense that if you draw a line from La Havre, or rather from Quilbeuf, where the road crosses the Seine, to Dreux, where the stolen car was found, this line passes through Routot, a market town lying west of the forest of Bretagne. Now it was in the forest of Bretagne, he continued, according to what I heard, that the second part of the happy princess was filmed and the question that arises is this. Having got hold of Rose André, would it not occur to Dalbrec, when passing near the forest on the Saturday night, to hide his prey there, while his two accomplices went on to Dreux, and from there returned to Paris? The quay was quite near. Was he not bound to go to it? How should he do otherwise? Wasn't it while running to this cave a few months ago that he held in his arms against his breast within the reach of his lips, the woman whom he loved and whom he has now conquered. By every rule of fate and logic, the adventure is being repeated all over again. But this time, in reality, Rose André is a captive. There is no hope of rescue. The forest is vast and lonely. That night, or on one of the following nights, Rose André must surrender or die. Hortense gave a shudder. We shall be too late. Besides, you don't suppose that he's keeping her a prisoner? Certainly not. The place I have in mind is at a crossroads, and is not a safe retreat. But we may discover some clue or other. The shades of night were falling from the tall trees when they entered the ancient forest of Bretagne, full of Roman remains and medieval relics. Renin knew the forest well, and remembered that near a famous oak, known as the wine cask, there was a cave which must be the cave of the happy princess. He found it easily, switched on his electric torch, rummaged in the dark corners, and brought Hortense back to the entrance. "'There's nothing inside,' he said. "'But here is the evidence which I was looking for. Dalbrecht was obsessed by the recollection of the film, but so was Rose André. The happy princess had broken off the tips of the branches on the way through the forest.' Rose André has managed to break off some to the right of this opening, in the hope that she would be discovered as on the first occasion. Yes, said Hortense, it's a proof that she has been here, but the proof is three weeks old. Since that time, since that time she is either dead and buried under a heap of leaves, or else alive in some hole even lonelier than this. 
If so, where is he? Renan pricked up his ears. Repeated blows of the axe were sounding from some distance, no doubt coming from a part of the forest that was being cleared. He? said Renan. I wonder whether he may not have continued to behave under the influence of the film, and whether the man of the woods and the happy princess has not quite naturally resumed his calling. For how is the man to live, to obtain his food, without attracting attention? He will have found a job. We can't make sure of that. We might, by questioning the woodcutters whom we can hear. The car took them by a forest road to another crossroads, where they entered on foot a track which was deeply rutted by wagon wheels. The sound of axes ceased. After walking for a quarter of an hour, they met a dozen men who, having finished work for the day, were returning to the villages nearby. "'Will this path take us to Routot?' asked Rinian, in order to open a conversation with them. "'No, you're turning your backs on it,' said one of the men gruffly and he went on, accompanied by his mates. Hortense and Renin stood rooted to the spot. They had recognized the butler. His cheeks and chin were shaved, but his upper lip was covered by a black moustache, evidently dyed. The eyebrows no longer met and were reduced to normal dimensions. Thus, in less than twenty hours, acting on the vague hints supplied by the bearing of a film actor, Serge Renin had touched the very heart of the tragedy by means of purely psychological arguments. Rose André is alive, he said. Otherwise, Dalbrec would have left the country. The poor thing must be imprisoned and bound up, and he takes her some food at night. We will save her, won't we? Certainly, by keeping a watch on him, and if necessary, but in the last resort, compelling him by force to give up his secret. They followed the woodcutter at a distance, and on the pretext that the car needed overhauling, engaged rooms in the principal inn at Routot. Attached to the inn was a small café from which they were separated by the entrance to the yard, and above which were two rooms, reached by a wooden outer staircase at one side. Dalbrec occupied one of these rooms, and Renin took the other for his chauffeur. Next morning he learned from Adolphe that Dalbrec, on the previous evening, after all the lights were out, had carried down a bicycle from his room and mounted it and had not returned until shortly before sunrise. The bicycle tracks led Renin to the uninhabited Chateau des Landes, five miles from the village. They disappeared in a rocky path which ran beside the park down to the Seine opposite the Jumiège Peninsula. Next night he took up his position there. At eleven o'clock, Dalbrec climbed a bank, scrambled over a wire fence, hid his bicycle under the branches, and moved away. It seemed impossible to follow him in the pitchy darkness, on a mossy soil that muffled the sound of footsteps. Renin did not make the attempt, but at daybreak he came with his chauffeur and hunted through the park all the morning. Though the park, which covered the side of a hill and was bounded below by the river, was not very large, he found no clue which gave him any reason to suppose that Rose André was imprisoned there. He therefore went back to the village with the firm intention of taking action that evening and employing force. "'This state of things cannot go on,' he said to Hortense. "'I must rescue Rose André at all costs and save her from that ruffian's clutches. You must be made to speak.' He must, otherwise there's a danger that we may be too late. That day was Sunday, and Dalbrecht did not go to work. He did not leave his room except for lunch, and went upstairs again immediately afterwards. But at three o'clock, Renin and Hortense, who were keeping a watch on him from the inn, saw him come down the wooden staircase with his bicycle on his shoulder. Leaning it against the bottom step, he inflated the tires and fastened to the handlebar a rather bulky object wrapped in a newspaper. "'By Jove!' muttered Renin. "'What's the matter?' In front of the café was a small terrace bordered on the right and left by spindle trees planted in boxes, which were connected by a paling. Behind the shrubs, sitting on a bank but stooping forward so that they could see Dalbrecht through the branches, were four men. "'Police!' said Renin. Oh, "'What bad luck!' If those fellows take a hand, they will spoil everything. Why, on the contrary, I should have thought, yes, they will. They will put Dalbrec out of the way, and then, and then, 
Will that give us Rose André? Dalbrec had finished his preparations. Just as he was mounting his bicycle, the detectives rose in a body, ready to make a dash for him. But Dalbrec, though quite unconscious of their presence, changed his mind and went back to his room as though he had forgotten something. Now's the time, said Renin. I'm going to risk it. But it's a difficult situation, and I've no great hopes. He went out into the yard, and at a moment when the detectives were not looking, ran up the staircase, as was only natural if he wished to give an order to his chauffeur. But he had no sooner reached the rustic balcony at the back of the house, which gave admission to the two bedrooms, than he stopped. Dalbrecht's door was open. Renin walked in. Dalbrecht stepped back, at once assuming the defensive. "'What do you want? Who said you could—' "'Silence!' whispered Renin with an imperious gesture. "'It's all up with you.' "'What are you talking about?' growled the man angrily. "'Lean out of your window. There are four men below on the watch for you to leave. Four detectives.' Dalbrecht leaned over the terrace and muttered an oath. "'On the watch for me,' he said, turning round. "'What do I care? They have a warrant.' He folded his arms. "'Shut up with your piffle! A warrant! What's that to me?' "'Listen,' said Renin, "'and let us waste no time. It's urgent. Your name's Dalbrecht, or at least that's the name under which you acted in The Happy Princess, and under which the police are looking for you as being the murderer of Bourguet the jeweller, the man who stole a motor-car and forty thousand francs from the World Cinema Company, and the man who abducted a woman at Le Havre. All this is known and proved.' And here's the upshot. Four men downstairs, myself here, my chauffeur in the next room. You're done for. Do you want me to save you? Dalbrecht gave his adversary a long look. Who are you? A friend of Rose André's, said Renin. The other started, and to some extent, dropping his mask, retorted, What are your conditions? Rose André, whom you have abducted and tormented, is dying in some hole or corner. Where is she? A strange thing occurred, and impressed Renin. Dalbrecht's face, usually so common, was lit up by a smile that made it almost attractive. But this was only a flashing vision. The man immediately resumed his hard and impassive expression. And suppose I refuse to speak, he said. So much the worse for you. It means your arrest. I dare say, but it means the death of Rose André. Who will release her? You. You will speak now, or in an hour, or two hours hence, at least. You will never have the heart to keep silent and let her die. Dalbrecht shrugged his shoulders. Then, raising his hand, he said, I swear on my life that if they arrest me, not a word will leave my lips. What, then? Then save me. We will meet this evening at the entrance to the Parc des Landes and say what we have to say. Why not at once? I have spoken. Will you be there? I shall be there. Renin reflected. There was something in all this that he failed to grasp. In any case, the frightful danger that threatened Rose André dominated the whole situation, and Renin was not the man to despise this threat and to persist out of vanity in a perilous course. Rose André's life came before everything. He struck several blows on the wall of the next bedroom and called his chauffeur. Adolphe, is the car ready? Yes, sir. Set her going and pull her up in front of the terrace outside the café, right against the boxes so as to block the exit. As for you, he continued, addressing Dalbrecht, you're to jump on your machine, and instead of making off along the road, cross the yard. At the end of the yard is a passage leading into a lane. There you will be free. But no hesitation and no blundering, else you'll get yourself nabbed. Good luck to you. He waited till the car was drawn up, in accordance with his instructions, and when he reached it, he began to question his chauffeur in order to attract the detective's attention. One of them, however, having cast a glance through the spindle trees, caught sight of Dalbrecht just as he reached the bottom of the staircase. He gave the alarm and darted forward, followed by his comrades, but had to run round the car and bumped into the chauffeur, which gave Dalbrecht time to mount his bicycle and cross the yard unimpeded. He thus had some second start. Unfortunately for him, as he was about to enter the passage at the back, 
a troop of boys and girls appeared, returning from Vespers. On hearing the shouts of the detectives, they spread their arms in front of the fugitive, who gave two or three lurches and ended by falling. Cries of triumph were raised. "'Lay hold of him! Stop him!' roared the detectives as they rushed forward. Lenin, seeing that the game was up, ran after the others and called out, "'Stop him!' He came up with them just as Dalbrecht, after regaining his feet, knocked one of the policemen down and leveled his revolver. Renin snatched it out of his hands, but the two other detectives, startled, had also produced their weapons. They fired. Dalbrecht, hit in the leg and the chest, pitched forward and fell. "'Thank you, sir,' said the inspector to Renin, introducing himself. "'We owe a lot to you.' "'It seems to me that you've done for the fellow,' said Renin. Who is he? One Dalbrecht, a scoundrel for whom we were looking. Lenin was beside himself. Hortense had joined him by this time, and he growled, The silly fools! Now they've killed him! Oh, it isn't possible! We shall see, but whether he's dead or alive, it's death to Rose André. How are we to trace her, and what chance have we of finding the place? some inaccessible retreat, where the poor thing is dying of misery and starvation. The detectives and peasants had moved away, bearing Dalbrecht with them on an improvised stretcher. Renin, who had at first followed them, in order to find out what was going to happen, changed his mind, and was now standing with his eyes fixed on the ground. The fall of the bicycle had unfastened the parcel, which Dalbrecht had tied to the handlebar, and the newspaper had burst, revealing its contents a tin saucepan, rusty, dented, battered, and useless. "'What's the meaning of this?' he muttered. "'What was the idea?' He picked it up and examined it. Then he gave a grin and a click of the tongue, and chuckled slowly. <laughs> "'Don't move an eyelash, my dear. Let all these people clear off. All this is no business of ours, is it? The troubles of police don't concern us. We are two motorists traveling for our pleasure and collecting old saucepans if we feel so inclined. He called his chauffeur. Adolphe, take us to the Parc des Landes by a roundabout road. Half an hour later they reached the sunken track and began to scramble down it on foot beside the wooded slopes. The Seine, which was very low at this time of day, was lapping against a little jetty near which lay a worm-eaten, moldering boat full of puddles of water. Renin stepped into the boat and at once began to bail out the puddles with his saucepan. He then drew the boat alongside of the jetty, helped Hortense in, and used the one oar which he shipped in a gap in the stern to work her into midstream. <laughs> I believe I'm there, he said with a laugh. The worst that can happen to us is to get our feet wet, for our craft leaks a trifle. But haven't we a saucepan? Oh, blessings on that useful utensil! Almost as soon as I set eyes upon it, I remembered that people used those articles to bail out the bottoms of leaky boats. Why, there was bound to be a boat in the Lond Woods. How was it I never thought of that? But of course Dalbrecht made use of her to cross the Seine, and as she made water, he brought a saucepan. Then Rose André, asked Hortense, is a prisoner on the other bank, on the Jumiège Peninsula. You see the famous abbey from here. They ran aground on a beach of big pebbles covered with slime. And it can't be very far away, he added. Dalbrecht did not spend the whole night running about. A towpath followed the deserted bank. Another path led away from it. They chose the second, and passing between orchards enclosed by hedges, came to a landscape that seemed strangely familiar to them. Where had they seen that pool before, with the willows overhanging it? And where had they seen that abandoned hovel? Suddenly both of them stopped with one accord. Oh, said Hortense, I can hardly believe my eyes. Opposite them was the white gate of a large orchard, at the back of which, among groups of old gnarled apple trees, appeared a cottage with blue shutters, the cottage of the happy princess. Of course, cried Renin. And I ought to have known it, considering that the film showed both this cottage and the forest close by. And isn't everything happening exactly as in The Happy Princess? Isn't Dalbrecht dominated by the memory of it? 
the house, which is certainly the one in which Rose André spent the summer, was empty. He has shut her up there. But the house, you told me, was in the Seine Inferieure. Well, so are we. To the left of the river, the Arles and the forest of Bretagne. To the right, the Seine Inferieure. But between them is the obstacle of the river, which is why I didn't connect the two. A hundred and fifty yards of water form a more effective division than dozens of miles. The gate was locked. They got through the hedge a little lower down, and walked towards the house, which was screened on one side by an old wall, shaggy with ivy and roofed with thatch. It seemed as if there was somebody there, said Hortense. Didn't I hear the sound of a window? Listen. Someone struck a few chords on a piano. Then a voice arose, a woman's voice, softly and solemnly singing a ballad that thrilled with restrained passion. The woman's whole soul seemed to breathe itself into the melodious notes. They walked on. The wall concealed them from view, but they saw a sitting-room furnished with bright wallpaper and a blue Roman carpet. The throbbing voice ceased. The piano ended with a last chord, and the singer rose and appeared framed in the window. Rosandrie, whispered Hortense. Well, said Renin, admitting his astonishment, this is the last thing that I expected. Rosandrie, Rosandrie at liberty, and singing Massenet in the sitting-room of her cottage. What does it all mean? Do you understand? Yes, but it has taken me long enough. But how could we have guessed? Although they had never seen her except on the screen, they had not the least doubt that this was she. It was really Rose André, or rather the happy princess whom they had admired a few days before, amidst the furniture of that very sitting-room or on the threshold of that very cottage. She was wearing the same dress, her hair was done in the same way, she had on the same bangles and necklaces as in the happy princess, and her lovely face, with its rosy cheeks and laughing eyes, bore the same look of joy and serenity. Some sound must have caught her ear, for she leaned over towards a clump of shrubs beside the cottage and whispered into the silent garden, Charles, Charles, is that you, my darling? Receiving no reply, she drew herself up and stood smiling at the happy thoughts that seemed to flood her being. But a door opened at the back of the room, and an old peasant woman entered with a tray laden with bread, butter, and milk. Here, Rose, my pretty one, I brought you your supper, milk fresh from the cow. And putting down the tray, she continued, Aren't you afraid, Rose, of the chill of the night air? Perhaps you're expecting your sweetheart. I haven't a sweetheart, my dear old Catherine. <laughs> what next? said the old woman, laughing. Only this morning there were footprints under the window that didn't look at all proper. A burglar's footprints, perhaps, Catherine. Well, I don't say they weren't, Rose, dear, especially as in your calling you have a lot of people round you whom it's well to be careful of. For instance, your friend Dalbrec, eh? Nice goings on his are. You saw the paper yesterday. A fellow who has robbed and murdered people and carried off a woman at La Havre. Hortense and Renin would have much liked to know what Rose André thought of the revelations, but she had turned her back to them and was sitting at her supper, and the window was now closed so that they could neither hear her reply nor see the expression of her features. They waited for a moment. Hortense was listening with an anxious face, but Renin began to laugh. <laughs> oh, very funny, <laughs> really funny. And such an unexpected ending. <laughs> and we who were hunting for her in some cave or damp cellar. A horrible tomb where the poor thing was dying of hunger. It's a fact she knew the terrors of that first night of captivity. And I maintain that on the first night she was flung, half dead, into the cave. Only there you are. The next morning she was alive. One night was enough to tame the little rogue and to make Dalbrec as handsome as Prince Charming in her eyes. For see the difference? On the films or in novels, the happy princesses resist or commit suicide. But in real life... Oh, woman! Woman! Yes, said Hortense, but the man she loves is almost certainly dead. And a good thing, too. It would be the best solution. 
What would be the outcome of this criminal love for a thief and murderer? A few minutes passed. Then, amid the peaceful silence of the waning day, mingled with the first shadows of the twilight, they again heard the grating of the window, which was cautiously opened. Rose André leaned over the garden and waited, with her eyes turned to the wall, as though she saw something there. Presently, Renin shook the ivy branches. Ah, oh, she said, this time I know you're there. Yes, the ivy's moving. Georges, Georges, darling, why do you keep me waiting? Catherine has gone. I am all alone. She had knelt down and was distractedly stretching out her shapely arms, covered with bangles which clashed with a metallic sound. Georges, Georges! Her every movement, the thrill of her voice, her whole being expressed desire and love. Hortense, deeply touched, could not help saying, How oh, the poor thing loves him, if she but knew. Ah! Oh, cried the girl, you've spoken, you're there, and you want me to come to you, don't you? Here I am, Georges. She climbed over the window ledge and began to run, while Renin went round the wall and advanced to meet her. She stopped short in front of him and stood choking at the sight of this man and woman whom she did not know and who were stepping out of the very shadow from which her beloved appeared to her each night. Renin bowed, gave his name, and introduced his companion. Madame Hortense Daniel, a pupil and friend of your mother's. Still motionless with stupefaction, her features drawn, she stammered, y y You know who, who I am? And you were there just now? Y you heard what I was saying. Renin, without hesitating or pausing in his speech, said, You are Rose André, the happy princess. We saw you on the films the other evening, and circumstances led us to set out in search of you, to Le Havre, where you were abducted on the day when you were to have left for America, and to the forest of Bretagne, where you were imprisoned. She protested eagerly with a forced laugh. <laughs> what? Is all this? I have not been to love. I came straight here. Abducted? Imprisoned? What, what nonsense! Yes, imprisoned, in the same cave as the happy princess, and you broke off some branches to the right of the cave. But how absurd! Who would have abducted me? I have no enemy. There is a man in love with you, the one whom you were expecting just now. Yes, my lover, she said proudly. Have I not the right to receive whom I like? You have the right. You are a free agent. But the man who comes to see you every night is wanted by the police. His name is Georges d'Albrec. He killed Bourguet, the jeweler. The accusation made her start with indignation, and she exclaimed, It's a lie, an infamous fabrication of the newspapers. Georges was in Paris on the night of the murder. He can prove it. He stole a motor-car and forty thousand francs in notes. She retorted vehemently. The motor-car was taken back by his friends, and the notes will be restored. He never touched them. My leaving for America had made him lose his head. Very well. I am quite willing to believe everything that you say. But the police may show less faith in these statements and less indulgence. She became suddenly uneasy and faltered. The police... There's nothing to fear from them. They won't know. Where to find him? I succeeded, at all events. He's working as a woodcutter in the forest of Bretagne. Yes, but you... That was an accident. Where is the police? The words left her lips with the greatest difficulty. Her voice was trembling, and suddenly she rushed at Renin, stammering, he is uh, arrested? I am sure of it, and you have come to tell me. Arrested, wounded, dead perhaps? Oh, please, please. She had no strength left. All her pride, all the certainty of her great love gave way to an immense despair, and she sobbed out. No, he's not dead, is he? No, I feel that he's not dead. Oh, sir, how unjust it all is. He's the gentlest man, the best that ever lived. He has changed my whole life. 
Everything is different since I began to love him. And I love him so. I love him. I want to go to him. Take me to him. I want them to arrest me, too. I love him. I could not live without him. An impulse of sympathy made Hortense put her arms around the girl's neck and say warmly, Yes, come. He is not dead, I am sure, only wounded, and Prince Renin will save him. You will, won't you, Renin? Come, make up a story for your servant. Say that you're going somewhere by train, and that she is not to tell anybody. Be quick, put on a wrap. We will save him, I swear we will. Rosandre went indoors and returned almost at once, disguised beyond recognition in a long cloak and a veil that shrouded her face, and they all took the road back to Houteau. At the inn, Rosandre passed as a friend whom they had been to fetch in the neighborhood and were taking to Paris with them. Renin ran out to make inquiries and came back to the two women. It's all right. Dalbrec is alive. They have put him to bed in a private room at the mayor's offices. He has a broken leg and a rather high temperature, but all the same they expect to move him to Rouen tomorrow, and they have telephoned there for a motor car. And then? asked Rosandre anxiously. Renin smiled. Why, then we shall leave at daybreak. We shall take up our positions in a sunken road, rifle in hand, attack the motor coach, and carry off Georges. Oh, don't laugh, she said plaintively. I'm so unhappy. But the adventure seemed to amuse Renin, and when he was alone with Hortense, he exclaimed, You see what comes of preferring dishonor to death. But hang it all, who could have expected this? It isn't a bit the way in which things happen in the pictures. Once the man of the woods had carried off his victim, and considering that for three weeks there was no one to defend her, how could we imagine, we who had been proceeding all along under the influence of the pictures, that in the space of a few hours the victim would become a princess in love? Confound that Georges! I now understand the sly, humorous look which I surprised on his mobile features. He remembered Georges did, and he didn't care a hang for me. Oh, he tricked me nicely. And you, my dear, he tricked you, too. And it was all the influence of the film. They show us at the cinema a brute beast, a sort of long-haired, ape-faced savage. What can a man like that be in real life? A brute, inevitably, don't you agree? Well, he's nothing of the kind. He's a Don Juan. The humbug. You will save him, won't you? said Hortense, in a beseeching tone. Are you very anxious that I should? Very. In that case, promise to give me your hand to kiss. You can have both hands, Renin, and gladly. The night was uneventful. Renin had given orders for the two ladies to be waked at an early hour. When they came down, the motor was leaving the yard and pulling up in front of the inn. It was raining, and Adolphe, the chauffeur, had fixed up the long, low hood and packed the luggage inside. Renin called for his bill. They all three took a cup of coffee. But just as they were leaving the room, one of the inspector's men came rushing in. "'Have you seen him?' he asked. "'Isn't he here?' The inspector himself arrived at a run, greatly excited. "'The prisoner has escaped. He ran back through the inn. He can't be far away.' A dozen rustics appeared like a whirlwind. They ransacked the lofts, the stables, the sheds. They scattered over the neighborhood, but the search led to no discovery. Oh, hang it all, said Renin, who had taken his part in the hunt. How can it have happened? How do I know? spluttered the inspector in despair. I left my three men watching in the next room. I found them this morning fast asleep, stupefied by some narcotic which had been mixed with their wine and that Albrecht bird had flown. Which way? Through the window. They were evidently accomplices with ropes and a ladder, and as Albrecht had a broken leg, they carried him off on the stretcher itself. They left no traces? No traces of footsteps, true. The rain has messed everything up, but they went through the yard because the stretcher's there. You'll find him, Mr. Inspector. There's no doubt of that. In any case, you may be sure that you won't have any trouble over the affair. I shall be in Paris this evening, and shall go straight to the prefecture, where I have influential friends. Renin went back to the two women in the coffee room, and Hortense at once said, It was you who carried him off, wasn't it? Please put Rosandre's mind at rest. She is so terrified. 
He gave Rose André his arm and led her to the car. She was staggering and very pale, and she said in a faint voice, Are we going? And he, is he safe? Won't they catch him again? Looking deep into her eyes, he said, Swear to me, Rose André, that in two months, when he is well and when I have proved his innocence, swear that you will go away with him to America. I swear. And that once there you will marry him. I swear. He spoke a few words in her ear. Ah, oh, she said, may heaven bless you for it. Hortense took her seat in front with Renin, who sat at the wheel. The inspector, hat in hand, fussed around the car until it moved off. They drove through the forest, crossed the Seine at La Maire, and struck into the Havre Rouen road. Take off your glove and give me your hand to kiss, Renin ordered. You promised that you would. Oh, said Hortense, but it was to be when Dalbrec was saved. He is saved. Not yet. The police are after him. They may catch him again. He will not be really saved until he is with Rose André. He is with Rose André, he declared. What do you mean? Turn round. She did so. In the shadow of the hood, right at the back, behind the chauffeur, Rose André was kneeling beside a man lying on the seat. Oh, stammered Hortense. <laughs> it's incredible. Then it was you who hit him last night, and he was there in front of the inn when the inspector was seeing us off. Lord, yes, he was there under the cushions and rugs. It's incredible, she repeated, utterly bewildered. It's incredible. How were you able to manage it all? I wanted to kiss your hand, he said. She removed her glove as he bade her and raised her hand to his lips. The car was speeding between the peaceful Seine and the white cliffs that border it. They sat silent for a long while. Then he said, I had a talk with Dalbrecht last night. He's a fine fellow and is ready to do anything for Rose André. He's right. A man must do anything for the woman he loves. He must devote himself to her, offer her all that is beautiful in this world, joy and happiness and if she should be bored, stirring adventures to distract her, to excite her and to make her smile, or even weep. Hortense shivered, and her eyes were not quite free from tears. For the first time he was alluding to the sentimental adventure that bound them by a tie which as yet was frail, but which became stronger and more enduring with each of the adventures on which they entered together, pursuing them feverishly and anxiously to their close. Already she felt powerless and uneasy with his extraordinary man, who subjected events to his will and seemed to play with the destinies of those whom he fought or protected. He filled her with dread, and at the same time he attracted her. She thought of him sometimes as her master, sometimes as an enemy against whom she must defend herself, but oftenest as a perturbing friend, full of charm and fascination. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of The Eight Strokes of the Clock This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Eight Strokes of the Clock by Maurice Leblanc Chapter 5 Thérèse and Germaine The weather was so mild that autumn that on the 12th of October in the morning several families still lingering in their villas at Etretat had gone down to the beach. The sea, lying between the cliffs and the clouds on the horizon, might have suggested a mountain lake slumbering in the hollow of the enclosing rocks were it not for that crispness in the air and those pale, soft, and indefinite colors in the sky which give a special charm to certain days in Normandy. "'It's delicious,' murmured Hortense. But the next moment she added, "'All the same, we did not come here to enjoy the spectacle of nature, or to wonder whether that huge stone needle on our left was really at one time the home of Arsène Lupin. We came here, said Prince Renin, because of the conversation which I overheard a fortnight ago in a dining car between a man and a woman. A conversation of which I was unable to catch a single word. If those two people could have guessed for an instant that it was possible to hear a single word of what they were saying, 
they would not have spoken, for their conversation was one of extraordinary gravity and importance. But I have very sharp ears, and though I could not follow every sentence, I insist that we may be certain of two things. First, that man and woman, who are brother and sister, have an appointment at a quarter to twelve this morning, the twelfth of October, at the spot known as the Trois Mathildes, with a third person, who is married and who wishes at all costs to recover his or her liberty. Secondly, this appointment, at which they will come to a final agreement, is to be followed this evening by a walk along the cliffs, when the third person will bring with him or her the man or woman, I can't definitely say which, whom they want to get rid of. That is the gist of the whole thing. Now, as I know a spot called the trois Mathilde some way above Etretat, and as this is not an everyday name, we came down yesterday to thwart the plan of these objectionable persons. "'What plan?' asked Hortense. "'For, after all, it's only your assumption that there's to be a victim, and that the victim is to be flung off the top of the cliffs. You yourself told me that you heard no allusion to a possible murder.' "'That is so. But I heard some very plain words relating to the marriage of the brother or the sister, with the wife or the husband of the third person, which implies the need for a crime.' They were sitting on the terrace of the casino, facing the stairs which run down to the beach. They therefore overlooked the few privately owned cabins on the shingle, where a party of four men were playing bridge, while a group of ladies sat talking and knitting. A short distance away, and nearer to the sea, was another cabin, standing by itself and closed. Half a dozen bare-legged children were paddling in the water. No, said Hortense. All this autumnal sweetness and charm fails to attract me. I have so much faith in all your theories that I can't help thinking, in spite of everything, of this dreadful problem. Which of those people yonder is threatened? Death has already selected its victim. Who is it? Is it that young, fair-haired woman, rocking herself and laughing? Is it that tall man over there, smoking his cigar? And which of them has the thought of murder hidden in his heart? All the people we see are quietly enjoying themselves, yet death is prowling among them. Capital, said Renin. You too are becoming enthusiastic. What did I tell you? The whole of life's an adventure, and nothing but adventure is worth while. At the first breath of coming events, there you are, quivering in every nerve. You share in all the tragedies stirring around you, and a feeling of mystery awakens in the depths of your being. See how closely you are observing that couple who have just arrived? You never can tell. That may be the gentleman who proposes to do away with his wife, or perhaps the lady contemplates making away with her husband. The Dormevas? Never. A perfectly happy couple. Yesterday at the hotel I had a long talk with the wife. And you yourself? Oh, I played a round of golf with Jacques Dormeval, who rather fancies himself as an athlete, and I played at dolls with their two charming little girls. The Dormevals came up and exchanged a few words with them. Madame Dormeval said that her two daughters had gone back to Paris that morning with their governess. Her husband, a great tall fellow with a yellow beard, carrying his blazer over his arm and puffing out his chest under a cellular shirt, complained of the heat. "'Have you the key of the cabin, Thérèse?' he asked his wife when they had left Renin and Hortense and stopped at the top of the stairs a few yards away. "'Here it is,' said the wife. "'Are you going to read your papers?' "'Yes, unless we go for a stroll.' "'I'd rather wait till the afternoon. Do you mind? I have a lot of letters to write this morning.' "'Very well. We'll go on the cliff.' Hortense and Renin exchanged a glance of surprise. Was this suggestion accidental? or had they before them, contrary to their expectations, the very couple of whom they were in search? Hortense tried to laugh. <laughs> My heart is thumping, she said. Nevertheless, I absolutely refuse to believe in anything so improbable. My husband and I have never had the slightest quarrel, she said to me. No, it's quite clear that those two get on admirably. We shall see presently at the Trois Mathildes if one of them comes to meet the brother and sister. M. Dormeval had gone down the stairs, while his wife stood leaning on the balustrade of the terrace. 
She had a beautiful, slender, supple figure. Her clear-cut profile was emphasized by a rather too prominent chin when at rest, and when it was not smiling, the face gave an expression of sadness and suffering. "'Have you lost something, Jacques?' she called out to her husband, who was stooping over the shingle. "'Yes, the key,' he said. "'It slipped out of my hand.' She went down to him and began to look also. For two or three minutes, as they sheared off to the right and remained close to the bottom of the undercliff, they were invisible to Hortense and Renin. Their voices were covered by the noise of a dispute which had arisen among the bridge players. They reappeared almost simultaneously. Madame d'Ormeval slowly climbed a few steps of the stairs, and then stopped and turned her face towards the sea. Her husband had thrown his blazer over his shoulders and was making for the isolated cabin. As he passed the bridge players, they asked him for a decision, pointing to their cards spread out upon the table. But with a wave of the hand, he refused to give an opinion and walked on, covered the thirty yards which divided them from the cabin, opened the door, and went in. Thérèse d'Ormeval came back to the terrace and remained for ten minutes sitting on a bench. Then she came out through the casino. Hortense, on leaning forward, saw her entering one of the chalets annexed to the Hôtel Auville, and a moment later caught sight of her again on the balcony. Eleven o'clock, said Renin. Whoever it is, he or she, or one of the card players, or one of their wives, it won't be long before someone goes to the appointed place. Nevertheless, twenty minutes passed, and twenty-five and no one stirred. "'Perhaps Madame d'Ormeval has gone,' Hortense suggested anxiously. "'She is no longer on her balcony.' "'If she is at the trois said Renin, "'we will go and catch her there.' He was rising to his feet when a fresh discussion broke out among the bridge players, and one of them exclaimed, "'Let's put it to d'Ormeval.' "'Very well,' said his adversary. "'I'll accept his decision, if he consents to act as umpire.' It was rather huffy just now. They called out, Dormeval! Dormeval! They then saw that Dormeval must have shut the door behind him, which kept him in the half-dark, the cabin being one of the sort that has no window. He's asleep, cried one. Let's wake him up. All four went to the cabin, began by calling to him, and, on receiving no answer, thumped on the door. Hi, Dormeval, are you asleep? On the terrace, Serge Renin suddenly leapt to his feet with so uneasy an air that Hortense was astonished. He muttered, If only it's not too late. And when Hortense asked him what he meant, he tore down the steps and started running to the cabin. He reached it just as the bridge players were trying to break in the door. Stop, he ordered. Things must be done in the regular fashion. What things? they asked. He examined the Venetian shutters at the top of each of the folding doors, and on finding that one of the upper slats was partly broken, hung on as best he could to the roof of the cabin and cast a glance inside. Then he said to the four men, I was right in thinking that if Monsieur d'Ormeval did not reply, he must have been prevented by some serious cause. There is every reason to believe that Monsieur d'Ormeval is wounded or dead. Dead? they cried. What do you mean? He's only just left us. Renin took out his knife, prized open the lock, and pulled back the two doors. There were shouts of dismay. Monsieur d'Ormeval was lying flat on his face, clutching his jacket and his newspaper in his hands. Blood was flowing from his back and staining his shirt. Oh! said someone. He has killed himself. How can he have killed himself? said Renin. The wound is right in the middle of the back, at a place which the hand can't reach. And besides, there's not a knife in the cabin. The others protested. If so, he has been murdered. But that's impossible. There's been nobody here. We should have seen, if there had been. Nobody could have passed us without our seeing. The other men, all the ladies and the children paddling in the sea, had come running up. Renin allowed no one to enter the cabin except a doctor who was present. But the doctor could only say that Monsieur d'Ormeval was dead, stabbed with a dagger. At that moment, the mayor and the policeman arrived, together with some people of the village. After the usual inquiries, they carried away the body. 
A few persons went on ahead to break the news to Thérèse d'Ormeval, who was once more to be seen on her balcony. And so the tragedy had taken place without any clue to explain how a man, protected by a closed door with an uninjured lock, could have been murdered in the space of a few minutes and in front of twenty witnesses, one might almost say twenty spectators. No one had entered the cabin, no one had come out of it. As for the dagger with which M. d'Ormeval had been stabbed between the shoulders, it could not be traced. And all this would have suggested the idea of a trick of sleight of hand performed by a clever conjurer, had it not concerned a terrible murder committed under the most mysterious conditions. Hortense was unable to follow, as Renin would have liked, the small party who were making for Madame d'Ormeval. She was paralyzed with excitement and incapable of moving. It was the first time that her adventures with Renin had taken her into the very heart of the action, and that instead of noting the consequences of a murder, or assisting in the pursuit of the criminals, she found herself confronted with the murder itself. It left her trembling all over, and she stammered, oh, "'Horrible! Poor fellow! Oh, Renin, you couldn't save him this time! And that's what upsets me more than anything, that we could and should have saved him, since we knew of the plot. Renin made her sniff at a bottle of salts, and when she had quite recovered her composure, he said, while observing her attentively, So you think that there is some connection between the murder and the plot which we were trying to frustrate? Certainly, said she, astonished at the question. Then, as that plot was hatched by a husband against his wife, or by a wife against her husband, you admit that Madame d'Armeval... Oh, no, impossible, she said. To begin with, Madame d'Armeval did not leave her rooms, and then I shall never believe that pretty woman capable. No, oh, no, of course there was something else. What else? I don't know. You may have misunderstood what the brother and sister were saying to each other. You see, the murder has been committed under quite different conditions, at another hour and another place. And therefore, concluded Renin, the two cases are not in any way related. Oh, she said, there is no making it out. It's all so strange. Renin became a little satirical. My pupil is doing me no credit today, he said. Why, here is a perfectly simple story unfolded before your eyes. You have seen it reeled off like a scene in the cinema, and it all remains as obscure to you as though you were hearing of an affair that happened in a cave a hundred miles away. Hortense was confounded. What are you saying? Do you mean that you have understood it? What clues have you to go by? Renin looked at his watch. I have not understood everything, he said. The murder itself, the mere brutal murder, yes. But the essential thing that is to say, the psychology of the crime. I have no clue to that. Only it is twelve o'clock. The brother and sister, seeing no one come to the appointment at the trois Mercilles, will go down to the beach. Don't you think that we shall learn something, then, of the accomplice whom I accuse them of having, and of the connection between the two cases? They reached the esplanade in front of the Auville chalets, with the capstans by which the fishermen haul up their boats to the beach. A number of inquisitive persons were standing outside the door of one of the chalets. Two coast guards, posted at the door, prevented them from entering. The mayor shouldered his way eagerly through the crowd. He was back from the post office, where he had been telephoning to La Havre, to the office of the procurator general, and had been told that the public prosecutor and an examining magistrate would come on to Etretat in the course of the afternoon. "'That leaves us plenty of time for lunch,' said Renin. The tragedy will not be enacted before two or three o'clock, and I have an idea that it will be sensational. They hurried, nevertheless. Hortense, overwrought by fatigue and her desire to know what was happening, continually questioned Renin, who replied evasively, with his eyes turned to the esplanade, which they could see through the windows of the coffee room. "'Are you watching for those two? asked Hortense. "'Yes, the brother and sister.' Are you sure that they will venture? Look out, here they come. He went out quickly. Where the main street opened on the seafront, a lady and gentleman were advancing with hesitating steps, as though unfamiliar with the place. The brother was a puny little man with a sallow complexion. He was wearing a motoring cap, 
The sister, too, was short, but rather stout, and was wrapped in a large cloak. She struck them as a woman of a certain age, but still good-looking under the thin veil that covered her face. They saw the group of bystanders and drew nearer. Their gait betrayed uneasiness and hesitation. The sister asked a question of a seaman. At the first words of his answer, which no doubt conveyed the news of Dormeval's death, she uttered a cry and tried to force her way through the crowd. The brother, learning in his turn what had happened, made great play with his elbows and shouted to the coast guards, "'I'm a friend of Dormeval's. Here's my card, Frédéric Astin. My sister Germaine Astin knows Madame Dormeval intimately. They were expecting us. We had an appointment.' They were allowed to pass. Renin, who had slipped behind them, followed them in without a word, accompanied by Hortense. The Dormavals had four bedrooms and a sitting-room on the second floor. The sister rushed into one of the rooms and threw herself on her knees beside the bed on which the corpse lay stretched. Thérèse Dormaval was in the sitting-room and was sobbing in the midst of a small company of silent persons. The brother sat down beside her, eagerly seized her hands and said, in a trembling voice, "'My poor friend! My poor friend!' Renin and Hortense gazed at the pair of them, and Hortense whispered, "'She's supposed to have killed him for that? Impossible!' "'Nevertheless,' observed Renin, "'they are acquaintances, and we know that Estin and his sister were also acquainted with a third person who was their accomplice, so that—' It's impossible, Hortense repeated. And in spite of all presumption, she felt so much attracted by Thérèse that, when Frédéric Astin stood up, she proceeded straightway to sit down beside her and consoled her in a gentle voice. The unhappy woman's tears distressed her profoundly. Renin, on the other hand, applied himself from the outset to watching the brother and sister, as though this were the only thing that mattered and did not take his eyes off Frédéric Astin, who, with an air of indifference, began to make a minute inspection of the premises, examining the sitting-room, going into all the bedrooms, mingling with the various groups of persons present, and asking questions about the manner in which the murder had been committed. Twice his sister came up and spoke to him. Then he went back to Madame d'Ormeval, and again sat down beside her, full of earnest sympathy. Lastly, in the lobby, he had a long conversation with his sister, after which they departed, like people who have come to a perfect understanding. Frédéric then left. These maneuvers had lasted quite thirty or forty minutes. It was at this moment that the motor-car containing the examining magistrate and the public prosecutor pulled up outside the chalets. Renin, who did not expect them until later, said to Hortense, "'We must be quick. On no account leave Madame d'Ormeval.' Word was sent up to the persons whose evidence might be of any service that they were to go to the beach, where the magistrate was beginning a preliminary investigation. He would call on Madame d'Ormeval afterwards. Accordingly, all who were present left the chalet. No one remained behind except the two guards and Germaine Astin. Germaine knelt down for the last time beside the dead man, and bending low, with her face in her hands, prayed for a long time. Then she rose and was opening the door on the landing when Renin came forward. "'I should like a few words with you, madame.' She seemed surprised and replied, "'What is it, monsieur? I am listening.' "'Not here.' "'Where, then, monsieur?' "'Next door, in the sitting-room.' "'No,' she said sharply. "'Why not? Though you did not even shake hands with her, I presume that madame d'Ormeval is your friend.' He gave her no time to reflect, drew her into the next room, closed the door, and, at once pouncing upon Madame d'Ormeval, who was trying to go out and return to her own room, said, "'No, Madame, listen, I implore you. Madame Estelle's presence need not drive you away. We have very serious matters to discuss, without losing a minute.' The two women, standing face to face, were looking at each other with the same expression of implacable hatred, in which might be read the same confusion of spirit and the same restrained anger. Hortense, who believed them to be friends, and who might, up to a certain point, have believed them to be accomplices, foresaw with terror the hostile encounter which she felt to be inevitable. She compelled Madame d'Ormeval to resume her seat, 
while Renin took up his position in the middle of the room and spoke in resolute tones. Chance, which has placed me in possession of part of the truth, will enable me to save you both, if you are willing to assist me with a frank explanation that will give me the particulars which I still need. Each of you knows the danger in which she stands, because each of you is conscious in her heart of the evil for which she is responsible. But you are carried away by hatred, and it is for me to see clearly and to act. The examining magistrate will be here in half an hour. By that time you must have come to an agreement. They both started, as though offended by such a word. Yes, an agreement, he repeated, in a more imperious tone. Whether you like it or not, you will come to an agreement. You are not the only ones to be considered. There are your two little daughters, Madame d'Ormeval. Since circumstances have set me in their path, I am intervening in their defence and for their safety. A blunder, a word too much, and they are ruined. That must not happen. At the mention of her children, Madame d'Ormeval broke down and sobbed. Germaine Estaing shrugged her shoulders and made a movement towards the door. Renin once more blocked the way. "'Where are you going?' "'I have been summoned by the examining magistrate.' "'No, you have not.' "'Yes, I have, just as all those have been who have any evidence to give.' "'You were not on the spot. You know nothing of what happened. Nobody knows anything of the murder.' "'I know who committed it.' "'That's impossible. It was Thérèse d'Ormeval.' The accusation was hurled forth in an outburst of rage and with a fiercely threatening gesture. "'You wretched creature!' exclaimed Madame d'Ormeval, rushing at her. "'Go! Leave the room! Oh, what a wretch the woman is!' Hortense was trying to restrain her, but Renin whispered, "'Let them be. It's what I wanted. To pitch them one against the other, and so to let in the daylight.' Madame Estin had made a convulsive effort to ward off the insult with a jest, and she sniggered. A wretched creature! Why? Because I have accused you. Why? For every reason! You're a wretched creature! You hear what I say, Germaine? You're a wretch! Thérèse d'Ormeval was repeating the insult as though it afforded her some relief. Her anger was abating. Very likely also she no longer had the strength to keep up the struggle, and it was Madame Estin who returned to the attack, with her fists clenched and her face distorted and suddenly aged by fully twenty years. You! You dare to insult me! You! You, after the murder you have committed! You dare to lift up your head when the man whom you killed is lying in there on his deathbed! Oh, if one of us is a wretched creature, it's you, Thérèse, and you know it! You have killed your husband! You have killed your husband! She leapt forward in the excitement of the terrible words which she was uttering, and her fingernails were almost touching her friend's face. "'Oh, don't tell me you didn't kill him!' she cried. "'Don't say that! I won't let you! Don't say it! The dagger is there in your bag! My brother felt it while he was talking to you, and his hand came out with the stains of blood upon it, your husband's blood, Thérèse. And then, even if I had not discovered anything, do you think that I should not have guessed in the first few minutes? Why, oh, I knew the truth at once, Thérèse. When a sailor down there answered, Mr. Dormeval, he has been murdered. I said to myself then and there, It's she, it's Thérèse, she killed him. Thérèse did not reply. She had abandoned her attitude of protest. Hortense, who was watching her with anguish, thought that she could perceive in her the despondency of those who know themselves to be lost. Her cheeks had fallen in, and she wore such an expression of despair that Hortense, moved to compassion, implored her to defend herself. Please, please explain things. When the murder was committed, you were here, on the balcony. But then, the dagger. How did you come to have it? How do you explain it? Explanations, sneered Germaine Estin. How could she possibly explain? What do outward appearances matter? What does it matter what anyone saw or did not see? The proof is the thing that tells. The dagger is there in your bag, Thérèse. That's a fact. Yes, yes, it was you who did it. You killed him. You killed him in the end. Oh, how often I've told my brother, she will kill him yet. Frédéric used to try to defend you. He always had a weakness for you. But in his innermost heart, he foresaw what would happen. 
and now the horrible thing has been done. A stab in the back. Coward! Coward! And you would have me say nothing? Why, I didn't hesitate a moment, nor did Frédéric. We looked for proofs at once, and I've denounced you of my own free will, perfectly well aware of what I was doing. And it's over, Thérèse. You're done for. Nothing can save you now. The dagger is in that bag which you are clutching in your hand. The magistrate is coming, and the dagger will be found, stained with the blood of your husband. So will your pocketbook. They're both there, and they will be found. Her rage had incensed her so vehemently that she was unable to continue, and stood with her hand outstretched, and her chin twitching with nervous tremors. Renin gently took hold of Madame d'Ormeval's bag. She clung to it, but he insisted and said, "'Please allow me, madame. Your friend Germaine is right. The examining magistrate will be here presently, and the fact that the dagger and the pocket-book are in your possession will lead to your immediate arrest. This must not happen. Please allow me.' His insinuating voice diminished Thérèse d'Ormeval's resistance. She released her fingers, one by one. He took the bag, opened it, produced a little dagger with an ebony handle and a grey leather pocket-book, and quietly slipped the two into the inside pocket of his jacket. Germaine Astin gazed at him in amazement. "'You're mad, monsieur! What right of you?' "'These things must not be left lying about. I shan't worry now. The magistrate will never look for them in my pocket.' "'But I shall denounce you to the police!' she exclaimed indignantly. They shall be told. <laughs> no, no, he said, laughing. You won't say anything. The police have nothing to do with this. The quarrel between you must be settled in private. What an idea to go dragging the police into every incident of one's life. Madame Estaing was choking with fury. But you have no right to talk like this, monsieur. Who are you, after all? A friend of that woman's? Since you have been attacking her, yes. But I'm only attacking her because she's guilty, for you can't deny it. She has killed her husband. I don't deny it, said Renin calmly. We are all agreed on that point. Jacques d'Ormeval was killed by his wife. But I repeat, the police must not know the truth. They shall know it through me, monsieur. I swear they shall. That woman must be punished. She has committed murder. Renin went up to her and, touching her on the shoulder, you asked me just now by what right I was interfering. And you yourself, madame? I was a friend of Jacques d'Ormeval. Only a friend? She was a little taken aback, but at once pulled herself together and replied, I was his friend, and it is my duty to avenge his death. Nevertheless, you will remain silent, as he did. He did not know when he died. That's where you are wrong. He could have accused his wife if he had wished. He had ample time to accuse her, and he said nothing. Why? Because of his children. Madame Estin was not appeased, and her attitude displayed the same longing for revenge and the same detestation. But she was influenced by Renin in spite of herself. In the small closed room, where there was such a clash of hatred, he was gradually becoming the master and Germaine Astin understood that it was against him that she had to struggle, while Madame d'Ormeval felt all the comfort of that unexpected support which was offering itself on the brink of the abyss. "'Thank you, monsieur,' she said. "'As you have seen all this so clearly, you also know that it was for my children's sake that I did not give myself up. But for that—' Oh, "'I am so tired.' And so the scene was changing, and things assuming a different aspect. Thanks to a few words let fall in the midst of the dispute, the culprit was lifting her head and taking heart, whereas her accuser was hesitating and seemed to be uneasy. And it also came about that the accuser dared not say anything further, and that the culprit was nearing the moment at which the need is felt of breaking silence, and of speaking, quite naturally, words that are at once a confession and a relief. The time, I think, has come, said Renin to Thérèse, with the same unvarying gentleness, when you can and ought to explain yourself. She was again weeping, lying huddled in a chair. She too revealed a face aged and ravaged by sorrow. 
and in a very low voice, with no display of anger, she spoke in short, broken sentences. She has been his mistress for the last four years. I can't tell you how I suffered. She herself told me of it, out of sheer wickedness. Her loathing for me was even greater than her love for Jacques, and every day I had some fresh injury to bear. She would ring me up to tell me of her appointments with my husband. She hoped to make me suffer so much I should end by killing myself. I did think of it sometimes, but I held out for the children's sake. Jacques was weakening. She wanted him to get a divorce, and little by little he began to consent, dominated by her and by her brother, who was slyer than she is, but quite as dangerous. I felt all this. Jacques was becoming harsh to me. He had not the courage to leave me, but I was the obstacle, and he bore me a grudge. Heavens, the tortures I suffered! You should have given him his liberty, cried Germain Astin. A woman doesn't kill her husband for wanting a divorce. Therese shook her head and answered, I did not kill him because he wanted a divorce. If he had really wanted it, he would have left me. And what could I have done? But your plans had changed, Germain. Divorce was not enough for you, and it was something else that you would have obtained from him. Another, much more serious thing which you and your brother had insisted on, and to which he had consented, out of cowardice, in spite of himself. But what do you mean? spluttered Germain. What other thing? My death. You lie! cried Madame Astin. Therese did not raise her voice. She made not a movement of aversion or indignation, and simply repeated, my death, Germain. I have read your latest letters, six letters from you which he was foolish enough to leave about in his pocket-book, and which I read last night, six letters in which the terrible word is not set down, but in which it appears between every line. I trembled as I read it. The shock should come to this. Nevertheless, the idea of stabbing him did not occur to me for a second. A woman like myself, Germain, does not readily commit murder. If I lost my head, it was after that, and it was your fault. She turned her eyes to Renin, as if to ask him if there was no danger in her speaking and revealing the truth. Don't be afraid, he said. I will be answerable for everything. She drew her hand across her forehead. The horrible scene was being reenacted within her and was torturing her. Germaine Estin did not move, but stood with folded arms and anxious eyes, while Hortense Daniel sat distractedly, awaiting the confession of the crime and the explanation of the unfathomable mystery. It was after that, and it was through your fault, Germain, I had put back the pocket-book in the drawer where it was hidden, and I said nothing to Jacques this morning. I did not want to tell him what I knew. It was too horrible. All the same, I had to act quickly. Your letters announced your secret arrival today. I thought at first of running away, of taking the train. I had mechanically picked up that dagger to defend myself, but when Jacques and I went down to the beach, I was resigned. Yes, I had accepted death. I will die, I thought, and put an end to all this nightmare. Only for the children's sake I was anxious that my death should look like an accident, and that Jacques should have no part in it. That was why your plan of a walk on the cliff suited me. A fall from the top of a cliff seems quite natural. Jacques, therefore, left me to go to his cabin, from which he was to join you later at the trois Metzils. On the way, below the terrace, he dropped the key of the cabin. I went down and began to look for it with him. And it happened then, through your fault. Yes, Germain, through your fault. Jacques's pocket-book had slipped from his jacket without his noticing it, and together with the pocket-book, a photograph which I recognized at once, a photograph taken this year, of myself and my two children. I picked it up, and I saw. You know what I saw, Germain. Instead of my face, the face in the photograph was yours. You had put in your likeness, Germain, and blotted me out. It was your face. One of your arms was round my elder daughter's neck, and the younger was sitting on your knees. It was you, Germain, the wife of my husband, the future mother of my children. You who were going to bring them up. You! You! 
Then I lost my head. I had the dagger. Jacques was stooping. I stabbed him. Every word of her confession was strictly true. Those who listened to her felt this profoundly, and nothing could have given Hortense and Renin a keener impression of tragedy. She had fallen back into her chair, utterly exhausted. Nevertheless, she went on speaking unintelligible words, and it was only gradually by leaning over her that they were able to make out. I thought that there would be an outcry that I should be arrested. But no, it happened in such a way and under such circumstances that no one had seen anything. Further, Jacques had drawn himself up at the same time as myself, and he actually did not fall. No, he did not fall. I had stabbed him, and he remained standing. I saw him from the terrace to which I had returned. He had hung his jacket over his shoulders, evidently to hide his wound, and he moved away without staggering, or staggering so little that I alone was able to perceive it. He even spoke to some friends who were playing cards. Then he went to his cabin and disappeared. In a few moments I came back indoors. I was persuaded that all of this was only a bad dream, that I had not killed him, or that at the worst the wound was a slight one. Jacques would come out again. I was certain of it. I watched him from my balcony. If I had thought for a moment that he needed assistance, I should have flown to him. But truly I didn't know. I didn't guess. People speak of presentiments. There are no such things. I was perfectly calm, just as one is after a nightmare of which the memory is fading away. No, I swear to you I knew nothing until the moment. She interrupted herself, stifled by sobs. Renin finished her sentence for her. Until the moment when they came and told you, I suppose. Therese stammered. Yes, it, it, it was not till then that I, I was conscious of what I had done, and I felt that I was going mad and that I should cry out to all those people. Why, it was I who did it. Don't search. Here's the dagger. I'm the culprit. Yes, I was going to say that when suddenly I caught sight of my poor Jacques. They were carrying him along. His face was very peaceful, very gentle. And in his presence I understood my duty, as he had understood his. He had kept silent for the sake of the children. I would be silent, too. We were both guilty of the murder of which he was the victim, and we must both do all we could to prevent the crime from recoiling upon them. He had seen this clearly in his dying agony. He had had the amazing courage to keep his feet, to answer the people who spoke to him, and to lock himself up to die. He had done this, wiping out all his faults with a single action, and in so doing had granted me his forgiveness, because he was not accusing me, and was ordering me to hold my peace, and to defend myself against everybody, especially against you, Germain. She uttered these last words more firmly, at first wholly overwhelmed by the unconscious act which she had committed in killing her husband. She had recovered her strength a little in thinking of what she had done and in defending herself with such energy. Faced by the intriguing woman whose hatred had driven both of them to death and crime, she clenched her fists, ready for the struggle, all quivering with resolution. Germaine Astin did not flinch. She had listened without a word, with a relentless expression which grew harder and harder as Thérèse's confessions became precise. No emotion seemed to soften her, and no remorse to penetrate her being. At most, towards the end, her thin lips shaped themselves into a faint smile. She was holding her prey in her clutches. Slowly, with her eyes raised to a mirror, she adjusted her hat and powdered her face. Then she walked to the door. Thérèse darted forward. "'Where are you going?' "'Where I choose.' "'To see the examining magistrate?' Very likely. You shan't pass. As you please. I'll wait for him here. And you'll tell him what? Why, all that you've said, of course. All that you've been silly enough to say. How could he doubt the story? You have explained it all to me so fully. Therese took her by the shoulders. Yes, but I'll explain other things to him at the same time, Germaine. Things that concern you. If I'm ruined, so shall you be. You can't touch me. I can expose you, show your letters. What letters? 
those in which my death was decided on. Lies, Therese. You know that famous plot exists only in your imagination. Neither Jacques nor I wished for your death. You did at any rate. Your letters condemn you. Lies. They were letters of a friend to a friend. Letters of a mistress to her paramour. Prove it. They are there in Jacques's pocketbook. No, they're not. What's that you say? I say that those letters belong to me. I've taken them back. Or rather, my brother has. You've stolen them, you wretch. And you shall give them back again, cried Therese, shaking her. I have them. My brother kept them. He is gone. Therese staggered and stretched out her hand to Renin with an expression of despair. Renin said, What she says is true. I watched the brother's proceedings while he was feeling in your bag. He took out the pocketbook, looked through it with his sister, came and put it back again, and went off with the letters. Renin paused and added, Or at least with five of them. The two women moved closer to him. What did he intend to convey? If Frédéric Astin had taken away only five letters, what had become of the sixth? I suppose, said Renin, that when the pocketbook fell on the shingle, that sixth letter slipped out at the same time as the photograph, and that Monsieur d'Ormeval must have picked it up, for I found it in the pocket of his blazer, which had been hung up near the bed. Here it is. It's signed Germaine Astin, and it is quite enough to prove the writer's intentions and the murderous counsels which he was pressing upon her lover. Madame Astin had turned grey in the face, and was so much disconcerted that she did not try to defend herself. Renin continued, addressing his remarks to her. To my mind, madame, you are responsible for all that happened. Penniless, no doubt, and at the end of your resources, you tried to profit by the passion with which you inspired Monsieur d'Ormeval, in order to make him marry you, in spite of all the obstacles, and to lay your hands upon his fortune. I have proofs of this greed for money, and these abominable calculations, and can supply them if need be. A few minutes after I had felt in the pocket of that jacket, you did the same. I had removed the sixth letter, but had left a slip of paper which you looked for eagerly, and which also must have dropped out of the pocket book. It was an uncrossed check for a hundred thousand francs, drawn by Monsieur d'Ormeval in your brother's name. Just a little wedding present, what we might call pin money. Acting on your instructions, your brother dashed off by motor to Le Havre to reach the bank before four o'clock. I may as well tell you that he will not have cashed the check, for I have had a telephone message sent to the bank to announce the murder of Monsieur d'Ormeval, which stops all payments. The upshot of all this is that the police, if you persist in your schemes of revenge, will have in their hands all the proofs that are wanted against you and your brother. I might add, as an edifying piece of evidence, the story of the conversation which I overheard between your brother and yourself in a dining car on the railway between Brest and Paris a fortnight ago. But I feel sure that you will not drive me to adopt these extreme measures and that we understand each other. Isn't that so? Natures like Madame Estaz, which are violent and headstrong so long as a fight is possible and while a gleam of hope remains, are easily swayed in defeat. Germaine was too intelligent not to grasp the fact that the least attempt at resistance would be shattered by such an adversary as this. She was in his hands. She could but yield. She therefore did not divulge in any play-acting, nor in any demonstration such as threats, outbursts of fury or hysterics. She bowed. We are agreed, she said. What are your terms? Go away. If ever you are called upon for your evidence, say that you know nothing. She walked away. At the door she hesitated, and then between her teeth said, The check. Renin looked at Madame d'Ormeval, who declared, Let her keep it. I would not touch that money. When Renin had given Thérèse d'Ormeval precise instructions as to how she was to behave, at the inquiry and to answer the questions put to her, he left the chalet accompanied by Hortense Daniel. On the beach below, the magistrate and the public prosecutor were continuing their investigations, taking measurements, examining the witnesses, and generally laying their heads together. "'When I think,' said Hortense, "'that you have the dagger and Madame d'Ormeval's pocketbook on you.' <laughs> 
"'And it strikes you as awfully dangerous, I suppose,' he said, laughing. "'It strikes me as awfully comic. "'Aren't you afraid? "'Of what? "'That they may suspect something. <laughs> "'Lord, they won't suspect a thing. "'We shall tell those good people what we saw, "'and our evidence will only increase their perplexity, "'for we saw nothing at all. "'For prudence' sake we will stay a day or two "'to see which way the wind is blowing. "'But it's quite settled "'they will never be able to make head or tail of the matter. "'Nevertheless, you guessed the secret, and from the first. "'Why? "'Because, instead of seeking difficulties where none exist, "'as people generally do, "'I always put the question as it should be put, "'and the solution comes quite naturally. "'A man goes to his cabin and locks himself in. "'Half an hour later he is found inside, dead. "'No one has gone in. "'What has happened?' To my mind, there is only one answer. There is no need to think about it. As the murder was not committed in the cabin, it must have been committed beforehand, and the man was already mortally wounded when he entered his cabin. And forthwith, the truth in this particular case appeared to me. Madame d'Ormeval, who was to have been killed this evening, forestalled her murderers, and while her husband was stooping to the ground, in a moment of frenzy, stabbed him in the back. There was nothing left to do but look for the reasons that prompted her action. When I knew them, I took her part unreservedly. That's the whole story. The day was beginning to wane. The blue of the sky was becoming darker, and the sea even more peaceful than before. What are you thinking of? asked Renin after a moment. I am thinking, she said, that if I too were the victim of some machination, I should trust you whatever happened. "'Trust you through and against all. "'I know as certainly as I know that I exist "'that you would save me, whatever the obstacles might be. "'There is no limit to the power of your will.' "'He said very softly, "'There is no limit to my wish to please you.' "'End of chapter 5《Chapter Six of the Eight Strokes of the Clock》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《The Eight Strokes of the Clock by Maurice Leblanc》Chapter Six The Lady with the Hatchet One of the most incomprehensible incidents that preceded the Great War was certainly the one which was known as the episode of the Lady with the Hatchet. The solution of the mystery was unknown and would never have been known had not circumstances in the cruelest fashion obliged Prince Renin, or should I say Arsène Lupin, to take up the matter, and had I not been able today to tell the true story from the details supplied by him. Let me recite the facts. In a space of eighteen months, five women disappeared, five women of different stations in life, all between twenty and thirty years of age, and living in Paris or the Paris district. I will give their names. Madame Ladoux, the wife of a doctor. Mademoiselle Ardin, the daughter of a banker. Mademoiselle Covreau, a washerwoman of Corbevoix. Mademoiselle Honorine Vernisset, a dressmaker. And Madame Grollinger, an artist. These five women disappeared without the possibility of discovering a single particular to explain why they had left their homes, why they did not return to them, who had enticed them away, and where and how they were detained. Each of these women, a week after her departure, was found somewhere or other in the western outskirts of Paris, and each time it was a dead body that was found the dead body of a woman who had been killed by a blow on the head from a hatchet, and each time not far from the woman who was firmly bound, her face covered with blood and her body emaciated by lack of food, the marks of carriage wheels proved that the corpse had been driven to the spot. The five murders were so much alike that there was only a single investigation embracing all the five inquiries, and for that matter leading to no result. A woman disappeared. A week later, to a day, her body was discovered, and that was all. The bonds that fastened her were similar in each case. So were the tracks left by the wheels. So were the blows of the hatchet, all of which were struck vertically at the top and right in the middle of the forehead. The motive of the crime? 
The five women had been completely stripped of their jewels, purses, and other objects of value, but the robberies might well have been attributed to marauders or any passers-by, since the bodies were lying in deserted spots. Were the authorities to believe in the execution of a plan of revenge, or of a plan intended to do away with a series of persons mutually connected, persons, for instance, likely to benefit by a future inheritance? Here again the same obscurity prevailed. Theories were built up only to be demolished forthwith by an examination of the facts. Trails were followed and at once abandoned. And suddenly there was a sensation. A woman engaged in sweeping the roads picked up on the pavement a little notebook which she brought to the local police station. The leaves of this notebook were all blank, excepting one, on which was written a list of the murdered women, with their names set down in order of date and accompanied by three figures, La Doux, 132, Vernisset, 118, and so on. Certainly no importance would have been attached to these entries, which anybody might have written, since everyone was acquainted with the sinister list, but instead of five names it included six. Yes, below the words Grollinger, 128, there appeared Williamson, 114. Did this indicate a sixth murder? The obviously English origin of the name limited the field of the investigations, which did not in fact take long. It was ascertained that a fortnight ago a Miss Hermione Williamson, a governess in a family at Auteuil, had left her place to go back to England, and that since then her sisters, though she had written to tell them that she was coming over, had heard no more of her. A fresh inquiry was instituted. A postman found the body in the Mudon woods. Miss Williamson's skull was split down the middle. I need not describe the public excitement at this stage, nor the shudder of horror which passed through the crowd when it read this list, written without a doubt in the murderer's own hand. What could be more frightful than such a record, kept up to date like a careful tradesman's ledger? On such a day I killed so-and-so, on such a day so-and-so, and the sum total was six dead bodies. Against all expectation, the experts in handwriting had no difficulty in agreeing, and unanimously declared that the writing was that of a woman, an educated woman, possessing artistic tastes, imagination, and an extremely sensitive nature. The lady with the hatchet, as the journalists christened her, was decidedly no ordinary person, and scores of newspaper articles made a special study of her case, exposing her mental condition and losing themselves in far-fetched explanations. Nevertheless, it was the writer of one of these articles, a young journalist whose chance discovery made him the center of public attention, who supplied the one element of truth and shed upon the darkness the only ray of light that was to penetrate it. In casting about for the meaning of the figures which followed the six names, he had come to ask himself whether those figures did not simply represent the number of the days separating one crime from the next. All that he had to do was to check the dates. He at once found that his theory was correct. Mademoiselle Vernisset had been carried off 132 days after Madame Ladoux, Mademoiselle Covreau 118 days after Honorine Vernisset, and so on. There was therefore no room for doubt, and the police had no choice but to accept a solution which so precisely fitted the circumstances. The figures corresponded with the intervals. There was no mistake in the records of the lady with the hatchet. But then one deduction became inevitable. Miss Williamson, the latest victim, had been carried off on the 26th of June last, and her name was followed by the figures 114. Was it not to be presumed that a fresh crime would be committed 114 days later, that is to say, on the 18th of October? Was it not probable that the horrible business would be repeated, in accordance with the murderer's secret intentions? Were they not bound to pursue to its logical conclusion the argument which ascribed to the figures, to all the figures, to the last as well as to the others, their value as eventual dates? Now it was precisely this deduction which was drawn and was being weighed and discussed during the few days that preceded the 18th of October, when logic demanded the performance of yet another act of the abominable tragedy. 
and it was only natural that, on the morning of that day, Prince Renin and Hortense, when making an appointment by telephone for the evening, should allude to the newspaper articles which they had both been reading. <laughs> Look out, said Renin, laughing. If you meet the lady with the hatchet, take the other side of the road. And if the good lady carries me off, what am I to do? Strew your path with little white pebbles and say, until the very moment when the hatchet flashes in the air, I have nothing to fear. He will save me. He is myself. And I kiss your hands. Till this evening, my dear. That afternoon, Renin had an appointment with Rose André and Dalbrecht to arrange for their departure for the States. Before four and seven o'clock, he bought the different editions of the evening papers. None of them reported an abduction. At nine o'clock he went to the gymnase, where he had taken a private box. At half-past nine, as Hortense had not arrived, he rang her up, though without thought of anxiety. The maid replied that Madame Danielle had not come in yet. Seized with a sudden fear, Renin hurried to the furnished flat which Hortense was occupying for the time being, near the Parc Morceau, and questioned the maid, whom he had engaged for her and who was completely devoted to him. The woman said that her mistress had gone out at two o'clock with a stamped letter in her hand, saying that she was going to the post and that she would come back to dress. This was the last that had been seen of her. To whom was the letter addressed? To you, sir. I saw the writing on the envelope, Prince Serge Renin. He waited until midnight, but in vain. Hortense did not return, nor did she return next day. Not a word to anyone, said Renin to the maid. Say that your mistress is in the country and that you are going to join her. For his own part, he had not a doubt. Hortense's disappearance was explained by the very fact of the date, the 18th of October. She was the seventh victim of the lady with the hatchet. The abduction, said Renin to himself, precedes the blow of the hatchet by a week. I have therefore, at the present moment, seven full days before me, let us say six, to avoid any surprise. This is Saturday. Hortense must be set free by midday on Friday, and to make sure of this, I must know her hiding place by nine o'clock on Thursday evening at latest. Renin wrote, Thursday evening, nine o'clock, in big letters, on a card which he nailed above the mantelpiece in his study. Then, at midday on Saturday, the day after the disappearance, he locked himself into the study, after telling his man not to disturb him except for meals and letters. He spent four days there, almost without moving, yet immediately sent for a set of all the leading newspapers which had spoken in detail of the first six crimes. When he had read and re-read them, he closed the shutters, drew the curtains, and lay down on the sofa in the dark, with the door bolted, thinking. By Tuesday evening he was no further advanced than on the Saturday. The darkness was as dense as ever. He had not discovered the smallest clue for his guidance, nor could he see the slightest reason to hope. At times, notwithstanding his immense power of self-control and his unlimited confidence in the resources at his disposal, at times he would quake with anguish. Would he arrive in time? There was no reason why he should see more clearly during the last few days than during those which had already elapsed, and this meant that Hortense Daniel would inevitably be murdered. The thought tortured him. He was attached to Hortense by a much stronger and deeper feeling than the appearance of the relations between them would have led an onlooker to believe. The curiosity at the beginning, the first desire, the impulse to protect Hortense, to distract her, to inspire her with a relish for existence, all this had simply turned to love. Neither of them was aware of it, because they barely saw each other, save at critical times when they were occupied with the adventures of others, and not with their own. But at the first onslaught of danger, Renin realized the place which Hortense had taken in his life, and he was in despair at knowing her to be a prisoner, and a martyr, and at being unable to save her. He spent a feverish, agitated night, turning the case over and over from every point of view. The Wednesday morning was also a terrible time for him. He was losing ground. Giving up his hermit-like seclusion, he threw open the windows and paced to and fro through his rooms, ran out into the street and came in again, as though fleeing before the thought that obsessed him. 
Oh, tens is suffering. Of oh, tens is in the depth. She sees the hatchet. She is calling to me. She is entreating me. But I can do nothing. It was five o'clock in the afternoon that, on examining the list of the six names, he received that little inward shock which is a sort of signal of the truth that is being sought for. A light shot through his mind. It was not, to be sure, that brilliant light in which every detail is made plain, but it was enough to tell him in which direction to move. His plan of campaign was formed at once. He sent Adolphe, his chauffeur, to the principal newspapers with a few lines which were to appear in type among the next morning's advertisements. Adolphe was also told to go to the laundry at Corbevoix, where Mademoiselle Covreau, the second of the six victims, had been employed. On the Thursday, Vinin did not stir out of doors. In the afternoon, he received several letters in reply to his advertisement. Then two telegrams arrived. Lastly, at three o'clock, there came a pneumatic letter bearing the Trocadero postmark, which seemed to be what he was expecting. He turned up a directory, noted an address. Monsieur de Lourtier Vanneau, retired colonial governor, 14 biz of Nucléber, and ran down to his car. Adolphe, 47 biz of Nucléber. He was shown into a large study furnished with magnificent bookcases containing old volumes in costly bindings. Monsieur de Lourtier Vanneau was a man still in the prime of life, wearing a slightly grizzled beard, and by his affable manners and genuine distinction, commanding confidence and liking. Monsieur de Lourtier, said Renin, I have ventured to call on your excellency, because I read in last year's newspapers that you used to know one of the victims of the lady with the hatchet, Honorine Vernisset. Why, of course we knew her, cried Monsieur de Lourtier. My wife used to employ her as a dressmaker by the day. Poor girl. Monsieur de Lourtier, a lady of my acquaintance has disappeared as the other six victims disappeared. What? exclaimed Monsieur de Lourtier with a start. But I followed the newspapers carefully. There was nothing on the 18th of October. Yes, a woman of whom I am very fond, Madame Hortense Daniel, was abducted on the 17th of October. And this is the 22nd. Yes, and the murder will be committed on the 24th. Horrible, horrible. It must be prevented at all costs. And I shall perhaps succeed in preventing it, with Your Excellency's assistance. But have you been to the police? No, we are faced by mysteries which are, so to speak, absolute and compact, which offer no gap through which the keenest eyes can see, and which it is useless to hope to clear up by ordinary methods, such as inspection of the scenes of the crimes, police inquiries, searching for fingerprints, and so on. As none of those proceedings served any good purpose in the previous cases, it would be a waste of time to resort to them in a seventh similar case. An enemy who displays such skill and subtlety would not leave behind her any of those clumsy traces which are the first things that a professional detective seizes upon. Then what have you done? Before taking any action, I have reflected. I gave four days to thinking the matter over. Monsieur de Lortier Vanneau examined his visitor closely, and with a touch of irony asked, "'And the result of your meditations?' "'To begin with,' said Renin, refusing to be put out of countenance, "'I have submitted all these cases to a comprehensive survey, which hitherto no one else had done. This enabled me to discover their general meaning, to put aside all the tangle of embarrassing theories and since no one was able to agree as to the motives of all this filthy business, to attribute it to the only class of persons capable of it. That is to say, lunatics, Your Excellency. Monsieur de Lortier Vanneau started. Lunatics? What an idea! Monsieur de Lortier, the woman known as the lady with the hatchet, is a madwoman. But she would be locked up. We don't know that she's not. We don't know that she's not one of those half-mad people, apparently harmless, who are watched so slightly that they have full scope to indulge their little manias, their wild beast instincts. Nothing could be more treacherous than these creatures. Nothing could be more crafty, more patient, more persistent, 
more dangerous and at the same time more absurd and more logical, more slovenly and more methodical. All these epithets, Monsieur de Lortier, may be applied to the doings of the lady with the hatchet. The obsession of an idea and the continual repetition of an act are characteristics of the maniac. I do not yet know the idea by which the lady with the hatchet is obsessed, but I do know the act that results from it, and it is always the same. The victim is bound with precisely similar ropes. She is killed after the same number of days. She is struck by an identical blow, with the same instrument, in the same place, the middle of the forehead, producing an absolutely vertical wound. An ordinary murderer displays some variety. His trembling hand swerves aside and strikes awry. The lady with the hatchet does not tremble. It is as though she had taken measurements, and the edge of her weapon does not swerve by a hair's breadth. Need I give you any further proofs, or examine all the other details with you? Surely not. You now possess the key to the riddle, and you know as I do that only a lunatic can behave in this way, stupidly, savagely, mechanically, like a striking clock or the blade of the guillotine. M. de Lortier Vanneau nodded his head. Yes, that is so. One can see the whole affair from that angle, and I am beginning to believe that this is how one ought to see it. But if we admit that this madwoman has the sort of mathematical logic which governed the murders of the six victims, I see no connections between the victims themselves. She struck at random. Why this victim rather than that? Ah, said Renin, your excellency is asking me a question which I asked myself from the first moment, the question which sums up the whole problem and which cost me so much trouble to solve. Why Hortense Daniel rather than another? Among two millions of women who might have been selected, why Hortense? Why little Vernisset? Why Miss Williamson? If the affair is such as I conceived it, as a whole, that is to say, based upon the blind and fantastic logic of a madwoman, a choice was inevitably exercised. Now in what did that choice consist? What was the quality, or the defect, or the sign needed to induce the lady with the hatchet to strike? In a word, if she chose, and she must have chosen, what directed her choice? Have you found the answer? Renin paused and replied, Yes, Your Excellency, I have, and I could have found it at the very outset, since all that I had to do was to make a careful examination of the list of victims. But these flashes of truth are never kindled save in a brain overstimulated by effort and reflection. I stared at the list twenty times over before that little detail took a definite shape. I don't follow you, said Monsieur de Lortier Vanneau. Monsieur de Lortier, it may be noted that if a number of persons are brought together in any transaction, or crime, or public scandal, or what not, they are almost invariably described in the same way. On this occasion, the newspapers never mentioned anything more than their surnames in speaking of Madame Ladoux, Mademoiselle Ardin, or Mademoiselle Covreau. On the other hand, Mademoiselle Vernissen and Miss Williamson were always described by their Christian names as well. Honorine and Hermione. If the same thing had been done in the case of all the six victims, there would have been no mystery. Why not? Because we should at once have realized the relation existing between the six unfortunate women, as I myself suddenly realized it on comparing those two Christian names with that of Hortense Daniel. You understand now, don't you? You see the three Christian names before your eyes. Monsieur de Lortier Vanneau seemed to be perturbed. Turning a little pale, he said, What do you mean? What do you mean? I mean, continued Renin in a clear voice, sounding each syllable separately, I mean that you see before your eyes three Christian names which all three begin with the same initial, and which all three, by a remarkable coincidence, consist of the same number of letters, as you may prove. If you inquire at the Colbevoix Laundry, where Mademoiselle Covreau used to work, you will find that her name was Hilary. Here again we have the same initial and the same number of letters. There is no need to seek any farther. We are sure, are we not, that the Christian names of all the victims offer the same peculiarities. And this gives us, with absolute certainty, the key to the problem which was set us. It explains the madwoman's choice. We now know the connection between the unfortunate victims. 
there can be no mistake about it. It's that and nothing else. And how this method of choosing confirms my theory. What proof of madness! Why kill these women rather than any others? Because their names begin with an H and consist of eight letters. You understand me, Monsieur de Lortier, do you not? The number of letters is eight. The initial letter is the eighth letter of the alphabet, and the word vit, eight, begins with an H. Always the letter H, and the implement used to commit the crime was a hatchet. Is Your Excellency prepared to tell me that the lady with the hatchet is not a madwoman? Renin interrupted himself and went up to Monsieur de Lortier Vanneau. What's the matter, Your Excellency? Are you unwell? No, no, said Monsieur de Lortier, with the perspiration streaming down his forehead. No, but all oh, this story is so upsetting. Only think, I knew one of the victims, and then... Renin took a water bottle and tumbler from a small table, filled the glass, and handed it to Monsieur de Lortier, who sipped a few mouthfuls from it, and then, pulling himself together, continued in a voice which he strove to make firmer than it had been. Very well, we'll admit your supposition. Even so, it is necessary that it should lead to tangible results. What have you done? This morning I published in all the newspapers an advertisement worded as follows. Excellent cook seeks situation right before 5 p.m. to Hermigny, Boulevard Houseman, etc. You continue to follow me, don't you, Monsieur de Lortier? Christian names beginning with an H and consisting of eight letters are extremely rare, and all are rather out of date. Hermigny, Hilary, Hermione. Well, these Christian names, for reasons which I do not understand, are essential to the madwoman. She cannot do without them. To find women bearing one of these Christian names, and for this purpose only, she summons up all her remaining powers of reason, discernment, reflection, and intelligence. She hunts about, she asks questions, she lies in wait, she reads newspapers which she hardly understands, but in which certain details, certain capital letters, catch her eye. And consequently I did not doubt for a second that this name of Hermigny, printed in large type, would attract her attention, and that she would be caught today in the trap of my advertisement. Did she write? asked Monsieur de Lortier Vanneau anxiously. Several ladies, Renin continued, wrote the letters which are usual in such cases to offer a home to the so-called Hermigny, but I received an express letter which struck me as interesting. From whom? Read it, Monsieur de Lortier. M. de Lortier Vanneau snatched the sheet from Renin's hands and cast a glance at the signature. His first movement was one of surprise, as though he had expected something different. Then he gave a long, loud laugh of something like joy and relief. "'Why do you laugh, M. de Lortier? You seem pleased.' "'Pleased, no. But this letter is signed by my wife.' "'And you are afraid of finding something else?' "'Oh!' No, but since it's my wife. He did not finish his sentence and said to Renin, Come this way. He led him through a passage to a little drawing room where a fair haired lady, with a happy and tender expression on her comely face, was sitting in the midst of three children and helping them with their lessons. She rose. Monsieur de Lortier briefly presented his visitor and asked his wife, Suzanne, is this express message from you? To Mademoiselle Hermigny, Boulevard Houseman? Yes, she said. I sent it. As you know, our parlor maid's leaving, and I'm looking out for a new one. Venin interrupted her. Excuse me, madame. Just one question. Where did you get the woman's address? She flushed. Her husband insisted. Tell us, Suzanne, who gave you the address? I was rung up. By whom? She hesitated and then said, your old nurse. Felicienne? Yes. Monsieur de Lortier cut short the conversation and, without permitting Renin to ask any more questions, took him back to the study. You see, monsieur, that pneumatic letter came from a quite natural source. Felicienne, my old nurse, who lives not far from Paris on an allowance which I make her, read your advertisement and told Madame Lortier of it. <laughs> For, after all, he added, laughing, 
I don't suppose that you suspect my wife of being the lady with the hatchet. No. Then the incident is closed, at least on my side. I have done what I could. I have listened to your arguments, and I am very sorry that I can be of no more use to you. He drank another glass of water and sat down. His face was distorted. Renin looked at him for a few seconds, as a man will look at a failing adversary who has only to receive the knockout blow, and sitting down beside him, suddenly gripped his arm. "'Your Excellency, if you do not speak, Hortense Danielle will be the seventh victim.' "'I have nothing to say, monsieur. What do you think I know?' "'The truth. My explanations have made it plain to you. Your distress, your terror are positive proofs.' But after all, monsieur, if I knew, why should I be silent? For fear of scandal, there is in your life, so a profound intuition assures me, something that you are constrained to hide. The truth about this monstrous tragedy, which suddenly flashed upon you, this truth, if it were known, would spell dishonor to you, disgrace, and you are shrinking from your duty. Monsieur de Lortier did not reply. Renin leaned over him, and looking him in the eyes, whispered, there will be no scandal. I shall be the only person in the world to know what has happened, and I am as much interested as yourself in not attracting attention, because I love Hortense, Danielle, and do not wish her name to be mixed up in your horrible story. They remained face to face during a long interval. Renin's expression was harsh and unyielding. Monsieur de Lortier felt that nothing would bend him if the necessary words remained unspoken, but he could not bring himself to utter them. You are mistaken, he said. You think you have seen things that don't exist. Renin received a sudden and terrifying conviction that if this man took refuge in a stolid silence, there was no hope for Hortense Danielle, and he was so much infuriated by the thought that the key to the riddle lay there, within reach of his hand, that he clutched Monsieur de Lortier by the throat and forced him backwards. I'll have no more lies. A woman's life is at stake. Speak! and speak at once. If not... Monsieur de Lortier had no strength left in him. All resistance was impossible. It was not that Renin's attack alarmed him, or that he was yielding to this act of violence, but he felt crushed by that indomitable will, which seemed to admit no obstacle, and he stammered, y You're right. It is my duty to tell everything, whatever comes of it. Nothing will come of it. I pledge my word, on condition that you save Hortense Danielle. A moment's hesitation may undo us all. Speak. No details, but the actual facts. Madame de Lortier is not my wife. The only woman who has the right to bear my name is one whom I married when I was a young colonial officer. She was a rather eccentric woman, of feeble mentality, and incredibly subject to impulses that amounted to monomania. We had two children— twins, whom she worshipped, and in whose company she would no doubt have recovered her mental balance and moral health, when, by a stupid accident, a passing carriage, they were killed before her eyes. The poor thing went mad, with the silent secret of madness which you imagined. Some time afterwards, when I was appointed to an Algerian station, I brought her to France and put her in the charge of a worthy creature who had nursed me and brought me up. Two years later, I made the acquaintance of the woman who was to become the joy of my life. You saw her just now. She is the mother of my children, and she passes as my wife. Are we to sacrifice her? Is our whole existence to be shipwrecked in horror, and must our name be coupled with this tragedy of madness and blood? Renin thought for a moment and asked, What is the other one's name? Hermance. Hermance. Still that initial, still those eight letters. That was what made me realize everything just now, said Monsieur de Lortier. When you compared the different names, I at once reflected that my unhappy wife was called Hermance, and that she was mad, and all the proofs leapt to my mind. But though we understand the selection of the victims, how are we to explain the murders? What are the symptoms of her madness? Does she suffer at all? She does not suffer very much at present, but she has suffered in the past, the most terrible suffering that you can imagine, since the moment when her two children were run over before her eyes. Night and day she had the horrible spectacle of their death before her eyes, without a moment's interruption, 
for she never slept for a single second. Think of the torture of it, to see her children dying through all the hours of the long day and all the hours of the interminable night. Nevertheless, the nin objected, it is not to drive away that picture that she commits murder. Yes, possibly, said M. de Lortier thoughtfully, to drive it away by sleep. I don't understand. You don't understand because we are talking of a madwoman, and because all that happens in that disordered brain is necessarily incoherent and abnormal. Obviously, but all the same is your supposition based on facts that justify it. Yes, on facts which I had, in a way, overlooked, but which today assume their true significance. The first of these facts dates a few years back, to a morning when my old nurse for the first time found Hermance fast asleep. Now she was holding her hands clutched around a puppy which she had strangled, and the same thing was repeated on three other occasions. And she slept. Yes, each time she slept a sleep which lasted for several nights. And what conclusion did you draw? I concluded that the relaxation of the nerves provoked by taking life exhausted her and predisposed her for sleep. Lenin shuddered. Oh, that's it. There's not a doubt of it. The taking life, the effort of killing, makes her sleep. And she began with women, what had served her so well with animals. All her madness has become concentrated on that one point. She kills them to rob them of their sleep. She wanted sleep, and she steals the sleep of others. That's it, isn't it? For the past two years, she has been sleeping. For past two years she has been sleeping stammered m de lortier renin gripped him by the shoulder and it never occurred to you that her madness might go farther that she would stop at nothing to win the blessing of sleep let us make haste monsieur all oh, this is horrible they were both making for the door when m de lortier hesitated the telephone bell was ringing it's from there he said from where? Yes, my old nurse gives me the news at the same time every day. He unhooked the receivers and handed one to Renin, who whispered in his ear the questions which he was to put. Is that you, Felicien? How is she? Not so bad, sir. Is she sleeping well? Not very well lately. Last night, indeed, she never closed her eyes, so she's very gloomy just now. What is she doing at the moment? She is in her room. Go to her, Felicien, and don't leave her. I can't. She's locked herself in. You must, Felicien, break open the door. I'm coming straight on. Hello? Hello? Oh, damnation! They've cut us off. Without a word, the two men left the flat and ran down to the avenue. Renin hustled Monsieur de Lortier into the car. What address? Ville d'Avray. Of course, in the very center of her operations, like a spider in the middle of her web. Oh, the shame of it! He was profoundly agitated. He saw the whole adventure in its monstrous reality. Yes, she kills them to steal their sleep, as she used to kill the animals. It is the same obsession, but complicated by a whole array of utterly incomprehensible practices and superstitions. She evidently fancies that the similarity of the Christian names to her own is indispensable, and that she will not sleep unless her victim is an Hortense or an Honorine. It's a madwoman's argument. Its logic escapes us, and we know nothing of its origin, but we can't get away from it. She has to hunt and has to find, and she finds and carries off her prey beforehand, and watches over it for the appointed number of days, until the moment when, crazily, through the hole which she digs with a hatchet in the middle of the skull, she absorbs the sleep which stupefies her and grants her oblivion for a given period. And here again we see absurdity and madness. Why does she fix that period at so many days? Why should one victim ensure her a hundred and twenty days of sleep, and another a hundred and twenty-five? What insanity! The calculation is mysterious and, of course, mad. But the fact remains that, at the end of a hundred or a hundred and twenty-five days, as the case may be, a fresh victim is sacrificed, and there have been six already, and the seventh is awaiting her turn. Oh, monsieur, what a terrible responsibility for you! 
such a monster as that. She should never have been allowed out of sight. Monsieur de Lortier Vanneau made no protest. His air of dejection, his pallor, his trembling hands all proved his remorse and his despair. She deceived me, he murmured. She was outwardly so quiet, so docile. And after all, she's in a lunatic asylum. Then how can she... The asylum, explained Monsieur de Lortier, is made up of a number of separate buildings scattered over extensive grounds. The sort of cottage in which Armance lives stands quite apart. There is first a room occupied by Felicienne, then Armance's bedroom and two separate rooms, one of which has its windows overlooking the open country. I suppose it is there that she locks up her victims. But the carriage that conveys the dead bodies? The stables of the asylum are quite close to the cottage. There's a horse and carriage there for station work. Almost no doubt gets up at night, harnesses the horse, and slips the body through the window. And the nurse who watches her? Felicienne is very old and rather deaf. But by day she sees her mistress moving to and fro, doing this and that. Must we not admit a certain complicity? Never. Felicienne herself has been deceived by Armance's hypocrisy. All the same, it was she who telephoned to Madame de Lortier first about that advertisement. Very naturally, Hermance, who talks now and then, who argues, who buries herself in the newspapers, which she does not understand, you were saying just now, but reads through them attentively, must have seen the advertisement, and, having heard that we were looking for a servant, must have asked Felicienne to ring me up. Yes, yes, that is what I felt, said Renin slowly. She marks down her victims. With Hortense dead, she would have known, once she had used up her allowance of sleep, where to find an eighth victim. But how did she entice the unfortunate women? How did she entice Hortense? The car was rushing along, but not fast enough to please Renin, who rated the chauffeur. Push her along, Adolphe, can't you? We're losing time, my man. Suddenly the fear of arriving too late began to torture him. The logic of the insane is subject to sudden changes of mood, to any perilous idea that may enter the mind. The madwoman might easily mistake the date and hasten the catastrophe, like a clock out of order which strikes an hour too soon. On the other hand, as her sleep was once more disturbed, might she not be tempted to take action without waiting for the appointed moment? Was this not the reason why she had locked herself into her room? Heavens, what agonies her prisoner must be suffering! What shudders of terror at the executioner's least movement! Faster, Adolphe, or I'll take the wheel myself. Faster, hang it. At last they reached Ville d'Avray. There was a steep, sloping road on the right, and walls interrupted by a long railing. Drive round the grounds, Adolphe. We mustn't give warning of our presence, must we, Monsieur de Lortier? Where is the cottage? Just opposite, said Monsieur de Lortier Vanneau. They got out a little farther on. Renin began to run along a bank at the side of an ill-kept sunken road. It was almost dark. Monsieur de Lortier said, Here, this building standing a little way back. Look at that window on the ground floor. It belongs to one of the separate rooms. That is obviously how she slips out. But the window seems to be barred. Yes, and that is why no one suspected anything. But she must have found some way to get through. The ground floor was built over deep cellars. Renin quickly clambered up, finding a foothold on a projecting ledge of stone. Sure enough, one of the bars was missing. He pressed his face to the window pane and looked in. The room was dark inside. Nevertheless, he was able to distinguish at the back a woman seated beside another woman who was lying on a mattress. The woman seated was holding her forehead in her hands and gazing at the woman who was lying down. It's she whispered Monsieur de Lortier, who had also climbed the wall. The other one is bound. Renin took from his pocket a glazier's diamond and cut out one of the panes without making enough noise to arouse the madwoman's attention. He next slid his hand to the window fastening and turned it softly, while with his left hand he leveled a revolver. You're not going to fire, surely, Monsieur de Lortier Vanneau entreated. If I must, I shall. Renin pushed open the window gently, but there was an obstacle of which he was not aware, a chair which toppled over and fell. 
He leapt into the room and threw away his revolver in order to seize the madwoman. But she did not wait for him. She rushed to the door, opened it, and fled with a hoarse cry. Monsieur de Lortier made as though to run after her. "'What's the use?' said Renin, kneeling down. "'Let's save the victim first. He was instantly reassured. Hortense was alive. The first thing that he did was to cut the cords and remove the gag that was stifling her. Attracted by the noise, the old nurse had hastened to the room with a lamp, which Renin took from her, casting its light on Hortense. He was astounded, though livid and exhausted, with emaciated features and eyes blazing with fever, Hortense was trying to smile. She whispered, "'I was expecting you. I did not despair for a moment. I was sure of you.' She fainted. An hour later, after much useless searching around the cottage, they found the madwoman locked into a large cupboard in the loft. She had hanged herself. Hortense refused to stay another night. Besides, it was better that the cottage should be empty when the old nurse announced the madwoman's suicide. Renin gave Felicien minute directions as to what she should do and say, and then, assisted by the chauffeur and Monsieur de Lortier, carried Hortense to the car and brought her home. She was soon convalescent. Two days later, Renin carefully questioned her and asked her how she had come to know the madwoman. It was very simple, she said. My husband, who is not quite sane, as I have told you, is being looked after at Ville d'Avray, and I sometimes go to see him, without telling anybody I'd met. That was how I came to speak to that poor madwoman, and how the other day she made signs that she wanted me to visit her. We were alone. I went into the cottage. She threw herself upon me and overpowered me before I had time to cry for help. I thought it was a jest. And so it was, wasn't it? A mad woman's jest. She was quite gentle with me. All the same, she let me starve. But I was so sure of you. And weren't you frightened? Of starving? No. Besides, she gave me some food now and then, when the fancy took her. And then I was sure of you. Yes, but there was something else. That other peril. What other peril? she asked ingenuously. Renin gave a start. He suddenly understood. It seemed strange at first, though it was quite natural, that Hortense had not for a moment suspected, and did not yet suspect, the terrible danger which she had run. Her mind had not connected with her own adventure the murders committed by the lady with the hatchet. He thought that it would always be time enough to tell her the truth. For that matter, a few days later, her husband, who had been locked up for years, died in the asylum at Ville d'Avray, and Hortense, who had been recommended by her doctor a short period of rest and solitude, went to stay with a relation living near the village of Bassicourt, in the centre of France. End of chapter 6《Chapter Seven of the Eight Strokes of the Clock》This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《The Eight Strokes of the Clock by Maurice Leblanc》Chapter Seven — Footprints in the Snow To Prince Serge Renin, Boulevard Haussmann, Paris, La Roncière, near Bassicourt, 14 November My dear friend, you must be thinking me very ungrateful. I have been here three weeks, and you have not had one letter from me. Not a word of thanks, and yet I ended by realizing from what terrible death you saved me, and understanding the secret of that terrible business. But indeed, indeed, I couldn't help it. I was in such a state of prostration after it all. I needed rest and solitude so badly. Was I to stay in Paris? Was I to continue my expeditions with you? No, no, no. I had had enough adventures. Other peoples are very interesting, I admit. But when one is oneself the victim, and barely escapes with one's life, oh, my dear friend, how horrible it was! Shall I ever forget it? Here, at La Roncière, I enjoy the greatest peace. My old spinster cousin, Hermelin, pets and coddles me like an invalid. I am getting back my color and am very well, physically. So much so, in fact, that I no longer ever think of interesting myself in other people's business. Never again. For instance, I'm only telling you this because you are incorrigible, 
as inquisitive as any old charwoman, and always ready to busy yourself with things that don't concern you, yesterday I was present at a rather curious meeting. Antoinette had taken me to the inn at Bassicourt, where we were having tea in the public room among the peasants. It was market day, when the arrival of three people, two men and a woman, caused a sudden pause in the conversation. One of the men was a fat farmer in a long blouse, with a jovial red face, framed in white whiskers. The other was younger, was dressed in corduroy, and had lean, yellow, cross-grained features. Each of them carried a gun slung over his shoulder. Between them was a short, slender young woman, in a brown cloak and a fur cap, whose rather thin and extremely pale face was surprisingly delicate and distinguished-looking. "'Father, son, and daughter-in-law,' whispered my cousin. "'What? Can that charming creature be the wife of that clodhopper? "'And the daughter-in-law of Baron de Gaune? "'Is the old fellow over there a baron?' "'Yes, descended from a very ancient noble family, "'which used to own the chateau in the old days. "'He has always lived like a peasant, "'a great hunter, a great drinker, a great litigant, "'always at law with somebody, now very nearly ruined. "'His son Matthias was more ambitious "'and less attached to the soil and studied for the bar. "'Then he went to America. "'Next the lack of money brought him back to the village, "'whereupon he fell in love with a young girl in the nearest town.' The poor girl consented, no one knows why, to marry him, and for five years past she has been leading the life of a hermit, or rather of a prisoner, in a little manor-house close by, the manoir au puits, the well manor. "'With the father and the son?' I asked. "'No, the father lives at the far end of the village, on a lonely farm. "'And is Master Matthias jealous?' "'Perfect tiger.' "'Without reason?' Without reason, for Nathalie de Gaunt is the straightest woman in the world, and it is not her fault that a handsome young man has been hanging around the manor house for the past few months. However, the de Gaunts can't get over it. But the father neither. The handsome young man is the last descendant of the people who bought the chateau long ago. This explains old de Gaunt's hatred. Jérôme Vignal, I know him and am very fond of him, is a good-looking fellow and very well off and he has sworn to run off with Nathalie de Gaunt. It's the old man who says so, whenever he has had a drop too much. There, listen. The old chap was sitting among a group of men who were amusing themselves by making him drink and plying him with questions. He was already a little bit on, and was holding forth with a tone of indignation and a mocking smile which formed the most comic contrast. He's wasting his time, I tell you, the coxcomb. It's no manner of use his poaching round our way, making sheep size at the wench. The coverts are watched. If he comes too near, it means a bullet, eh, Matthias? He gripped his daughter-in-law's hand. <laughs> and then the little wench knows how to defend herself, too, he chuckled. Eh? You don't want any admirers, do you, Natalie? The young wife blushed in her confusion at being addressed in these terms, while her husband growled. You'd do better to hold your tongue, father. There are things one doesn't talk about in public. Things that affect one's honor are best settled in public, retorted the old one. Where I'm concerned, the honor of the Dagons comes before everything, and that fine spark with his Paris airs shan't. He stopped short. Before him stood a man who had just come in and who seemed to be waiting for him to finish his sentence. The newcomer was a tall, powerfully built young fellow, in riding kit, with a hunting crop in his hand. His strong and rather stern face was lighted up by a pair of fine eyes, in which shone an ironical smile. Jérôme whispered my cousin. The young man seemed not at all embarrassed. On seeing Nathalie, he made a low bow, and when Matthias de Gaunt took a step forward, he eyed him from head to foot, as though to say, Well, what about it? and his attitude was so haughty and contemptuous that the Dagons unslung their guns and took them in both hands, like sportsmen about to shoot. The son's expression was very fierce. Jérôme was quite unmoved by the threat. After a few seconds, turning to the innkeeper, he remarked, "'Oh, I say, I came to see old Vassar, but his shop is shut. Would you mind giving him the holster of my revolver? It wants a stitch or two.' He handed the holster to the innkeeper and added, laughing, 
<laughs> I'm keeping the revolver in case I need it. You never can tell. Then, still very calmly, he took a cigarette from a silver case, lit it, and walked out. We saw him through the window, vaulting on his horse and riding off at a slow trot. Old Dagon tossed off a glass of brandy, swearing most horribly. His son clapped his hand to the old man's mouth and forced him to sit down. Nathalie Dagon was weeping beside them. That's my story, dear friend. As you see, it's not tremendously interesting and does not deserve your attention. There's no mystery in it and no part for you to play. Indeed, I particularly insist that you should not seek a pretext for any untimely interference. Of course, I should be glad to see the poor thing protected. She appears to be a perfect martyr. But as I said before, let us leave other people to get out of their own troubles and go no farther with our little experiments. Renin finished reading the letter, read it over again, and ended by saying, That's it. Everything's right as right can be. She doesn't want to continue our little experiments because this would make the seventh and because she's afraid of the eighth which, under the terms of our agreement, has a very particular significance. She doesn't want to, and she does want to, without seeming to want to. He rubbed his hands. The letter was an invaluable witness to the influence which he had gradually, gently, and patiently gained over Hortense Daniel. It betrayed a rather complex feeling, composed of admiration, unbounded confidence, uneasiness at times, fear and almost terror, but also love. He was convinced of that. His companion in adventures, which she shared with a good fellowship that excluded any awkwardness between them, she had suddenly taken fright, and a sort of modesty mingled with a certain coquetry was impelling her to hold back. That very evening, Sunday, Renin took the train, and at break of day, after covering by diligence on a road white with snow, the five miles between the little town of Pompignat, where he alighted, and the village of Bassicourt, he learned that his journey might prove of some use. Three shots had been heard during the night in the direction of the Manoir au Puits. Three shots, Sergeant, I heard them as plainly as I see you standing before me, said a peasant whom the gendarmes were questioning in the parlour of the inn which Renin had entered. So did I, said the waiter. Three shots. It may have been twelve o'clock at night. The snow, which had been falling since nine, had stopped, and the shots sounded across the fields, one after the other, bang, bang, bang. Five more peasants gave their evidence. The sergeant and his men had heard nothing because the police station backed on the fields. But a farm laborer and a woman arrived who said that they were in Matthias de Gaulle's service, that they had been away for two days because of the intervening Sunday and that they had come straight from the manor house, where they were unable to obtain admission. The gate of the grounds is locked, sergeant, said the man. It's the first time I've known this to happen. Monsieur Matthias comes out to open it himself every morning at the stroke of six, winter and summer. Well, it's past eight now. I called and shouted. Nobody answered, so we came on here. You might have inquired at old Monsieur de Gons, said the sergeant. He lives on the high road. On oh, my word, so I might. I never thought of that. We'd better go there now, the sergeant decided. Two of his men went with him, as well as the peasants and the locksmith, whose services were called into requisition. Renin joined the party. Soon, at the end of the village, they reached Old Dagon's farmyard, which Renin recognized by Hortense's description of its position. The old fellow was harnessing his horse and trap, when they told him what had happened, he burst out laughing. <laughs> Three shots? Bang, bang, bang? Why, my dear sergeant, there are only two barrels to Matthias's gun. What about the locked gate? It means that the lad's asleep, that's all. Last night he came and cracked a bottle with me, perhaps two, or even three, and he'll be sleeping it off, I expect. He and Natalie. He climbed onto the box of his trap, an old cart with a patched tilt, and cracked his whip. Goodbye, gentlemen all. Those three shots of yours won't stop me from going to market at Pompignat, as I do every Monday. I've a couple of calves under the tilt, and they're just fit for the butcher. Good day to you. The others walked on. Renin went up to the sergeant and gave him his name. I'm a friend of Mademoiselle Hermelin of La Roncière. 
and as it's too early to call on her yet, I shall be glad if you'll allow me to go round by the manor with you. Mademoiselle Hermelin knows Madame de Gaume, and it will be a satisfaction to me to relieve her mind, for there's nothing wrong at the manor house, I hope. If there is, replied the sergeant, we shall read all about it as plainly as on a map, because of the snow. He was a likable young man, and seemed smart and intelligent. From the very first he had shown great acuteness in observing the tracks which Matthias had left behind him the evening before on returning home, tracks which soon became confused with the footprints made in going and coming by the farm laborer and the woman. Meanwhile they came to the walls of a property of which the locksmith readily opened the gate. From here onward a single trail appeared upon the spotless snow, that of Matthias, and it was easy to perceive that the son must have shared largely in the father's libations, as the line of footprints described sudden curves which made it swerve right up to the trees of the avenue. Two hundred yards farther stood the dilapidated two-storied building of the Manoir au Puy. The principal door was open. "'Let's go in,' said the sergeant, and the moment he had crossed the threshold he muttered, "'Oh, oh, old Dagon made a mistake in not coming.' They'd been fighting in here. The big room was in disorder. Two shattered chairs, the overturned table, and much broken glass and china bore a witness to the violence of the struggle. The tall clock, lying on the ground, had stopped at twenty past eleven. With the farm girl showing them the way, they ran up to the first floor. Neither Matthias nor his wife was there, but the door of their bedroom had been broken down with a hammer, which they discovered under the bed. Lenin and the sergeant went downstairs again. The living room had a passage communicating with the kitchen, which lay at the back of the house and opened on a small yard, fenced off from the orchard. At the end of this enclosure was a well near which one was bound to pass. Now from the door of the kitchen to the well, the snow, which was not very thick, had been pressed down to this side, and that as though a body had been dragged over it, and all around the well were tangled traces of trampling feet showing that the struggle must have been resumed at this spot. The sergeant again discovered Matthias's footprints, together with others which were shapelier and lighter. These latter went straight into the orchard by themselves, and thirty yards on, near the footprints, a revolver was picked up and recognized by one of the peasants as resembling that which Jérôme Vignal had produced in the inn two days before. The sergeant examined the cylinder. Three of the seven bullets had been fired. And so the tragedy was little by little reconstructed in its main outlines, and the sergeant, who had ordered everybody to stand aside and not to step on the site of the footprints, came back to the well, leaned over, put a few questions to the farm girl, and, going up to Renin, whispered, It all seems fairly clear to me. Renin took his arm. Let's speak out plainly, sergeant. I understand the business pretty well, for, as I told you, I know Mademoiselle Hermelin, who is a friend of Jérôme Vignal's, and also knows Madame de Gaume. Do you suppose? I don't want to suppose anything. I simply declare that someone came there last night. By which way? The only tracks of a person coming towards the manor are those of Monsieur de Gaume. That's because the other person arrived before the snowfall, that is to say, before nine o'clock. Then he must have hidden in a corner of the living room, and waited for the return of Monsieur de Gaulle, who came after the snow? Just so. As soon as Matthias came in, the man went for him. There was a fight. Matthias made his escape through the kitchen. The man ran after him to the well, and fired three revolver shots. And where's the body? Down the well? Renin protested. Oh, I say, aren't you taking a lot for granted? Why, sir, the snow's there to tell the story, and the snow plainly says that after the struggle, after the three shots, one man alone walked away and left the farm, one man only, and his footprints are not those of Matthias de Gaulle. Then where can Matthias de Gaulle be? But the well can be dragged. No, the well is practically bottomless. It is known all over the district and gives its name to the manor. So you really believe... I repeat what I said, before the snowfall, a single arrival, Matthias, and a single departure, the stranger. And Madame de Gaulle, was she too killed and thrown down the well like her husband? No, carried off. Carried off? 
remember that her bedroom was broken down with a hammer. Come, come, Sergeant, you yourself declare that there was only one departure, the stranger's. Stoop down, look at the man's footprints, see how they sink into the snow until they actually touch the ground. Those are the footprints of a man laden with a heavy burden. The stranger was carrying Madame de Gaulle on his shoulder. Then there's an outlet this way. Yes, a little door of which Matthias de Gaulle always had the key on him. The man must have taken it from him. A way out into the open fields? Yes, a road which joins the departmental highway three quarters of a mile from here. And do you know where? Where? At the corner of the chateau. Jérôme Vignal's chateau? By Jove, this is beginning to look serious. If the trail leads to the chateau and stops there, we shall know where we stand. The trail did continue to the chateau, as they were able to perceive after following it across the undulating fields on which the snow lay heaped in places. The approach to the main gates had been swept, but they saw that another trail, formed by the two wheels of a vehicle, was running in the opposite direction to the village. The sergeant rang the bell. The porter, who had also been sweeping the drive, came to the gates with a broom in his hand. In answer to a question, the man said that M. Vignal had gone away that morning before anyone else was up, and that he himself had harnessed the horse to the trap. In that case, said Renin, when they had moved away, all we have to do is to follow the tracks of the wheels. That will be no use, said the sergeant. They have taken the railway. At Pompigna Station, where I came from, but they would have passed through the village. They have gone just the other way, because it leads to the town where the express trains stop. The procurator general has an office in the town. I'll telephone, and as there's no train before eleven o'clock, all that they need do is to keep watch at the station. I think you're doing the right thing, Sergeant, said Renan, and I congratulate you on the way in which you have carried out your investigation. They parted. Renin went back to the inn in the village and sent a note to Hortense Daniel by hand. My very dear friend, I seem to gather from your letter that, touched as always by anything that concerns the heart, you were anxious to protect the love affair of Jérôme and Nathalie. Now there is every reason to suppose that these two, without consulting their fair protectress, have run away after throwing Matthias de Gaulle down a well. Forgive me for not coming to see you. The whole thing is extremely obscure, and if I were with you, I should not have the detachment of mind which is needed to think the case over. It was then half-past ten. Renin went for a walk into the country, with his hands clasped behind his back, and without vouchsafing a glance at the exquisite spectacle of the white meadows. He came back for lunch, still absorbed in his thoughts, and indifferent to the talk of the customers of the inn, who on all sides were discussing recent events. He went up to his room and had been asleep some time when he was awakened by a tapping at the door. He got up and opened it. "'Is it you? Is it you?' he whispered. Hortense and he stood gazing at each other for some seconds in silence, holding each other's hands as though nothing, no irrelevant thought and no utterance, must be allowed to interfere with the joy of their meeting. Then he asked, "'Was I right in coming?' "'Yes,' she said gently. "'I expected you. "'Perhaps it would have been better if you had sent for me sooner, instead of waiting. "'Events did not wait, you see, and I don't quite know what's to become of Jérôme Vignal and Nathalie de Gaulle.' "'What, haven't you heard?' she said quickly. "'They've been arrested. They were going to travel by the express.' "'Arrested? No!' Renin objected. People are not arrested like that. They have to be questioned first. That's what's being done now. The authorities are making a search. Where? At the chateau. And as they are innocent, for they are innocent, aren't they? You don't admit that they are guilty any more than I do. He replied, I admit nothing. I can admit nothing, my dear. Nevertheless, I am bound to say that everything is against them, except one fact which is that everything is too much against them. It is not normal for so many proofs to be heaped up one on top of the other, and for the man who commits a murder to tell his story so frankly. Apart from this, there is nothing but mystery and discrepancy. Well? Well, I am greatly puzzled. But you have a plan? Not at all, so far. 
Oh, I can see him, Jérôme Vignal, and her, Nathalie de Gaume, and hear them and know what they are saying in their own defense. But you can understand that I shan't be permitted either to ask them any questions or to be present at their examination. Besides, it must be finished by this time. It's finished at the chateau, she said, but it's going to be continued at the manor house. Are they taking them to the manor house? he asked eagerly. Yes, at least judging by what was said to the chauffeur of one of the procurator's two cars. Oh, in that case, exclaimed Renin, the thing's done. The manor house. Why, we shall be in the front row of the stalls. We shall see and hear everything. And as a word, a tone of the voice, a quiver of the eyelids will be enough to give me the tiny clue I need. We may entertain some hope. Come along. He took her by the direct route which he had followed that morning, leading to the gate which the locksmith had opened. The gendarme on duty at the manor house had made a passage through the snow, beside the line of footprints and around the house. Chance enabled Renin and Hortense to approach unseen and through a side window to enter a corridor near a back staircase. A few steps up was a little chamber which received its only light through a sort of bull's-eye from the large room on the ground floor. Renin, during the morning visit, had noticed the bull's-eye, which was covered on the inside with a piece of cloth. He removed the cloth and cut out one of the panes. A few minutes later, a sound of voices rose from the other side of the house, no doubt near the well. The sound grew more distinct. A number of people flocked into the house. Some of them went upstairs to the first floor, while the sergeant arrived with a young man, of whom Renin and Hortense were able to distinguish only the tall figure. Jérôme Vignal, said she. Yes, said Renin, they are examining Madame de Gaulle first upstairs in her bedroom. A quarter of an hour passed. Then the persons on the first floor came downstairs and went in. They were the procurator's deputy, his clerk, a commissary of police, and two detectives. Madame de Gaulle was shown in, and the deputy asked Jérôme Vignal to step forward. Jérôme Vignal's face was certainly that of the strong man whom Hortense had depicted in her letter. He displayed no uneasiness, but rather decision and a resolute will. Nathalie, who was short and very slight, but a feverish light in her eyes, nevertheless produced the same impression of quiet confidence. The deputy, who was examining the disordered furniture and the traces of the struggle, invited her to sit down and said to Jérôme, "'Monsieur, I have not asked you many questions so far. This is a summary inquiry which I am conducting in your presence, and which will be continued later by the examining magistrate, and I wished above all to explain to you the very serious reasons for which I asked you to interrupt your journey and to come back here with Madame de Gaulle. You are now in a position to refute the truly distressing charges that are hanging over you. I therefore ask you to tell me the exact truth. Mr. Deputy, replied Jérôme, the charges in question trouble me very little. The truth for which you are asking will defeat all the lies which chance has accumulated against me. It is this. He reflected for an instant, and then, in clear, frank tones, said, I love Madame de Gaulle. The first time I met her, I conceived the greatest sympathy and admiration for her, but my affection has always been directed by the sole thought of her happiness. I love her, but I respect her even more. Madame de Gaulle must have told you, and I tell you again, that she and I exchanged our first few words last night. He continued in a lower voice, I respect her the more inasmuch as she is exceedingly unhappy. All the world knows that every minute of her life was a martyrdom. Her husband persecuted her with ferocious hatred and frantic jealousy. Ask the servants. They will tell you of the long suffering of Nathalie de Gaulle, of the blows which she received and the insults which she had to endure. I tried to stop this torture by restoring to the rights of appeal which the merest stranger may claim when unhappiness and injustice pass a certain limit. I went three times to old Dagon and begged him to interfere, but I found in him an almost equal hatred towards his daughter-in-law, the hatred which many people feel for anything beautiful and noble. At last I resolved on direct action, and last night I took a step with regard to Matthias Dagon which was a little unusual, I admit, but which seemed likely to succeed, considering the man's character. I swear, Mr. Deputy, that I had no other intention than to talk to Matthias de Gaulle. Knowing certain particulars of his life, 
which enabled me to bring effective pressure to bear upon him, I wished to make use of this advantage in order to achieve my purpose. If things turned out differently, I am not wholly to blame. So I went there a little before nine o'clock. The servants I knew were out. He opened the door himself. He was alone. Monsieur, said the deputy, interrupting him, you are saying something, as Madame de Gaunt, for that matter, did just now, which is manifestly opposed to the truth. Matthias de Gaunt did not come home last night until eleven o'clock. We have two definite proofs of this, his father's evidence and the prints of his feet in the snow, which fell from a quarter past nine o'clock to eleven. Mr. Deputy, Jérôme Vignol declared, without heeding the bad effect which his obstinacy was producing, I am relating things as they were and not as they may be interpreted. But to continue, that clock marked ten minutes to nine when I entered this room. Monsieur de Gaunt, believing that he was about to be attacked, had taken down his gun. I placed my revolver on the table, out of reach of my hand, and sat down. I want to speak to you, monsieur, I said. Please listen to me. He did not stir and did not utter a single syllable. So I spoke, and straightway, crudely, without any previous explanations which might have softened the bluntness of my proposal, I spoke the few words which I had prepared beforehand. I have spent some months, monsieur, I said, in making careful inquiries into your financial position. You have mortgaged every foot of your land. You have signed bills which will shortly be falling due, and which it will be absolutely impossible for you to honour. You have nothing to hope for from your father, whose own affairs are in a very bad condition. So you are ruined. I have come to save you. He watched me, still without speaking, and sat down, which I took to mean that my suggestion was not entirely displeasing. Then I took a sheaf of banknotes from my pocket, placed it before him, and continued. Here is sixty thousand francs, monsieur. I will buy the manoir au puits, its lands and dependencies, and take over the mortgages. The sum named is exactly twice what they are worth. I saw his eyes glittering. He asked my conditions. Only one, I said, that you go to America. Mr. Deputy, we sat discussing for two hours. It was not that my offer roused his indignation. I should not have risked it if I had not known with whom I was dealing. But he wanted more, and haggled greedily, though he refrained from mentioning the name of Madame de Gaunt, to whom I myself had not once alluded. We might have been two men engaged in a dispute, and seeking an agreement on common ground, whereas it was the happiness and the whole destiny of a woman that were at stake. At last, weary of the discussion, I accepted a compromise, and we came to terms, which I resolved to make definite then and there. Two letters were exchanged between us, one in which he made the manoir au puits over to me for the sum which I had paid him, and one which he pocketed immediately, by which I was to send him as much more in America on the day on which the decree of divorce was pronounced. So the affair was settled. I am sure that at that moment he was accepting in good faith. He looked upon me less as an enemy and a rival than as a man who was doing him a service. He even went so far as to give me the key of the little door which opens on the fields, so that I might go home by the shortcut. Unfortunately, while I was picking up my cap and greatcoat, I made the mistake of leaving on the table the letter of sale which he had signed. In a moment Matthias de Gaunt had seen the advantage which he could take of my slip. He could keep his property, keep his wife, and keep the money. Quick as lightning he tucked away the paper, hit me over the head with the butt end of his gun, threw the gun on the floor, and seized me by the throat with both hands. He had reckoned without his host. I was the stronger of the two, and after a sharp but short struggle, I mastered him and tied him up with a cord which I found lying in a corner. Mr. Deputy, if my enemy's resolve was sudden, mine was no less so. Since, when all was said, he had accepted the bargain, I would force him to keep it, at least in so far as I was interested. A very few steps brought me to the first floor. I had not a doubt that Madame de Gaunt was there, and had heard the sound of our discussion. Switching on the light of my pocket torch, I looked into three bedrooms. The fourth was locked. I knocked at the door. There was no reply. But this was one of the moments in which a man allows no obstacle to stand in his way. I had seen a hammer in one of the rooms. I picked it up and smashed in the door. Yes, Nathalie was lying there on the floor, in a dead faint. I took her in my arms, carried her downstairs, and went through the kitchen. On seeing the snow outside, 
I at once realized that my footprints would be easily traced. But what did it matter? Was there any reason why I should put Matthias de Gorne off the scent? Not at all. With the sixty thousand francs in his possession, as well as the paper in which I undertook to pay him a like sum on the day of his divorce, to say nothing of his house and land, he would soon go away, leaving Nathalie de Gorne to me. Nothing was changed between us except one thing. Instead of awaiting his good pleasure, I had at once seized the precious pledge which I coveted. What I feared, therefore, was not so much any subsequent attack on the part of Matthias de Gorne, but rather the indignant reproaches of his wife. What would she say when she realized that she was a prisoner in my hands? The reasons why I escaped reproach, Madame de Gorne has, I believe, had the frankness to tell you. Love calls forth love. That night in my house, broken by emotion, she confessed her feeling for me. She loved me as I loved her. Our destinies were henceforth mingled. She and I set out at five o'clock this morning, not foreseeing for an instant that we were amenable to the law. Jérôme Vignol's story was finished. He had told it straight off the reel, like a story learnt by heart and incapable of revision in any detail. There was a brief pause, during which Hortense whispered, "'It all sounds quite possible, and in any case very logical.' "'There are the objections to come,' said Renin. "'Wait till you hear them. They are very serious. There's one in particular.' The deputy procurator stated it at once. And what became of Monsieur de Gorne in all this? Matthias de Gorne? asked Jerome. Yes, you have related with an accent of great sincerity a series of facts which I am quite willing to admit. Unfortunately, you have forgotten a point of the first importance. What became of Matthias de Gorne? You tied him up here in this room. Well, this morning he was gone. Of of course, Mr. Deputy, Matthias de Gorne accepted the bargain in the end, and went away. By what road? No doubt by the road that leads to his father's house. Where are his footprints? The expanse of snow is an impartial witness. After your fight with him, we see you on the snow moving away. Why don't we see him? He came and did not go away again. Where is he? There is not a trace of him. Or rather... The deputy lowered his voice. Or rather, yes, there are some traces on the way to the well and around the well, traces which prove that the last struggle of all took place there, and after that there is nothing, not a thing. Jérôme shrugged his shoulders. You have already mentioned this, Mr. Deputy, and it implies a charge of homicide against me. I have nothing to say to it. Have you anything to say to the fact that your revolver was picked up within fifteen yards of the well? No. Or to the strange coincidence between the three shots heard in the night and the three cartridges missing from your revolver? No, Mr. Deputy, there was not, as you believe, a last struggle by the well, because I left Monsieur de Gaunt tied up in this room, and because I also left my revolver here. On the other hand, if shots were heard, they were not fired by me. A casual coincidence, therefore. That's a matter for the police to explain. My only duty is to tell the truth, and you are not entitled to ask more of me. And if that truth conflicts with the facts observed? It means that the facts are wrong, Mr. Deputy. As you please. But until the day when the police are able to make them agree with your statements, you will understand that I am obliged to keep you under arrest. And Madame de Gaulle? asked Jérôme, greatly distressed. The deputy did not reply. He exchanged a few words with the commissary of police, and then, beckoning to a detective, ordered him to bring up one of the two motor-cars. Then he turned to Nathalie. Madame, you have heard Monsieur Vignal's evidence. It agrees word for word with your own. Monsieur Vignal declares in particular that you had fainted when he carried you away. But did you remain unconscious all the way? It seemed as though Jérôme's composure had increased Madame de Gaulle's assurance. She replied, I did not come to, monsieur, until I was at the chateau. That's most extraordinary. Didn't you hear the three shots which were heard by almost everyone in the village? I did not. And did you see nothing of what happened beside the well? Nothing did happen. Monsieur Vignal has told you so. Then what has become of your husband? I don't know. Come, madame, you really must assist the officers of the law, and at least tell us what you think. Do you believe that there may have been an accident, and that possibly Monsieur de Gaulle, 
who had been to see his father and had more to drink than usual, lost his balance and fell into the well. When my husband came back from seeing his father, he was not in the least intoxicated. His father, however, has stated that he was. His father and he had drunk two or three bottles of wine. His father is not telling the truth. But the snow tells the truth, madame, said the deputy irritably, and the line of his footprints wavers from side to side. My husband came in at half-past eight, monsieur, before the snow had begun to fall. The deputy struck the table with his fist. But really, madame, you're going right against the evidence. That sheet of snow cannot speak false. I may accept your denial of matters that cannot be verified, but these footprints in the snow, in the snow. He controlled himself. The motor-car drew up outside the windows. Forming a sudden resolve, he said to Nathalie, "'You will be good enough to hold yourself at the disposal of the authorities, madame, and to remain here, in the manor-house,' and he made a sign to the sergeant to remove Jérôme Vignal in the car. The game was lost for the two lovers. Barely united, they had to separate and fight, far away from each other, against the most grievous accusations. Jérôme took a step towards Nathalie. They exchanged a long, sorrowful look. Then he bowed to her and walked to the door in the wake of the sergeant of gendarmes. Halt! cried a voice. Sergeant, right about. Turn. Jérôme Vignal, stay where you are. The ruffled deputy raised his head, as did the other people present. The voice came from the ceiling. The bull's-eye window had opened, and Renin, leaning through it, was waving his arms. I wish to be heard. I have several remarks to make, especially in respect of the zigzag footprints. It all lies in that. Matthias had not been drinking. He had turned round and put his two legs through the opening, saying to Hortense, who tried to prevent him, Don't move. No one will disturb you. And releasing his hold, he dropped into the room. The deputy appeared dumbfounded. But really, monsieur, who are you? Where do you come from? Renin brushed the dust from his clothes and replied, Excuse me, Mr. Deputy, I ought to have come the same as everybody else, but I was in a hurry. Besides, if I had come in by the door instead of falling from the ceiling, my words would not have made the same impression. The infuriated deputy advanced to meet him. Who are you? Prince Renin. I was with the sergeant this morning when he was pursuing his investigations, wasn't I, sergeant? Since then I have been hunting about for information. That's why, wishing to be present at the hearing, I found a corner in a little private room. You were there? You had the audacity! One must needs be audacious when the truth's at stake. If I had not been there, I should not have discovered just the one little clue which I missed. I should not have known that Matthias de Gaunt was not the least bit drunk. Now that's the key to the riddle. When we know that, we know the solution. The deputy found himself in a rather ridiculous position. Since he had failed to take the necessary precautions to ensure the secrecy of his inquiry, it was difficult for him to take any steps against this interloper. He growled, Let's have done with this. What are you asking? A few minutes of your kind attention. And with what object? to establish the innocence of Monsieur Vignal and Madame de Gaunt. He was wearing that calm air, that sort of indifferent look which was peculiar to him in moments of action when the crisis of the drama depended solely upon himself. Hortense felt a thrill pass through her, and at once became full of confidence. They're saved, she thought, with sudden emotion. I asked him to protect that young creature, and he is saving her from prison and despair. Jérôme and Nathalie must have experienced the same impression of sudden hope, for they had drawn nearer to each other, as though this stranger, descended from the clouds, had already given them the right to clasp hands. The deputy shrugged his shoulders. The prosecution will have every means, when the time comes, of establishing their innocence for itself. You will be called. It would be better to establish it here and now. Any delay might lead to grievous consequences. I happen to be in a hurry. Two or three minutes will do. Two or three minutes to explain a case like this? No longer, I assure you. Are you as certain of it as all that? I am now. I have been thinking hard since this morning. The deputy realized that this was one of those gentry who stick to you like a leech, and that there was nothing for it but to submit. 
In a rather bantering tone, he asked, Does your thinking enable you to tell us the exact spot where Monsieur Mathias de Gaulle is at this moment? Renin took out his watch and answered, In Paris, Mr. Deputy. In Paris? Alive, then? Alive, and, what is more, in the pink of hell. I am delighted to hear it. But then what's the meaning of the footprints around the well, and the presence of that revolver in those three shots? Simply camouflage. Oh, really? Camouflage contrived by whom? By Matthias de Gaulle himself. That's curious. And with what object? With the object of passing himself off for dead, and of arranging subsequent matters in such a way that Monsieur Vignat was bound to be accused of the death, the murder. An ingenious theory, the deputy agreed, still in a satirical tone. What do you think of it, Monsieur Vignal? It is a theory which flashed through my own mind, Mr. Deputy, replied Jérôme. It is quite likely that, after our struggle and after I had gone, Matthias de Gaulle conceived a new plan by which, this time, his hatred would be fully gratified. He both loved and detested his wife. He held me in the greatest loathing. This must be his revenge. His revenge would cost him dear, considering that, according to your statement, Matthias de Gaulle was to receive a second sum of sixty thousand francs from you. He would receive that sum in another quarter, Mr. Deputy. My examination of the financial position of the de Gaulle family revealed to me the fact that the father and son had taken out a life insurance policy in each other's favor. With the son dead, or passing for dead, the father would receive the insurance money and indemnify his son. You mean to say, asked the deputy with a smile, that in all this camouflage, as you call it, Monsieur de Gaulle, the elder, would act as his son's accomplice? Renin took up the challenge. Just so, Mr. Deputy, the father and son are accomplices. Then we shall find the son at the father's. You would have found him there last night. What became of him? He took the train at Pompignan. That's a mere supposition. No, a certainty. A moral certainty, perhaps, but you'll admit there's not the slightest proof. The deputy did not wait for a reply. He considered that he had displayed an excess of good will, and that patience has its limits, and he put an end to the interview. Not the slightest proof, he repeated, taking up his hat. And above all, above all, there's nothing in what you've said that can contradict in the very least the evidence of that relentless witness, the snow. To go to his father, Matthias de Gaulle must have left this house. Which way did he go? Hang it all, Monsieur Vignal told you, by the road which leads from here to his father's. There are no tracks in the snow. Yes, there are. But they show him coming here and not going away from here. It's the same thing. What? Of course it is. There's more than one way of walking. One doesn't always go ahead by following one's nose. In what other way can one go ahead? By walking backwards, Mr. Deputy. These few words, spoken very simply, but in a clear tone which gave full value to every syllable, produced a profound silence. Those present at once grasped their extreme significance, and by adapting it to the actual happenings, perceived in a flash the impenetrable truth, which suddenly appeared to be the most natural thing in the world. Renin continued his argument. Stepping backwards in the direction of the window, he said, If I want to get to that window, I can, of course, walk straight up to it, but I can just as easily turn my back to it and walk that way. In either case, I reach my goal. And he at once proceeded in a vigorous tone, Here's the gist of it all. At half-past eight, before the snow fell, Monsieur de Gaulle comes home from his father's house. Monsieur Vignal arrives twenty minutes later. There is a long discussion and a struggle, taking up three hours in all. It is then, after Monsieur Vignal has carried off Madame de Gaulle and made his escape, that Matthias de Gaulle, foaming at the mouth, wild with rage, but suddenly seeing his chance of taking the most terrible revenge, hits upon the ingenious idea of using against his enemy the very snowfall upon whose evidence you are now relying. He therefore plans his own murder, or rather the appearance of his murder, and of his fall to the bottom of the well, and makes off backwards, step by step, thus recording his arrival instead of his departure on the white page. The deputy sneered no longer. 
this eccentric intruder suddenly appeared to him in the light of a person worthy of attention whom it would not do to make fun of he asked and how could he have left his father's house in a trap quite simply who drove it the father this morning the sergeant and i saw the trap and spoke to the father who was going to market as usual the sun was hidden under the tilt he took the train at pompignat and is in paris by now Renin's explanation, as promised, had taken hardly five minutes. He had based it solely on logic and the probabilities of the case, and yet not a jot was left of the distressing mystery in which they were floundering. The darkness was dispelled, the whole truth appeared. Madame de Gaunt wept for joy, and Jérôme Vignard thanked the good genius who was changing the course of events with a stroke of his magic wand. "'Shall we examine those footprints together, Mr. Deputy?' asked Renin. Do you mind? The mistake which the sergeant and I made this morning was to investigate only the footprints left by the alleged murderer and to neglect Matthias de Gaunt's. Why, indeed, should they have attracted our attention? Yet it was precisely there that the crux of the whole affair was to be found. They stepped into the orchard and went to the well. It did not need a long examination to observe that many of the footprints were awkward, hesitating, too deeply sunk at the heel and toe, and differing from one another in the angle at which the feet were turned. This clumsiness was unavoidable, said Renin. Matthias de Gaunt would have needed a regular apprenticeship before his backward progress could have equaled his ordinary gait, and both his father and he must have been aware of this, at least as regards the zigzags which you see here, since old de Gaunt went out of his way to tell the sergeant that his son had had too much drink. And he added, indeed it was the detection of this falsehood that suddenly enlightened me. When Madame de Gaunt stated that her husband was not drunk, I thought of the footprints and guessed the truth. The deputy frankly accepted his part in the matter and began to laugh. <laughs> well, there's nothing left for it but to send detectives after the bogus corpse. On what grounds, Mr. Deputy? asked Renin. Matthias de Gaunt has committed no offence against the law. There's nothing criminal in trampling the soil around a well, in shifting the position of a revolver that doesn't belong to you, in firing three shots, or in walking backwards to one's father's house. What can we ask of him? The sixty thousand francs? I presume that this is not M. Vignal's intention, and that he does not mean to bring a charge against him. Certainly not, said Jérôme. Well, what then? The insurance policy in favor of the survivor? but there would be no misdemeanor unless the father claimed payment, and I should be greatly surprised if he did. Hello, here the old chap is. You'll soon know all about it. Old de Gaunt was coming along, gesticulating as he walked. His easy-going features were screwed up to express sorrow and anger. Where's my son? he cried. It seems the brutes killed him. My poor Matthias dead. Oh, that scoundrel of a vignal! and he shook his fist at Jérôme. The deputy said bluntly, A word with you, Monsieur de Gaunt. Do you intend to claim your rights under a certain insurance policy? Well, what do you think? said the old man, off his guard. The fact is, your son's not dead. People are even saying that you were a partner in his little schemes, and that you stuffed him under the tilt of your trap and drove him to the station. The old fellow spat on the ground, stretched out his hand as though he were going to take a solemn oath, stood for an instant without moving, and then, suddenly, changing his mind and his tactics with ingenious cynicism, he relaxed his features, assumed a conciliatory attitude, and burst out laughing. <laughs> that blackguard Matthias! So he tried to pass himself off as dead? <laughs> what a rascal! and he reckoned on me to collect the insurance money and send it on to him, as if I should be capable of such a low, dirty trick. You don't know me, my boy. And without waiting for more, shaking with merriment like a jolly old fellow amused with a funny story, he took his departure, not forgetting, however, to set his great hobnail boots on each of the compromising footprints which his son had left behind him. Later, when Renin went back to the manor to let Hortense out, he found that she had disappeared. He called and asked for her at her cousin Hermelin's. Hortense sent down word, asking him to excuse her. She was feeling a little tired and was lying down. Capital, thought Renin. Capital. She avoids me. 
Therefore, she loves me. The end is not far off. End of chapter 7、Paris, 30 November. My dearest friend, there has been no letter from you for a fortnight, so I don't expect now to receive one for that troublesome date of the 5th of December, which we fixed as the last day of our partnership. I rather wish it would come, because you will then be released from a contract which no longer seems to give you pleasure. To me, the seven battles which we fought and won together were a time of endless delight and enthusiasm. I was living beside you. I was conscious of all the good which that more active and stirring existence was doing you. My happiness was so great that I dared not speak of it to you or let you see anything of my secret feelings. Except my desire to please you and my passionate devotion. Today you have had enough of your brother in arms. Your will shall be law. But though I bow to your decree, may I remind you what it was that I always believed our final adventure would be? May I repeat your words, not one of which I have forgotten? I demand, you said, that you shall restore to me a small antique clasp. Made of a cornelian set in a filigree mount. It came to me from my mother, and every one knew that it used to bring her happiness, and me too. Since the day when it vanished from my jewel case, I have had nothing but unhappiness. Restore it to me, my good genius. And when I asked you when the clasp had disappeared, you answered with a laugh Seven years ago, or eight, or nine. I don't know exactly. I don't know when. I don't know how. I know nothing about it. You were challenging me, were you not? And you set me that condition because it was one which I could not fulfill. Nevertheless, I promised, and I should like to keep my promise. What I have tried to do in order to place life before you in a more favorable light would seem purposeless if your confidence feels the lack of this talisman to which you attach so great a value. We must not laugh at these little superstitions. They are often the mainspring of our best actions. Dear friend, if you had helped me, I should have achieved yet one more victory. Alone and hard pushed by the proximity of the date, I have failed, not, however, without placing things on such a footing that the undertaking, if you care to follow it up, has the greatest chance of success. And you will follow it up, won't you? We have entered into a mutual agreement which we are bound to honor. It behooves us within a fixed time. To inscribe in the book of our common life eight good stories, to which we shall have brought energy, logic, perseverance, some subtlety, and occasionally a little heroism. This is the eighth of them. It is for you to act so that it may be written in its proper place on the 5th of December, before the clock strikes eight in the evening. And on that day you will act as I shall now tell you. First of all, and above all, my dear, Do not complain that my instructions are fanciful. Each of them is an indispensable condition of success. First of all, cut in your cousin's garden three slender lengths of rush. Plat them together and bind up the two ends so as to make a rude switch, like a child's whiplash. When you get to Paris, buy a long necklace of jet beads, cut into facets, and shorten it so that it consists of seventy five beads of almost equal size. Under your winter cloak, wear a blue woolen gown. On your head, a toque with red leaves on it. Round your neck, a feather boa. No gloves, no rings. In the afternoon, take a cab along the left bank of the river to the church of St. Etienne du Mont. At four o'clock exactly, there will be, near the holy water basin, just inside the church, an old woman dressed in black, saying her prayers on a silver rosary. She will offer you holy water. Give her your necklace. She will count the beads and hand it back to you. After this, you will walk behind her, you will cross an arm of the Seine, and she will lead you down a lonely street in the Ile Saint Louis to a house which you will enter by yourself. 
On the ground floor of this house you will find a youngish man with a very pasty complexion. Take off your cloak and then say to him, I have come to fetch my clasp. Do not be astonished by his agitation or dismay. Keep calm in his presence. If he questions you, if he wants to know your reason for applying to him or what impels you to make that request, give him no explanation. Your replies must be confined to these brief formulas. I have come to fetch what belongs to me. I don't know you, I don't know your name, but I am obliged to come to you like this. I must have my clasp returned to me. I must. I honestly believe that if you have the firmness not to swerve from that attitude, whatever farce the man may play, you will be completely successful. But the contest must be a short one, and the issue will depend solely on your confidence in yourself and your certainty of success. It will be a sort of match in which you must defeat your opponent in the first round. If you remain impassive, you will win. If you show hesitation or uneasiness, you can do nothing against him. He will escape you and regain the upper hand after a first moment of distress, and the game will be lost in a few minutes. There is no midway house between victory or defeat. In the latter event, you would be obliged, I beg you to pardon me for saying so, again to accept my collaboration. I offer it you in advance, my dear, and without any conditions, while stating quite plainly that all that I have been able to do for you, and all that I may yet do, gives me no other right than that of thanking you and devoting myself more than ever to the woman who represents my joy, my whole life. Hortense, after reading the letter, folded it up and put it away at the back of a drawer, saying in a resolute voice, I shan't go. To begin with, although she had formerly attached some slight importance to this trinket, which she had regarded as a mascot, she felt very little interest in it now that the period of her trials was apparently at an end. She could not forget that figure eight, which was the serial number of the next adventure. To launch herself upon it meant taking up the interrupted chain, going back to Renin, and giving him a pledge which, with his powers of suggestion, he would know how to turn to account. Two days before the 5th of December, she was still in the same frame of mind. So she was on the morning of the 4th. But suddenly, without even having to contend against preliminary subterfuges, she ran out into the garden, cut three lengths of rush, plaited them as she used to do in her childhood, and at twelve o'clock had herself driven to the station. She was uplifted by an eager curiosity. She was unable to resist all the amusing and novel sensations which the adventure proposed by Venin promised her. It was really too tempting. The jet necklace, the toque with the autumn leaves, the old woman with the silver rosary, how could she resist their mysterious appeal, and how could she refuse this opportunity of showing Renin what she was capable of doing? <laughs> and then after all, she said to herself, laughing, he's summoning me to Paris. Now eight o'clock is dangerous to me, at a spot three hundred miles from Paris, in that old deserted Chateau d'Alingre, but nowhere else. The only clock that can strike the threatening hour is down there, under lock and key, a prisoner. She reached Paris that evening. On the morning of the 5th, she went out and bought a jet necklace, which she reduced to seventy-five beads, put on a blue gown and a toque with red leaves, and at four o'clock precisely entered the church of saint Etienne du mont Her heart was throbbing violently. This time she was alone, and how acutely she now felt the strength of that support which, from unreflecting fear rather than any reasonable motive, she had thrust aside. She looked around her, almost hoping to see him, but there was no one there, no one except an old lady in black, standing beside the holy water basin. Hortense went up to her. The old lady, who held a silver rosary in her hands, offered her holy water, and then began to count the beads of the necklace which Hortense gave her. She whispered, Seventy-five. That's right. Come. Without another word, she toddled along under the light of the street lamps, crossed the Pont des Tournelles to the Ile Saint-Louis, and went down an empty street leading to a crossroads, where she stopped in front of an old house with wrought iron balconies. Go in, she said. And the old lady went away. 
Hortense now saw a prosperous-looking shop which occupied almost the whole of the ground floor, and whose windows, blazing with electric light, displayed a huddled array of old furniture and antiquities. She stood there for a few seconds, gazing at it absently. A signboard bore the words, The Mercury, together with the name of the owner of the shop, Pancaldi. Higher up, on a projecting cornice which ran along a level with the first floor, a small niche sheltered a terracotta mercury poised on one foot, with wings to his sandals and the caduceus in his hand, who, as Hortense noted, was leaning a little too far forward in the ardor of his flight, and ought logically to have lost his balance and taken a header into the street. Now, she said under her breath. She turned the handle of the door and walked in. Despite the ringing of the bells actuated by the opening door, no one came to meet her. The shop seemed to be empty. However, at the extreme end there was a room at the back of the shop, and after that another, both crammed with furniture and knick-knacks, many of which looked very valuable. Hortense followed a narrow gangway which twisted and turned between two walls built up of cupboards, cabinets, and console tables, went up two steps, and found herself in the last room of all. A man was sitting at a writing desk and looking through some account books. Without turning his head, he said, "'I am at your service, madame. Please look round you.' This room contained nothing but articles of a special character which gave it the appearance of some alchemist's laboratory in the Middle Ages. Stuffed owls, skeletons, skulls, copper alembics, astrolabs, and all around, hanging on the walls, amulets of every description, mainly hands of ivory or coral, with two fingers pointing to ward off ill luck. "'Are you wanting anything in particular, madame?' asked Monsieur Pancaldi, closing his desk and rising from his chair. "'It's the man,' thought Hortense. He had, in fact, an uncommonly pasty complexion. A little forked beard, flecked with grey, lengthened his face, which was surmounted by a bald, pallid forehead, beneath which gleamed a pair of small, prominent, restless, shifty eyes. Hortense, who had not removed her veil or cloak, replied, "'I want a clasp.' "'They're in this showcase,' he said, leading the way to the connecting room. Hortense glanced over the glass case and said, "'No, no, I don't see what I'm looking for. I don't want just any clasp, but a clasp which I lost out of a jewel case some years ago.' and which I have to look for here. She was astounded to see the commotion displayed on his features. His eyes became haggard. Here? I don't think you are in the least likely. What sort of clasp is it? A cornelian, mounted in gold filigree, of the 1830 period. I don't un understand, he stammered. Why do you come to me? She now removed her veil and laid aside her cloak. He stepped back, as though terrified by the sight of her, and whispered, The blue cow, the duke, and, can I believe my eyes, the jet necklace. It was perhaps the whiplash formed of three rushes that excited him most violently. He pointed his finger at it, began to stagger where he stood, and ended by beating the air with his arms like a drowning man and fainting away in a chair. Hortense did not move. Whatever farce he may play, Renin had written, have the courage to remain impassive. Perhaps he was not playing a farce. Nevertheless, she forced herself to be calm and indifferent. This lasted for a minute or two, after which Monsieur Pancaldi recovered from his swoon, wiped away the perspiration streaming down his forehead, and striving to control himself, resumed in a trembling voice, "'Why did you apply to me?' "'Because the clasp is in your possession.' "'Who told you that?' he said without denying the accusation. "'How do you know?' "'I know because it is so. Nobody has told me anything. I came here positive that I should find my clasp, and with the immovable determination to take it away with me.' But do you know me? Do you know my name? I don't know you. I did not know your name before I read it over your shop. To me you are simply the man who is going to give me back what belongs to me. He was greatly agitated. He kept on walking to and fro in a small, empty space, 
surrounded by a circle of piled-up furniture at which he hit out idiotically at the risk of bringing it down. Hortense felt that she had the whip-hand of him, and profiting by his confusion, she said suddenly in a commanding and threatening tone, "'Where is the thing? You must give it back to me. I insist upon it.' Pancaldi gave way to a moment of despair. He folded his hands and mumbled a few words of entreaty. Then, defeated and suddenly resigned, he said, more distinctly, "'You insist?' "'I do. You must give it to me.' "'Yes, yes, I must. I agree.' Speak, she ordered, more harshly still. Speak, no, but write. I will write my secret, and that will be the end of me. He turned to his desk and feverishly wrote a few lines on a sheet of paper, which he put into an envelope and sealed it. See, he said, here's my secret. It was my whole life. And so saying, he suddenly pressed against his temple a revolver which he had produced from under a pile of papers, and fired. With a quick movement, Hortense struck up his arm. The bullet struck the mirror of a cheval glass, but Pancaldi collapsed and began to groan, as though he were wounded. Hortense made a great effort not to lose her composure. Lenin warned me, she reflected. The man's a play actor. He has kept the envelope. He has kept his revolver. I won't be taken in by him. Nevertheless, she realized that, Despite his apparent calmness, the attempt at suicide and the revolver shot had completely unnerved her. All her energies were dispersed like the sticks of a bundle whose string has been cut, and she had a painful impression that the man, who was groveling at her feet, was in reality slowly getting the better of her. She sat down, exhausted. As Renin had foretold, the duel had not lasted longer than a few minutes, but it was she who had succumbed thanks to her feminine nerves, and at the very moment when she felt entitled to believe that she had won. The man Pancaldi was fully aware of this, and without troubling to invent a transition, he ceased his jeremiads, leapt to his feet, cut a sort of agile caper before Hortense's eyes, and cried, in a jeering tone, "'Now we are going to have a little chat, but it would be a nuisance to be at the mercy of the first passing customer, wouldn't it?' He ran to the street door, opened it, and pulled down the iron shutter which closed the shop. Then, still hopping and skipping, he came back to Hortense. Oof! I really thought I was done for. One more effort, madame, and you would have pulled it off. But then I'm such a simple chap. It seemed to me that you had come from the back of beyond as an emissary of Providence to call me to account. And like a fool, I was about to give the thing back. Ah, Mademoiselle Hortense, let me call you so. I used to know you by that name. Mademoiselle Hortense, what you lack, to use a vulgar expression, is gut. He sat down beside her, and with a malicious look, said savagely, The time has come to speak out. Who contrived this business? Not you, eh? It's not in your style. Then who? I have always been honest in my life, scrupulously honest, except once in the matter of that clasp, and whereas I thought the story was buried and forgotten, here it is suddenly raked up again. Why? That's what I want to know. Hortense was no longer even attempting to fight. He was bringing to bear upon her all his virile strength, all his spite, all his fears, all the threats expressed in his furious gestures and on his features, which were both ridiculous and evil. Speak, I want to know. If I have a secret foe, let me defend myself against him. Who is he? Who sent you here? Who urged you to take action? Is it a rival incensed by my good luck, who wants in his turn to benefit by the clasp? Speak, can't you, damn it all, or I swear by heaven I'll make you. She had an idea that he was reaching out for his revolver and stepped back, holding her arms before her in the hope of escaping. They thus struggled against each other, and Hortense, who was becoming more and more frightened, not so much of the attack as of her assailant's distorted face, was beginning to scream, when Pancaldi suddenly stood motionless, with his arms before him, his fingers outstretched, and his eyes staring above Hortense's head. "'Who's there? How did you get in?' he asked in a stifled voice. 
Hortense did not even need to turn round to feel assured that Renin was coming to her assistance and that it was his inexplicable appearance that was causing the dealer such dismay. As a matter of fact, a slender figure stole through a heap of easy chairs and sofas, and Renin came forward with a tranquil step. "'Who are you?' repeated Pancaldi. "'Where do you come from?' "'From up there,' he said very amiably, pointing to the ceiling. "'From up there?' "'Yes, from the first floor. I have been the tenant of the floor above this for the past three months. I heard a noise just now. Someone was calling out for help, so I came down.' "'But how did you get in here?' "'By the staircase.' "'What staircase?' "'The iron staircase at the end of the shop. "'The man who owned it before you had a flat on my floor "'and used to go up and down by that hidden staircase. "'You had the door shut off. I opened it.' "'But by what right, sir? It amounts to breaking in.' "'Breaking in is allowed when there's a fellow creature to be rescued.' "'Once more, who are you?' Prince Renin, and a friend of this lady's, said Renin, bending over Hortense and kissing her hand. Pancaldi seemed to be choking and mumbled, Oh, I, I understand. You instigated the plot. It was you who sent the lady. It was, Monsieur Pancaldi, it was. And what are your intentions? My intentions are irreproachable. No violence, simply a little interview. When that is over, you will hand over what I, in my turn, have come to fetch. What? The clasp? That never, shouted the dealer. Don't say no. It is a foregone conclusion. No power on earth, sir, can compel me to do such a thing. Shall we send for your wife? Madame Pancaldi will perhaps realize the position better than you do. The idea of no longer being alone with this unexpected adversary seemed to appeal to Pancaldi. There was a bell on the table beside him. He struck it three times. Capital, exclaimed Renin. You see, my dear, Monsieur Pancaldi is becoming quite amiable. Not a trace left of the devil broken loose who was going for you just now. No, Monsieur Pancaldi only has to find himself dealing with a man to recover his qualities of courtesy and kindness perfect sheep, which does not mean that things will go quite of themselves, far from it. There's no more obstinate animal than a sheep. Right at the end of the shop, between the dealer's writing desk and the winding staircase, a curtain was raised, admitting a woman who was holding a door open. She might have been thirty years of age. Very simply dressed, she looked, with the apron on her, more like a cook than like the mistress of a household but she had an attractive face and a pleasing figure. Hortense, who had followed Renin, was surprised to recognize her as a maid whom she had had in her service when a girl. What? Is that you, Lucien? Are you Madame Pancaldi? The newcomer looked at her, recognized her also, and seemed embarrassed. Renin said to her, Your husband and I need your assistance, Madame Pancaldi, to settle a rather complicated matter a matter in which you played an important part. She came forward without a word, obviously ill at ease, asking her husband, who did not take his eyes off her. What is it? What do they want with me? What is he referring to? It's about the clasp, Pancaldi whispered under his breath. These few words were enough to make Madame Pancaldi realize to the full the seriousness of her position and she did not try to keep her countenance or to retort with futile protests. She sank into a chair, sighing. Oh, that's it. I understand. Mademoiselle Hortense has found the track. Oh, it's all up with us. There was a moment's respite. The struggle between the adversaries had hardly begun before the husband and wife adopted the attitude of defeated persons whose only hope lay in the victor's clemency. Staring motionless before her, Madame Pancaldi began to cry. Renin bent over her and said, Do you mind if we go over the case from the beginning? We shall then see things more clearly, and I am sure that our interview will lead to a perfectly natural solution. This is how things happened. Nine years ago, when you were ladies' maid to Mademoiselle Hortense in the country, you made the acquaintance of Monsieur Pancaldi, who soon became your lover. 
You were both of you Corsicans. In other words, you came from a country where superstitions are very strong, and where questions of good and bad luck, the evil eye, and spells and charms exert a profound influence over the lives of one and all. Now it was said that your young mistress's class had always brought luck to its owners. That was why, in a weak moment prompted by Monsieur Pancaldi, you stole the clasp. Six months afterwards, you became Madame Pancaldi. That is your whole story, is it not, told in a few sentences? The whole story of two people who would have remained honest members of society if they had been able to resist that casual temptation. I need not tell you how you both succeeded in life, and how, possessing the talisman, believing its powers and trusting in yourselves, you rose to the first rank of antiquarians. Today, well off, owning this shop, the Mercury, you attribute the success of your undertakings to that clasp. To lose it would, to your eyes, spell bankruptcy and poverty. Your whole life has been centered upon it. It is your fetish. It is the little household god who watches over you and guides your steps. It is there, somewhere, hidden in this jungle, and no one, of course, would ever have suspected anything, for I repeat, you are decent people, but for this one lapse, if an accident had not led me to look into your affairs. Renin paused and continued, That was two months ago, two months of minute investigations, which presented no difficulty to me, because, having discovered your trail, I hired the flat overhead, and was able to use that staircase. But all the same, two months wasted to a certain extent, because I have not yet succeeded. And heaven knows how I have ransacked this shop of yours. There is not a piece of furniture that I have left unsearched, not a plank in the floor that I have not inspected. All to no purpose. Yes, there was one thing, an incidental discovery. In a secret recess in your writing table, Pancaldi, I turned up a little account book in which you have set down your remorse, your uneasiness, your fear of punishment, and your dread of God's wrath. It was highly imprudent of you, Pancaldi. People don't write such confessions, and above all, they don't leave them lying about. Be this as it may, I read them and noted one passage which struck me as particularly important, and was of use to me in preparing my plan of campaign. Should she come to me, the woman whom I robbed, should she come to me as I saw her in her garden, while Lucien was taking the clasp, should she appear to me wearing the blue gown and the toque of red leaves, with the jet necklace and the whip of three plaited rushes which she was carrying that day, should she appear to me thus and say, I have come to claim my property, then I shall understand that her conduct is inspired from on high, and that I must obey the decree of providence. That is what is written in your book, Pancaldi, and it explains the conduct of the lady whom you call Mademoiselle Hortense. Acting on my instructions, and in accordance with the setting thought out by yourself, she came to you, from the back of beyond, to use your own expression, a little more self-possession on her part, and you know that she would have won the day. Unfortunately, you are a wonderful actor. Your sham suicide put her out, and you understood that this was not a decree of providence, but simply an offensive on the part of your former victim. I had no choice, therefore, but to intervene. Here I am, and now let's finish the business. Pancaldi, that clasp. No, said the dealer, who seemed to recover all his energy at the very thought of restoring the clasp. And you, Madame Pancaldi? I don't know where it is, the wife declared. Very well, then let us come to deeds. Madame Pancaldi, you have a son of seven whom you love with all your heart. This is Thursday and as on every Thursday, your little boy is to come home alone from his aunt's. Two of my friends are posted on the road by which he returns, and in the absence of instructions to the contrary, will kidnap him as he passes. Madame Pancaldi lost her head at once. My son! Oh, please, please, not that! I swear that I know nothing. My husband would never consent to confide in me. Renin continued. Next point. This evening I shall lodge an information with the public prosecutor. Evidence, the confessions in the account book. Consequences, action by the police, search of the premises, and the rest. Pancaldi was silent. 
The others had a feeling that all these threats did not affect him, and that protected by his fetish, he believed himself to be invulnerable. But his wife fell on her knees at Renin's feet and stammered, No, no, I entreat you. It would mean going to prison, and I don't want to go. And then my son, oh, I entreat you. Hortense, seized with compassion, took Renin to one side. Poor woman, let me intercede for her. Set your mind at rest, he said. Nothing is going to happen to her son. But your two friends. Sheer bluff. Your application to the public prosecutor? A mere threat. Then what are you trying to do? To frighten them out of their wits, in the hope of making them drop a remark, a word which will tell us what we want to know. We've tried every other means. This is the last and it is a method which I find nearly always succeeds. Remember our adventures. But if the word which you expect to hear is not spoken? It must be spoken, said Renin in a low voice. We must finish the matter. The hour is at hand. His eyes met hers, and she blushed crimson at the thought that the hour to which he was alluding was the eighth, and that he had no other object than to finish the matter before that eighth hour struck. So you see, on the one hand, what you are risking, he said to the Pancaldi pair, the disappearance of your child, and prison, prison for certain, since there is the book with its confessions. And now, on the other hand, here is my offer. Twenty thousand francs if you hand over the clasp immediately, this minute. Remember, it isn't worth three louis. No reply. Madame Pancaldi was crying. Renin resumed, pausing between each proposal. I'll double my offer. I'll treble it. Hang it all, Pancaldi, you're unreasonable. I suppose you want me to make it a round sum. All right, a hundred thousand francs. He held out his hand as if there was no doubt that they would give him the clasp. Madame Pancaldi was the first to yield, and did so with a sudden outburst of rage against her husband. Well, confess, can't you? Speak up. Where have you hidden it? Look here, you aren't going to be obstinate. What? If you are, it means ruin and poverty. And then there's our boy. Speak out. Do. Hortense whispered, Renée, this is madness. The clasp has no value. Never fear, said Renin. He's not going to accept. But look at him. How excited he is. Exactly what I wanted. This, you know, is really exciting, to make people lose their heads, to rob them of all control over what they are thinking and saying. And in the midst of this confusion, in the storm that tosses them to and fro, to catch sight of the tiny spark which will flash forth somewhere or other. Look at him, look at the fellow, a hundred thousand francs for a valueless pebble. If not, prison. It's enough to turn any man's head. Pancaldi, in fact, was grey in the face. His lips were trembling, and a drop of saliva was trickling from their corners. It was easy to guess the seething turmoil of his whole being, shaken by conflicting emotions, by the clash between greed and fear. Suddenly he burst out, and it was obvious that his words were pouring forth at random, without his knowing in the least what he was saying. A hundred thousand francs! Two hundred thousand, five hundred thousand, a million, a two fig for your millions. What's the use of millions? One loses them, they disappear, they go. There's only one thing that counts. Luck. It's on your side or else against you. And luck has been on my side these last nine years. It has never betrayed me. And you expect me to betray it? Why? Out of fear? Prison? My son? Bosh! No harm will come to me so long as I compel luck to work on my behalf. It's my servant. It's my friend. It clings to the clasp. How? How can I tell? It's the Cornelian, no doubt. There are magic stones which hold happiness as others hold fire, or sulfur, or gold. Renin kept his eyes fixed upon him, watching for the least word, the least modulation of the voice. The curiosity dealer was now laughing, with a nervous laugh, while resuming the self-control of a man who feels sure of himself, and he walked up to Renin with jerky movements 
that revealed an increasing resolution. Millions? My dear sir, I wouldn't have them as a gift. The little bit of stone which I possess is worth much more than that, and the proof of it lies in all the pains which you are at to take it from me. Ha-ha! <laughs> Months devoted to looking for it, as you yourself confess. Months in which you turned everything topsy-turvy, while I, who suspected nothing, did not even defend myself. Why should I? The little thing defended itself all alone. It does not want to be discovered, and it shan't be. It likes being here. It presides over a good, honest business that satisfies it. Pancaldi's luck. Why, it's known to all the neighborhood, among all the dealers. I proclaim it from the housetops. I'm a lucky man. I even made so bold as to take the god of luck, Mercury, as my patron. He, too, protects me. See, I've got Mercury's all over my shop. Look up there, on that shelf, a whole row of statuettes, like the one over the front door. Proof signed by a great sculptor who went smash and sold them to me. Would you like one, my dear sir? It will bring you luck, too. Take your pick, a present from Pancaldi, to make up to you for your defeat. Does that suit you? He put a stool against the wall, under the shelf, took down a statuette, and plumped it into Linian's arms. And laughing heartily, growing more and more excited, as his enemy seemed to yield ground and to fall back before his spirited attack, he explained, "'Well done. He accepts. And the fact that he accepts shows that we are all agreed. Madame Pancaldi, don't distress yourself. Your son's coming back, and nobody's going to prison. Good-bye, Mademoiselle Hortense. Good day, sir. Hope to see you again. If you want to speak to me at any time, just give three thumps on the ceiling. Good-bye. Don't forget your present.' And may Mercury be kind to you. Good-bye, my dear prince. Good-bye, Mademoiselle Hortense. He hustled them to the iron staircase, gripped each of them by the arm in turn, and pushed them up to the little door hidden at the top of the stairs. And the strange thing was that Renin made no protest. He did not attempt to resist. He allowed himself to be led along like a naughty child that is taken up to bed. Less than five minutes had elapsed between the moment when he made his offer to Pancaldi and the moment when Pancaldi turned him out of the shop with a statuette in his arms. The dining-room and drawing-room of the flat which Lenin had taken on the first floor looked out upon the street. The table in the dining-room was laid for two. "'Forgive me, won't you?' said Lenin, as he opened the door of the drawing-room for Hortense. "'I thought that whatever happened I should most likely see you this evening,' and that we might as well dine together. Don't refuse me this kindness, which will be the last favor granted in our last adventure. Hortense did not refuse him. The manner in which the battle had ended was so different from everything that she had seen hitherto that she felt disconcerted. At any rate, why should she refuse, seeing that the terms of the contract had not been fulfilled? Renin left the room to give an order to his manservant, Two minutes later, he came back for Hortense. It was then a little past seven. There were flowers on the table, and the statue of Mercury, Pancaldi's present, stood overtopping them. "'May the god of luck preside over our repast,' said Renin. He was full of animation and expressed his great delight at having her sitting opposite him. "'Yes,' he exclaimed. I had to resort to powerful means and attract you by the bait of the most fabulous enterprises. You must confess that my letter was jolly smart. The three rushes, the blue gown, simply irresistible. And when I had thrown in a few puzzles of my own invention, such as the seventy-five beads of the necklace and the old woman with the silver rosary, I knew that you were bound to succumb to the temptation. Don't be angry with me. I wanted to see you, and I wanted it to be today. You have come, and I thank you. He next told her how he had got on the track of the stolen trinket. You hoped, didn't you, in laying down that condition, that I shouldn't be able to fulfill it. You made a mistake, my dear. The test, at least at the beginning, was easy enough, because it was based upon an undoubted fact, the talismanic character attributed to the clasp. I had only to hunt about and see whether among the people around you, among your servants, there was ever any one upon whom that character may have exercised some attraction. Now, on the list of persons which I succeeded in drawing up, 
I at once noticed the name of Mademoiselle Lucienne as coming from Corsica. This was my starting point. The rest was a mere concatenation of events. Hortense stared at him in amazement. How was it that he was accepting his defeat with such a careless air, and even talking in a tone of triumph, whereas really he had been soundly beaten by Pancaldi, and even made to look just a trifle ridiculous? She could not help letting him feel this, and the fashion in which she did so betrayed a certain disappointment, a certain humiliation. Everything is a concatenation of events. Very well. But the chain is broken, because when all is said, though you know the thief, you did not succeed in laying hands upon the stolen clasp. The reproach was obvious. Lenin had not accustomed her to failure, and furthermore she was irritated to see how heedlessly he was accepting a blow which, after all, entailed the ruin of any hopes that he might have entertained. He did not reply. He had filled their two glasses with champagne and was slowly emptying his own with his eyes fixed on the statuette of Mercury. He turned it about on its pedestal and examined it with the eye of a delighted connoisseur. What a beautiful thing is a harmonious line. Color does not uplift me so much as outline, proportion, symmetry, and all the wonderful properties of form. Look at this little statue. Pancaldi's right. It's the work of a great artist. The legs are both slender and muscular. The whole figure gives an impression of buoyancy and speed. It is very well done. There's only one fault, a very slight one. Perhaps you've not noticed it. Yes, I have, said Hortense. It struck me the moment I saw the sign outside. You mean, don't you, a certain lack of balance? The god is leaning over too far on the leg that carries him. He looks as though he were going to pitch forward. That's very clever of you, said Renin. The fault is almost imperceptible, and it needs a trained eye to see it. Really, however, as a matter of logic, the weight of the body ought to have its way, and, in accordance with natural laws, the little god ought to take a header. After a pause, he continued, I noticed that flaw on the first day. How was it that I did not draw an inference at once? I was shocked because the artist had sinned against an aesthetic law, whereas I ought to have been shocked because he had overlooked a physical law, as though art and nature were not blended together, and as though the laws of gravity could be disturbed without some fundamental reason. What do you mean? asked Hortense, puzzled by these reflections, which seemed so far removed from their secret thoughts. "'What do you mean?' "'Oh, nothing,' he said. "'I am only surprised that I didn't understand sooner "'why Mercury did not plump forward as he should have done. "'And what is the reason?' "'The reason? "'I imagine that Pancaldi, "'when pulling the statuette about to make it serve his purpose, "'must have disturbed its balance, "'but that this balance was restored "'by something which holds the little god back "'and which makes up for his really too dangerous posture.' Something, you say? Yes, a counterweight. Hortense gave a start. She, too, was beginning to see a little light. She murmured, A counterweight? Are you thinking that it might be in the pedestal? Why not? Is that possible? But if so, how did Pancali come to give you this statuette? He never gave me this one, Renin declared. I took this one myself. But where and when? Just now, while you were in the drawing room, I got out of that window, which is just over the signboard and beside the niche containing the little god, and I exchanged the two, that is to say, I took the statue which was outside and put the one which Pancaldi gave me in its place. But doesn't that one lean forward? No, no more than the others do, on the shelf in his shop. But Pancaldi is not an artist. A lack of equilibrium does not impress him. He will see nothing wrong, and he will continue to think himself favored by luck, which is another way of saying that luck will continue to favor him. Meanwhile, here is the statuette, the one used for the sign. Am I to break the pedestal and take your clasp out of the leaden sheet, soldered to the back of the pedestal, which keeps Mercury steady? No, no, there's no need for that. 
Hortense hurriedly murmured. Lenin's intuition, his subtlety, the skill with which he had managed the whole business. To her, for the moment, all these things remained in the background. But she suddenly remembered that the eighth adventure was completed, that Renin had surmounted every obstacle, that the test had turned to his advantage, and that the extreme limit of time fixed for the last of the adventures was not yet reached. He had the cruelty to call attention to the fact. A quarter to eight, he said. An oppressive silence fell between them. Both felt its discomfort to such a degree that they hesitated to make the least movement. In order to break it, Renin jested. That worthy Monsieur Pancaldi, how good it was of him to tell me what I wished to know. I knew, however, that by exasperating him, I should end by picking up the missing clue in what he said. It was just as though one were to hand someone a flint and steel and suggest to him that he was to use it. In the end, the spark is obtained. In my case, what produced the spark was the unconscious but inevitable comparison which he drew between the Cornelian clasp, the element of luck, and Mercury, the god of luck. That was enough. I understood that this association of ideas arose from his having actually associated the two factors of luck by embodying one in the other, or, to speak more plainly, by hiding the trinket in the statuette and I at once remembered the mercury outside the door and its defective poise. Renin suddenly interrupted himself. It seemed to him that all his remarks were falling on deaf ears. Hortense had put her hand to her forehead, and thus veiling her eyes, sat motionless and remote. She was indeed not listening. The end of this particular adventure and the manner in which Renin had acted on this occasion no longer interested her. What she was thinking of was the complex series of adventures amid which she had been living for the past three months, and the wonderful behavior of the man who had offered her his devotion. She saw, as in a magic picture, the fabulous deeds performed by him, all the good that he had done, the lives saved, the sorrows assuaged, the order restored wherever his masterly will had been brought to bear. Nothing was impossible to him. What he undertook to do, he did. Every aim that he set before him was attained in advance, and all this without excessive effort, with the calmness of one who knows his own strength and knows that nothing can resist it. Then what could she do against him? Why should she defend herself, and how? If he demanded that she should yield, would he not know how to make her do so? And would this last adventure be any more difficult for him than the others? Supposing that she ran away, did the wide world contain a retreat in which she would be saved from his pursuit? From the first moment of their first meeting, the end was certain, since Renin had decreed that it should be so. However, she still cast about for weapons, for protection of some sort, and she said to herself that, though he had fulfilled the eight conditions and restored the Cornelian clasp to her before the eighth hour had struck, she was nevertheless protected by the fact that this eighth hour was to strike on the clock of the Chateau de Alingre and not elsewhere. It was a formal compact. Renin had said that day, gazing on the lips which he longed to kiss, The old brass pendulum will start swinging again, and when on the fixed date the clock once more strikes eight, then... She looked up. He was not moving either, but sat solemnly, patiently waiting. She was on the point of saying, she was even preparing her words. You know our agreement says it must be the Alangre clock. All the other conditions have been fulfilled, but not this one. So I am free, am I not? I am entitled not to keep my promise, which, moreover, I never made, but which in any case falls to the ground. And I am perfectly free released from any scruple of conscience. She had not time to speak. At that precise moment there was a click behind her, like that of a clock about to strike. A first stroke sounded, then a second, then a third. Hortense moaned. She had recognized the very sound of the old clock, the Alangre clock, which three months ago by breaking in a supernatural manner the silence of the deserted chateau, 
had set both of them on the road of the eight adventures. She counted the strokes. The clock struck eight. Ah, <sighs> she murmured, half swooning and hiding her face in her hands. The clock, the clock is here. The one from over there. I recognize its voice. She said no more. She felt that Renin had his eyes fixed upon her, and this sapped all her energies. Besides, had she been able to recover them, she would have been no better off, nor sought to offer him the least resistance, for the reason that she did not wish to resist. All the adventures were over, but one remained to be undertaken, the anticipation of which wiped out the memory of all the rest. It was the adventure of love, the most delightful, the most bewildering, the most adorable of all adventures. She accepted fate's decree, rejoicing in all that might come, because she was in love. She smiled in spite of herself, as she reflected that happiness was again to enter her life, at the very moment when her well-beloved was bringing her the Cornelian clasp. The clock struck the hour for the second time. Hortense raised her eyes to Renin. She struggled a few seconds longer, but she was like a charmed bird, incapable of any movement of revolt, and at the eighth stroke she fell upon his breast and offered him her lips. End of chapter 8 End of the Eight Strokes of the Clock by Maurice Leblanc Read by Kate Barrett Thank you.